Harper Audio presents The Bride Takes a Groom, a Penhallow Dynasty novel by Lisa Byrne, performed by Maura Quirk. Prologue The Basingstoke Select Academy for Young Ladies, Coventry, England, June 1805. A summer evening. Overhead, a full golden moon. A soft, masculine voice murmuring in her ear. Ma chérie, je veux te toucher. A hand drawn across her bosom. Pleasure. Refuge. Connection. She pressed herself closer, and as she did so, to her drifted the faintest scent of lavender, carried gently on the breeze that rustled leaves, caressed flowers, stirred the light muslin hem of her gown. Lavender and... Witch Hazel? A sudden, urgent warning sounded deep in Catherine Brooks's brain, but it was too late. Miss Brooke! Monsieur de la Motte! What is the meaning of this? came the outraged voice of Miss Wolfe, headmistress of the very exclusive and even more expensive boarding school at which Catherine had been immured for two long, miserable years. Germaine, Monsieur de Lamotte, gave an audible gasp of horror, and before Catherine's equally horrified gaze, the dashing music instructor, who had been so bold, so eloquent, seemed abruptly to become a rather large pile of blancmange. He released her and pulled away as if he had just been holding in his arms a repulsive, bad-smelling troll he'd found lurking under a bridge somewhere, and gibbered, Oh, Mademoiselle Wolf, forgive me, it was nothing without significance, a brotherly embrace to comfort only, the poor demoiselle so lonely and far from home, and but this one time, I do assure you, it was that I felt so very sorry for her. You lie, you, you weasel, interrupted Catherine hotly. If she'd had her wits about her, she might have gone along with this inane little story and maybe, just maybe, mitigated this rapidly unfolding disaster. But there was something about the way he was babbling on, as if she was nothing, as if she was without significance, that made a crimson mist of rage rise up in front of her eyes like a vengeful wraith. What had happened to all those bewitchingly romantic words of passion? She wrenched herself around to face Miss Wolfe. It's not the first time. We've been meeting in the garden for ages, and he's been kissing me. Germain de la Mode, no doubt aware that his days at the Basingstoke Academy for Young Ladies had drawn to an immediate close, and that within mere minutes he would be booted out onto the street with nothing but his hastily packed valise in hand, gave Catherine a look of undisguised malice. But recall, mademoiselle, how ardently you sought me out. Oh, splendid! Now the cat was well and truly let out of the bag, thus making things instantly go from bad to worse. Catherine could feel her fury dissolving with almost ludicrous speed and giving way to soul-shattering embarrassment and shame. I... I thought you liked me, she faltered. He smiled thinly and lifted his shoulders in a Gallic gesture of dismissal. Ma pauvre chérie. His words came at her like a slap in the face, cruel, patronizing, stinging. It had all been a lie, a malign and hard-hearted deception. So much for those embraces, the kisses, the furtive touches here and there, the exciting feel of a man's body against her own. How wrong and awful she'd been, how stupid, how bad. And here to emphasise just how bad was Miss Wolfe again, very nearly sputtering in her fury. I can hardly believe my ears that a pupil of mine would stoop so low to solicit such a thing, to sneak about like a sordid criminal, and you but fifteen, Miss Brooke. Be sure that I shall inform your parents by express first thing tomorrow. 
Catherine hung her head. She was a low, sneaking, sordid, criminal sort of girl. Hadn't she known, underneath it all, that she was behaving dreadfully? Yes, Miss Wolfe, she muttered, aware to her further horror that tears were gathering in her eyes, had begun to roll in heavy, wet, revealing drops down her cheeks. More ashamed of herself than ever, with a kind of desperation, she scrubbed at the tears with her bare hands. Oh, she hated this place. If she was lucky, her parents would have her removed at once. But as it turned out, she would stay on for four more long, miserable years at the Basingstoke Academy, mother and father agreeing with Miss Wolfe's expert and ultimately costly assessment that Catherine, so gauche, so inattentive, would need them in order to acquire even the most fundamental degree of polish, that essential and elusive je ne sais quoi, which would enable her to some day, one hoped, comport herself without committing further dreadful gaffes. Six years after the hushed-up incident at the Basingstoke Select Academy for Young Ladies, somewhere near the Canadian border, April 1811. It had been a perfectly good day, tramping along the St. Lawrence River and leading his men in a jolly little reconnaissance through the woods, until all at once there was a crack and a slight whistling noise. Then there was a sharp pain six inches down into the right of his heart. Damn it to hell, said Hugo Penhallow, whipping around and in a single rapid motion bringing up his own musket, sighting the French sharpshooter two hundred paces away and targeting him rather more effectively. He watched with grim satisfaction as the other man crumpled like a puppet released from its string, then sat himself down hard on the ground. His hand, pressed against the front of his red jacket, came away red also, but unfortunately with his own blood. If he was lucky, the bullet that was now resident inside him hadn't struck anything of particular importance. It occurred to him now that he was very fond of his internal organs, as they'd functioned beautifully all his life, and he'd love for them to keep on doing exactly that. Carefully, Hugo allowed himself to slide down into a prone position. Everything was getting all hazy and woolly, and just before he closed his eyes, he saw the concerned faces of his men hovering over him. A nice bunch of chaps. He was fortunate to have a group like this under his command. Too bad for them they'd have to convey him all the way back to camp, but that, after all, was one of the hazards of military life, and he was sure they'd do a decent job of it. The pain, he noticed, was getting worse. Well, this certainly was an annoyance. How he loathed those pesky Frenchmen and wished they'd stay in their own country where they belonged, kowtowing to that blasted little egomaniac Bonaparte, and also making brandy, which was, admittedly, of excellent quality. In fact, he wouldn't object to a long swallow of that right now. But he suspected he was soon to be losing consciousness, so all things considered, the brandy might well have been a waste. His last sentient thought was gratitude for the fact that the reconnaissance had been a useful one. His men would be able to confirm that, yes, of a surety, there were active enemies in the area, and here was their bloodied and insensate captain to prove it. Chapter One Six months after the eventful reconnaissance mission along the Canadian border, Brook House, five miles inland from Whitehaven, England, October 1811. Many people would have considered Catherine Brooke to be an exceedingly fortunate young lady. She was rich, very rich indeed. Her jewels were of a quality and a quantity that even a queen would envy. 
Her gowns were made from the costliest fabrics. Her hats, gloves, shoes, stockings, shawls, pelisses, reticules, and parasols were delivered by the dozens. And her immense bedchamber had been modelled without thought as to expense after the neoclassical style made fashionable by no less a personage than the Prince Regent himself. It was a marvel of a room, with a high-domed ceiling, large, gilded mirrors, fireplaces artfully crafted so as to resemble the fronts of ancient Roman temples, half a dozen busts of eyeless, long-dead emperors rendered in the purest of white marble and walls painted Pompeian red. It was here that Catherine stood with her back against the closed door, looking at her maid, Celeste. Do you have it? Oui, mademoiselle. Give it to me, please. Je suis désolé, mademoiselle, but it cost more than expected. Celeste's narrow face was impassive, her tone respectful, but her attitude was nonetheless imbued with every bit of her usual sly, self-satisfied insolence. Here we go again, Catherine thought. How much more? It came all the way from London, mademoiselle, and as you know, secrecy is difficult to maintain across so many miles. I know it all too well. How much more? Le coût total is one pound eighteen shillings. That's absurd. Mademoiselle is concerned about le coût? Celeste shrugged, glancing around the luxurious room as if she didn't, in fact, know just how much pin money Catherine received. Quel dommage! Rest assured, I can dispose of it elsewhere. I'm sure you can. Catherine reached into the satin reticule hanging from her wrist, her fingers slipping past the downy, fragile marabou feathers with which it was ornamented, and extracted two golden guineas, which she held out to Celeste. Here. Celeste didn't move. Would Mademoiselle like back les cinq shillings? Keep them. With effort, Catherine kept her face bland. Oh, tedious, tedious, this final extraction of money on top of what was doubtless an inflated fee. But one had to tread carefully with Celeste in these matters. She added insincerely, by way of a thank you. Mademoiselle is too kind. Without hurry, Celeste took the guineas, then slid her hand into the pocket slit at her waist and produced from within it a small rectangular bundle wrapped in cheap plain paper. Catherine snatched it from her, and Celeste smiled. It is always a pleasure doing business with Mademoiselle. You may leave, but you are expected downstairs prior to the dinner hour, and your air is a bourrée Come back in twenty minutes and fix it then. I shall come back in five. Ten. Her hands, Catherine noticed, were shaking a little with anticipation. But then, they always did at a moment like this. Five minutes, mademoiselle, or votre chère maman will notice your absence, and she may well chide me for your lateness. I do not wish to be chided. Nor do I. A scanty patch of common ground between herself and Celeste, she said, Have you ever wondered what would happen if Mother found out about our, uh, transactions? I would doubtless be let go at once, and sans reference, replied Celeste coolly. One can only speculate as to your punishment, mademoiselle. Two, you would lose my services as an intermediaire, which would be a punishment in itself, would you not agree? It is not so easy to find someone as resourceful and as discreet as I. This complacent assertion Catherine could not dispute. It had been six years since that humiliating debacle at the Basingstoke Select Academy, and the maid Celeste had been forced upon her. They had lived alongside each other, locked into a vile dynamic in which their antipathy was mutual, yet each had benefited from their clandestine dealings. Celeste had been magnificently feathering her nest with all the money Catherine paid her, and as for herself, 
she almost brought the little package to her nose to breathe in its heady fragrance, but instead said, Which reminds me, where are the books I asked for? The volume of Shakespeare's plays is en route, I am informed, mademoiselle, but the other, the Italian book, La Divina Commedia, oui, it is proving more difficult to locate in the original language. Rest assured, I have not forgotten. Celeste smiled with a knowing sort of glimmer that made Catherine feel like her skin was prickling with shamed embarrassment. Shall I leave you now so that you might enjoy votre petite gâterie? Yes, do. Catherine stepped aside, and Celeste sauntered out of the room with what had to be deliberate insolence. The moment the door was shut, Catherine leaned against it again and carefully unfolded the paper in her hands. There, there they were. Saliva pooled in her mouth as she stared at the two dozen diablotins. The dark, thin discs of chocolate covered with nonpareils, tiny, tasty white balls of sugar. For years, Mother had forbidden her candy, insisting it made her spotty. But still, Catherine had found a way. Diablotin. It meant imp or gremlin in French. A defiant little smile curved her lips, and she popped one of the discs into her mouth. Oh, delicious, delicious, exquisite, beguiling, magical, except that words couldn't even come close to describing it. She closed her eyes, savouring. The taste was both bitter and sweet, the chocolate smooth and rich on her tongue, the little nonpareils crunched between her teeth, yielding up a tantalizing contrast of textures. But one wasn't enough, and time was short. Catherine opened her eyes and rapidly consumed three, four, five diablutins, waiting for the rush of pleasure that always came with eating chocolate. No wonder the ancient Aztecs believed that cacao seeds, from which chocolate was made, were a gift from the gods or that they valued the seeds so greatly they used them as currency. She'd read that in one of her history books, at present hidden away in a locked box under her bed. And speaking of books, what excellent news that her contraband volume of Shakespeare's plays was on the way. At school, they could only read the Baudelaire's version, the family Shakespeare, edited, eviscerated was more like it, in a way that supposedly protected a maiden's fragile sensibilities. All the really good parts had been removed, the bits having to do with bad people using bad words, no doubt, and doing bad deeds. Catherine could barely wait to read them all. She smiled, really smiled. She was feeling it now. For a few precious moments, she would feel happy, good, alive until Celeste came back, did whatever she was going to do with her hair, and she'd have to go downstairs. Ugh! Another excruciating evening spent with her parents and their... What was a good way to describe them? Guests didn't quite do them justice. Catherine preferred leeches in human form. Hovering a few rungs below society's topmost echelon, they doubtless had received no better invitations elsewhere, and so here they flocked, the best her parents could do. They ate, they drank, they borrowed money. They expected the brook servants to wait on them hand and foot, and for all she knew, they were smuggling the silver into their trunks. This was bad enough, but it had also struck her that none of them appeared to have ever read a book from start to finish, and their conversation, if one could call it that, reflected this sad fact. Mealtimes were interminable. But at least she would know, all throughout the next several hours, that concealed in her armoire, at the far end of a drawer beneath a pile of silk stockings, were eighteen more diablutins waiting for her to come back. At around the same time, on the road to Whitehaven. Many people would have considered Captain Hugo Penhallow to be a man in trouble. He had almost no money, 
and no income to anticipate. An old house was his only property. In addition, he had a large family to support, a widowed mother, a younger sister, and three younger brothers. His profession for the past eight years in the army was no longer a viable one, for he had recently sold out. As the son of a gentleman, naturally he had no training for any other occupation, and finally, several months ago, he had badly broken his left leg, and so now, when he was fatigued, he walked with an unmistakable limp. Yet here was Hugo, riding north along the Longtown Road on this cool, cloudy afternoon, sitting his horse with casual grace and whistling cheerfully, giving all the appearance of a person without a care in the world. This was, in fact, largely how he was feeling. For one thing, he was on his way home, and he'd soon be with his dear and delightful family, whom he hadn't seen once during those eight years, as he had been sent to the annoyingly obstreperous territory along the Canadian border. Letters had helped bridge the distance between himself and home, although he was fairly certain that not all of them were delivered or received, it being not uncommon to have placed in his hands a missive that looked as if it had been in a battle itself, so bent and begrimed was it. As for the financial difficulties, Hugo wasn't ignoring just how dire they were, but he was taking action. He had decided to capitalise on his two chief assets, both intangible but clearly of significant value in certain circles. One... He was a Penhallow. It was an old and illustrious name that loomed large, extremely large, among the haute -ton. The first Penhallow, it was said, had long ago come to England with the great conqueror himself, and the conqueror had humbly deferred to him. Although he himself was but a straitened member of the cadet branch of the Penhallow family, Hugo was fully aware of the effect his hoary surname exerted upon even the loftiest dukes and earls, permitting oneself to walk about trailing, as it were, clouds of glory, all rather comical in his opinion, but there it was. Two, the female sex evidently found him attractive, which would make his task easier. For years, he had heard himself compared left and right to a Greek god, which, as a modest fellow, he found extremely silly. He was one of those tall, fit sort of men, an attribute for which, of course, he was appreciative, but still, one couldn't help being born the way one was, and it was decidedly uncomfortable to be stared at as if one were an exotic beast on display. Yet, if his appearance assisted him in his quest, so much the better. And that quest was to marry into money. He had evaluated his limited options carefully, and all in all this seemed to be the best and the most expeditious way to solve the problem. He could have continued to accept assistance from his older cousin Gabriel Penhallow, who several years ago had not only generously purchased his commission, but had also provided him income in the form of an allowance, which he'd had diverted to his stalwart mother, holding the fort back in Whitehaven. No, that sort of thing, charity, was all well and good for a single-minded army-mad youth, but he was done with that now. That bullet in his midsection back in April had resulted in a serious lingering infection, which had his kindly commander forcibly putting him onto a ship bound for home, and there was nothing like a long sea voyage when one was weak as a damned cat to inspire an extended period of introspection. While Gabriel's assistance, which also included sending additional checks to Mama, was gratefully received by both himself and the mater, the plain truth was that it wasn't sufficient to see the children adequately established in life. With Gwendolen now fourteen, the twins, Percy and Francis, 13, and Bertram, 12, the issue had become rather more urgent. But he had no intention of asking Gabriel for anything more. Never in a million years could he imagine himself saying, Thanks for all that you've done, cuz, and now could you give me many times that sum over again? 
It was, Hugo had concluded, a perfect time in which to take destiny by the shoulders and give it a good hard rattle. And, as luck would have it, a tremendous storm had blown up as the ship neared the western coast, forcing them to divert from Liverpool to Bude, where, his wound having reopened in spectacular style, he'd decided to hot-foot it to Gabriel's estate in Somerset, it being much closer than Whitehaven, and the last thing he'd wanted to do was horrify his family by staggering home as a moribund invalid. Once he got to Sermont Hall, he had, in an embarrassingly dramatic fashion, toppled off his horse like a sack of turnips and nearly bled to death on Gabriel's enormous gravelled carriage sweep. Some might have thought this a bad thing, but really, when you looked at it another way, it had all worked out beautifully. He'd been able to recuperate at his leisure, attended by a very capable doctor, as well as by servants offering a tempting array of food and drink multiple times a day. Two, it gave him the opportunity to thank Gabriel in person for his generosity and insist that he both accept repayment for the commission and terminate the allowance, to write home alerting them to his arrival upon terra firma and to receive in return a buoyant letter from his mother which contained, along with her usual fond, rambling report of his siblings' health and activities, a tidbit of neighbourhood news that had caught his eye. According to Cook, who had it from the butcher's wife, who somehow seems to know everything that happens within a twenty-mile radius of Whitehaven, Brook House is packed to capacity with guests, along with, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Brook, as well as Catherine, your former playmate, such a sweet, lively little girl she was, who had her first season and received many offers, highly understandable given the extent of her fortune, but came home without evidently any of them being accepted. Cook also says that the butcher's wife told her that one of the custom officer's children very nearly drowned yesterday. Bertram says he knows the boy, and that he'd been told many times to stay away when the waves are rough. How very frightening for his people. Also, Cook mentioned... Now here, to be sure, was another great piece of luck an unwed heiress practically on his doorstep. And it was someone he knew even better, and had, once upon a time, liked. To own the truth, he hadn't thought of Catherine in years. It was well over a decade since he'd last seen her. He had been thirteen at the time, and had come home from Eton for father's funeral. The Brooks, then, had lived next door, and more than once had little Kate, five years younger than himself, yet even so they'd been good friends, slipped between the line of bay trees separating their houses and come to console him. He'd been grateful for her visits, for a hard time it was, very hard indeed. First the shock of father's sudden death, and then its painful aftermath, with his three siblings so little, still in leading strings, and Mamma pregnant with Bertram. Their man of business, Mr. Storridge, had laid it out plain. The late Anthony Penhallow, always more interested in science than in money, had left behind very little for his family, aside from the modest sum of eight thousand pounds invested in the five percents, and their big old house overlooking the wide sandy shore that gave way to the blue-green depths of the ocean. If the remaining Penhallows practised the strictest economy, Mr. Storridge had said in his dry, precise voice, they would manage to get by. Hugo had immediately declared his intention to withdraw from Eton and spare Mamma the expense of his keeping there, but this she had in her gentle way forbidden. Oh, my dear Hugo, she had said, smiling through the tears which seemed to flow continually during those dark days. It was your papa's dearest wish that you receive the same education he did. He was so very proud of you. And wasn't it clever of him to pay your fees in advance? Almost, and here she had paused to hold back a pitiful sob, almost as if he knew something would happen to him. Yes, mamma, he'd replied. School's not a bad thing, but what about Gwenny and the twins and the baby? 
I'll make the headmaster give you back the money, and I'll find a job. I could become a sailor. And a marvellous one you'd be too, darling Hugo. I can just picture you climbing a rigging like a monkey. But do please go back to school, and don't worry about the children. Everything will be fine. Somehow he had managed to swallow a great lump in his throat and say, How will it, Mamma? It simply will, she had answered confidently. And look, I've just today received a letter from dear Antony's cousin Henrietta Penhallow with an invitation to spend the summer holiday with her and her grandson Gabriel in Bath. You and Gabriel will travel from school together. Isn't that kind? He would infinitely rather have come home, but had only said, If it will save money, Mamma, I'll do it. That's my brave boy, she'd said, and at that moment he had felt that any sacrifice, large or small, was worth it if it could but lighten her load. It was a feeling that had never left him, and now Hugo smiled a little, noticing with pleasure the familiar tang of salt air and the faintest hint of the ocean's restless breeze. Not much further now. With luck, he'd be home by dinner time. Whistling again, gently he pressed his heels into his horse's side, urging it to go just a little faster, and obligingly, it picked up its pace. Actually, by the time Catherine reluctantly made her way downstairs, there were only fifteen Diablotins hidden in her armoire, as she had managed to eat three more before Celeste had returned. A light rain had begun to fall, and dusk was settling its mellow hand upon the streets, buildings and gardens of Whitehaven, lingering softly upon the broad expanse of sand and sea, as Hugo came to the old stable that stood upon a corner of their property furthest from the beach. He dismounted and thrust the horse's reins into the hand of the aged groom who had cautiously emerged from the stable and was now staring in evident amazement at the master upon whom he'd not set eyes in quite some time. Hello, Hoyt, said Hugo amiably. You're looking exactly the same, I'm happy to see. Trust all is well? At the other's dumbstruck nod, Hugo went on. Splendid. Do take care of this nag, will you? She's held up wonderfully well all the way here, bless her, and I'm no featherweight, am I? Well, I'm off to the house. Hope I'm not too late for dinner. Good night, then. He had already unstrapped from the saddle his neat leather rucksack, and so, after a friendly nod to the still speechless Hoyt, walked with eager steps toward the large, rambling old house, which looked, even to his own affectionate eyes, considerably more dilapidated than he remembered. The reddish clay bricks with which it was constructed were crumbling in places. The sloping slate roof looked extremely weather-beaten, and several windows on the uppermost story had been clumsily boarded up. He took this in and went lightly up the front steps onto the wide, welcoming portico. He was home at last. From inside, he could hear dogs barking. They'd doubtless heard him come onto the portico, along with some odd screeching noises. Not bothering to bang the old iron knocker, Hugo opened the door and let himself in, into a large, high-ceilinged entry hall, shabby and familiar, and quite possibly the nicest place on earth. As he dropped his rucksack onto a bench, a pack of mongrels, all unknown to him and barking fiercely, surged down one of the halls, even as a maidservant scuttled in from the kitchen passageway, looking alarmed and gasping out, Oh, sir, was you expected? I'll just get the mistress if you'll wait here, please. Not to worry, I'll go to her, answered Hugo over the tumult of barks, yips, nails madly clicking on wood flooring and loud, hostile panting. Are they all at dinner? Yes, sir, but what's your name, then? It's Eliza, sir, but... Quiet, said Hugo to the dogs, who, recognising the genial tone of authority, instantly subsided and sat on their haunches, wagging their tails and casting up at him looks of servile adoration. He counted them. 
there were only five after all, although from their collective volume one would have thought there were at least a dozen, and altogether a motley lot. One was missing an ear, another seemed to have the head of a poodle set upon the body of a dachshund, and still another had eyes of a milky opacity which suggested severe vision problems if not actual blindness. Hugo patted the biggest of them, an enormous white and brown Great Dane whose front legs were crooked, and said to Eliza, Tell Robinson to set another place for me, would you? I'll go in directly. Oh, sir, but Mr. Robinson's not here. Egad, not dead, is he? Hugo hoped not, as he had been very fond of their old butler. He'd loyally stayed on after father had died, despite having his wages drastically reduced. Oh, no, sir, he's alive, but his palsy got so bad that the mistress pensioned him off, you see, and he's living with his daughter Nancy and her family up on Roper Street. Very happy he is, sir, takes a pint every day at the pub and sings in the choir on Sundays. Hugo was pulling off his greatcoat and hanging it on a peg. Well, that's excellent news. I'll go see him later this week. See here, Eliza, I'm hungry as a bear. Can you set a place for me? To be sure I can, sir, but... But if you'll forgive me asking... Who are you, sir? Good God! Didn't my mother tell any of you I was coming? No wonder poor old Hoyt looked as if he'd seen a ghost. He laughed. Never mind, I'm the prodigal son, Eliza. The eldest, you know, Hugo. Eliza looked astonished. Oh, sir, you're Mr. Hugo. We was all afeard you was dead. Dead? Why? Because the mistress said you'd been shot by a Frenchie, Mr. Hugo, and that you was laid up in your cousin's house, and then there wasn't any more letters from you. Cook says them French bullets have a special poison in them, sir, that drains the life right out of a person. Blast it all. He'd deliberately trivialised the nature of his illness when writing home, not wishing to worry them. And why hadn't Mamma gotten the letter he'd written from Gabriel's house a fortnight ago, informing her that he was fine and would soon be on his way? Well, he could allay their anxieties right now. I was shot, he said to Eliza, but it would take more than some beastly Frenchman to kill me, that's for certain. Go on now and bring me some supper, that's a good girl. She bobbed a curtsy, and Hugo, favouring his left leg ever so slightly, went down the long, familiar hallway, the dogs trotting behind with the same pliant obedience the children of Hamlin might well have displayed while following the Pied Piper. He came to a pair of oak-framed double doors, brought them open, and strolled into the dining parlour. I say, I'm home! Five golden blonde heads swivelled in his direction, Five pairs of wide blue eyes displayed shocked surprise. And then pandemonium erupted. Chapter Two Hugo! cried Mamma. Dearest Hugo! Swiftly she rose to her feet, as did the others, and they all hurried toward him their progress impeded by what seemed like a single swirling mass of dogs who gaily circled round their feet, loudly barking, which seemed to trigger that odd, raucous screeching intermixed with somebody begging, Kiss me, you saucy wench! Hugo was enfolded in rapturous hugs, which, laughing, he returned, interrupting the excited barrage of exclamations and questions to tell the dogs to behave which they did, and to ask of no one in particular, Who the devil wants to be kissed? Oh, Hugo, it's my parrot, said his sister Gwendolyn, flitting off to a primitively constructed wood perch set near the fireplace, on which sat the ugliest bird Hugo had ever seen, a pitiful creature, almost denuded of feathers, and also sporting a large curved beak which looked fully capable of shredding to bloody bits the fragile-looking hand Gwendolen held out to it. But it only stepped onto her finger and cackled. Isn't he 
beautiful, Hugo, she said lovingly, coming near so that Hugo might admire him better at close range. I've named him Senor Rodrigo El Duque de Almodovar del Valle de Oro. Isn't that perfect? The sailor who gave him to me said he was called Stubby, but I like this so much better. We call him Rodrigo for short, and he doesn't seem to mind it. Do you, Rodrigo, darling? The bird cackled again, and Gwendolen smiled approvingly. Did you notice Rodrigo's perch, Hugo? Francis made the stand, and Percy nailed it all together. Isn't it splendid? That it is, said Hugo, and I can't think of a better name than Senor Rodrigo. Egad, Mamma, why are you crying? Oh, Hugo, my dear boy, his mother replied, dabbing at her cheeks with an absurd wisp of a handkerchief extracted from her reticule. I'm not crying exactly. I'm weeping, you know, with joy. I'm so glad you're home. We were all so dreadfully anxious about you. Which reminded him. I sent you a letter two weeks ago. Can't imagine why you didn't get it. Oh, I have it, said the youngest one, Bertram, pulling from his breeches pocket a wadded up piece of paper, its wafer crumpled, and holding it out to Hugo. Mr. Hodgson gave it to me, and I forgot all about it. Bertram, how could you? said Gwendolen reproachfully. He shrugged. I meant to give it to Mamma straight away, but I was on my way to Grandpapa's. We had a lesson in metallurgy, and then we did the most ripping experiment with charcoal. We nearly coughed to death, and Aunt Verena was very unhappy about what happened to the curtains. But we didn't care about that, of course, or at least I didn't. Hugo, did you know that puddling was invented by Henry Court in 1783 and lets you make bar iron from pig iron without any charcoal at all? No, I do, answered Hugo. Give the letter to Mamma, will you? I say, Bertie, what happened to your hand? Well... I was studying all about saltpetre last year, Bertram explained, and so there was a jolly good explosion in one of the attics. Hugo nodded, just as casually, as if this single sentence was entirely comprehensive. Yes, Mamma wrote me about the explosion, but she didn't mention that you'd lost parts of your fingers. Oh, that happened afterwards. It took a while to see what was going to happen. It was exceedingly interesting, Hugo. I do wish you could have seen it. Wish I'd been here too. I'm sorry, Bertie. Sorry? Why should you be? I didn't have all my fingers amputated, and it was only the upper bit. See? Bertram held up the afflicted limb and viewed it with clinical interest. Dr. Wilson said he's never seen someone so brave as Bertram, put in Mamma proudly. He didn't cry at all. What's to cry about? Bertram's tone was scornful. Besides, it was only the fourth and fifth fingers of the hand I don't use for writing, and so on. And also, Hugo, when Bertram is all grown up, he'll be a perfectly tragic figure, said Gwendolen with a satisfied air. All the young ladies will recognise his noble sacrifice for the advancement of science and fall in love with him. Oh, don't talk rubbish, Gwenny. Love! Scowling, Bertram made a loud and extremely graphic gagging sound, as if the very word left a bad taste in his mouth. Hugo, how did you get here? Did you walk? said one of the twins, and the other one interpolated. Walk? All the way from Somerset in those boots? He rode, didn't you, Hugo? Hugo smiled down at the twins. As alike as two peas in a pod they were, at thirteen, both bidding fair to become as tall as himself some day, but at present still more wiry than muscular. Percy's right, he said. I rode. Old Hoyt's looking after my horse. Gwendolen gave a little bounce of delight. Oh, Hugo, you knew right away which one was Percy and which one was Francis. We all know naturally, but no one outside the family can ever tell them apart. How did you, Hugo? inquired Bertram. Never mind that, Percy said impatiently. I want to hear about the horse. How many hands is he, Hugo? Is he a good jumper? You'll let me ride him, won't you? Can I do it tomorrow? She's a nice, sturdy old roan I picked up imbued, said Hugo. Of course you can ride her. You all can. But not tomorrow. She needs a rest. Took me twelve days to get here. And no, she's not a jumper. Damn, said Percy. 
Percy, darling, Mama said. I'm sorry, Mama, but I did want to try jumping. It's just rotten luck. Having a horse is better than not having one at all, Francis pointed out philosophically. Percy brightened. That's true. Ah, Mr. Hugo, here you are, said a gravelly voice, in whose resonant wake came its owner, an immense woman of indeterminate age in a neat grey gown and white ruffled cap, bearing in her meaty hands a tray on which reposed a large bowl of soup, a plate heaped high with bread, a pot of butter, and a tankard filled to the brim with ale. Cook, said Hugo, how do you do? You're looking very well. As to that, mournfully responded Cook, moving at a magisterial pace toward the table, it's merciful of you to say, Mr. Hugo, but I doubt I'll last the winter. Oh, Cook, you say that every autumn, said Mamma, who had had Cook with her for nearly three decades, and whose personality was in every way contrary to her own. Yet they had, for all these years, lived under the same roof in perfect, inexplicable tolerance and harmony. That may be so, madam, but one of these autumns I'll be right. Pooh, Mamma retorted. You'll outlast us all, I dare say. Let's sit down and finish our supper. Everyone went again to their places. Hugo took his at the head of the table. I say, cook, it's awfully kind of you to bring the tray yourself. Well, Mr. Hugo, that Eliza was so done in by your arrival, or sudden-like as it was, I'd wager a guinea she'd have dropped your supper on the way here. Cook had finished setting out Hugo's meal, and now she lifted the tray and stood narrowly surveying her handiwork. Hugo picked up his spoon, then paused. What's in the soup? Tripe, Mr. Hugo. That's what I was afraid of. It's what we can afford, Mr. Hugo. Cook heaved a deep, gloomy sigh very much in the manner of Shakespeare's Prince Fortinbras, arriving at Castle Elsinore only to find the corpses of Hamlet, Hamlet's mother, Hamlet's uncle, and so on, together representing the total collapse of the Danish monarchy. Heavily she left the dining parlour, as one who simply couldn't bear it a moment longer. It's not so bad, Hugo, said Gwendolen helpfully. I pretend I'm eating le jambon à la broche avec le sauce au madère. Tripe, Bertram said, is made from only the first three chambers of a cow's stomach, Hugo. Did you know that? They use the rumen, the omasum, and the reticulum. Thank you, Bertie, answered Hugo politely, putting down his spoon and reaching for a thick slice of wheat and bread, which he proceeded to lavishly butter. Walk the plank, you lily-livered dog, said Senor Rodrigo El Duque de Almodovar del Valle de Oro, in a conversational tone from his comfortable roost atop Gwendolen's slender, muslin-clad shoulder. Gwenny, darling, put Rodrigo back on his patch, please, Mamma said. Oh, but Mamma, you often let Rodrigo join us for dinner, and it's such a treat for him. Gwendolen turned huge, melting blue eyes on her mother. Only see how happy he looks. Dead men tell no tales, remarked Rodrigo, and bobbing up and down on his skinny little legs, giggled in a sinister way. Yes, but I always regret it afterward, Mamma replied to Gwendolen. Rodrigo inevitably goes on to the table where he wants to fight with the candle flames, and then he expects me to share my supper with him. That's because he adores you, Mamma. Isn't he the most delightful creature in the whole entire world? Yes, of course, darling, but... Oh, please, Mamma, do let him stay. I promise I won't let him attack any candles. Well, I'd really rather you didn't, darling. But Mamma... Gwenny, Hugo said, Mamma asked you to do something. Those big blue eyes were now fixed pleadingly on his face... Oh, but Hugo, Gwenny. Hugo's voice had lost none of its affable kindness, but there was a certain subtle timbre in it that made Gwendolen stare. Then, 
a little sulkily, stand up and return Rodrigo to his perch near the fire. I say, Hugo, said Percy admiringly, is that how you ordered your men around? It's capital. Before Hugo could reply, there came to their ears the distant sound of the front door's knocker being banged, and at once the dogs proceeded en masse to rush off, barking at the top of their lungs. I wonder who that could be, said Mamma, but with such obvious nervousness that Hugo looked at her curiously. Odd time for a caller, he said, and Bertram commented dispassionately through a mouthful of very chewy tripe. It's probably that awful Mr. Bambers. Who's? Hugo began, but was interrupted by Eliza, poking her head into the dining parlour to say anxiously, Oh, madam, it's that Mr. Bambers for you again. Will you see him? He says he won't go away till you do, and he's dripping all over the entry. Mamma rose to her feet. Everyone stay and finish their dinner, she said, draping her thin wool shawl more securely about her shoulders. I'll be back in a moment. Swiftly she went away, followed by Eliza, and Hugo stood up. He had taken only a few steps when Francis stopped him with a hand on his arm. Hugo, he said eagerly, did you bring some books with you? I've read all of ours, and most of Grandpa's too. Have you, Frank? That's splendid, returned Hugo. I didn't bring any, but we'll see about getting you some more. Excuse me and he patted Francis on the shoulder and went with a brisk, slightly limping step out of the dining parlour, along the lengthy corridor and into the entryway, where he found his mother in discussion with a tall, cadaverous man in an ill-fitting black coat who was tilting toward her in a way Hugo didn't care for. Nor did Mamma apparently, for on her pretty face was a look of outright distress. The dogs, Hugo noticed, though antagonistic, were keeping their distance, leading him to think that the fellow was one of those nasty sorts who kicked dogs or brutally wielded the huge umbrella he carried and which was, in fact, dripping all over the floor. Your account, ma'am, is overdue, considerable overdue. I've been plenty lenient, ma'am, for months now, but it's getting to be a problem, do you see? He tilted a little closer. A problem that needs to be fixed, if you know what I mean. Oh, yes, Mr. Bambers, you've been so kind, said Mamma falteringly, and we do so appreciate it. It's just that... What's going on here? Hugo said, and the children, who had slipped up behind him, looked at each other with suppressed excitement. It was the same tone he'd used on Gwendolen. Hugo sounded perfectly easygoing, but there was unmistakably steel in that deep, calm voice. Oh, Hugo, darling, Mamma said, turning to him a white and worried face. This is Mr. Bambers. He's the coalman. I'm afraid we owe him quite a bit of money, and even though it's raining dreadfully, he's stopped by to remind me. Mr. Bambers straightened. That's it, he said, adding with unpleasant emphasis, twenty-eight pounds, thirteen shillings and fourpence, plus interest accrued, that comes to twenty-nine pounds, seven shillings and sixpence. You'll have it soon enough, answered Hugo, and in the meantime don't come bothering my family again. Bothering? For a moment, Mr. Bambers was inclined to take offence and then he seemed to look more closely at Hugo's height and muscular breadth and his overall air of unobtrusive self-assurance, after which he swallowed visibly, bowed, and said, So sorry to have troubled you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll wish you all a good night. It was Eliza who sprang into action then, holding wide the front door and saying cheerfully, Miserable evening to be abroad, ain't it, Mr. Bambers? Raining by the buckets out there. Hope you don't catch cold or nothing, sir. Mr. Bambers glared at her and fled into the rain. Eliza shut the door behind him, and the children gathered happily around Hugo. Routed him by Jove, exclaimed Percy. 
Usually he hangs about till Mama starts crying, and I wish I had a sword so I could run it right through him. Oh, Hugo, did you come home rich? Gwendolen said hopefully. Did you win a lot of prize money? That's for sailors, not soldiers, Percy told her pityingly, then glanced up at Hugo. But did you? It'd be awfully nice. I'd love a new gown, said Gwendolen, eyeing her old muslin with distaste, and Francis breathed. Books. A horse of my own, said Percy. A microscope, said Bertram dreamily. Off you all go, Hugo said. I want to talk to Mama. Is there a fire lit in any of the other rooms? Yes, in the library, said Gwendolen. That's where we all go in the evening. But Hugo, can't we come with you? We had very nearly finished our supper when you arrived, and we'll be as quiet as mice, I promise you. No, he said pleasantly. But... Oh, Gwenny, give it up, said Percy. Let's go wait in the dining parlour, he told the others. Frances followed him down the hallway, and so did Gwendolen, but dragging her feet. Bertram paused to knowledgeably inform Hugo, Speaking of mice, we have them, then trotted after his siblings, the dogs frisking behind him. Hugo and Mama made their way into the library, which was just as he remembered it, filled with books and paintings and comfortable old sofas and chairs, a big faded rug underfoot and heavy drapes drawn tight against the chill of the evening. He sat on one of the sofas and stretched out his long booted legs on an ottoman. Mama perched on the edge of a chair, sitting very straight. Oh, Hugo, darling, she said at once. I'm so sorry you had to see that. Nonsense. I'm sorry you've had to deal with that fellow. Mama, have you other debts? Yes, and I'm afraid, well, I'm afraid there are quite a lot of them. There's the grocer and the chandler and dear Dr. Wilson, who's been absolutely gracious about it, I assure you. The influenza was horrid last year, and not only did Francis and Gwendolen contract it, so did Eliza and poor old Hoyt. And your Aunt Claudia also. We quite feared for her life the entire month of November. Which reminds me, we needed a great many bones for broth and pork for jelly, and so, unfortunately, we do owe the butcher a substantial amount. She fidgeted with the ends of her shawl, then clearly determined to give a full accounting, added, There's the linen drapers as well, for the children do grow so, and the expense of the animals. Somehow they seem to find us, the poor darlings, and I simply couldn't turn them away. And I know some people might think it's ridiculously extravagant, given our circumstances, to pension off a servant. But dear Robinson shakes so dreadfully, and he's been so good to us all these years. How could I not? And last month, I had to take Bertram to Hensingham to get a tooth pulled. He still has it in a jar on his window sill, and I'm sure he'll want to show it to you. Oh, Hugo, Bertram didn't even flinch. It was he who gave me my smelling salts afterwards, as cool as you please. Hugo nodded. Pluck to the backbone, isn't he? You all are. Mama, he went on, gently. I didn't think you were flush, precisely, all these years. But what with your income from the funds and what I've been sending, and Gabriel too, I hadn't any idea things were so difficult for you. Mama's enormous blue eyes were shimmering with tears, which valiantly she tried to blink away. Oh, my darling Hugo, how could I bother you with these trivialities? There you were, so far away, desperately fighting for your life in that horrible wilderness. She drew a deep breath. I've made a ghastly mess of things, haven't I? I haven't even mentioned the Sunday collection plate and the subscription to the indigent's charity. You have every right to scold me. Hugo raised his eyebrows. Scold you, Mama. Don't be silly. You've done magnificently. She was dabbing at her cheeks again with that same ineffectual bit of a handkerchief. Then she looked at him and smiled a little. Have I, dearest? Have I really? Hugo crossed one ankle over the other and repressed a wince. His leg was really hurting now. It had been a long day. 
If, he reflected, he were the type of person to indulge in pointless guilt, he'd be obliged to feel bad for having loved being a soldier and enjoying it vastly when all the while he'd been ignorant of their severe money problems. But, luckily, he wasn't that type. Both he and the mater, in their separate spheres, had done their best, and wasn't it humorous that they'd concealed from each other some of the less pleasant aspects of their existence? His wounds, her debts. So he said, with sincerity, Yes, Mama, you've been a brick. I'm so glad you think so. Oh, Hugo, now that you're home, safe and well, everything is going to be fine. Her smile was confident now. To be sure it is, he said easily. By the by, is there any news from Brooke House since last you wrote me? From Brooke House? Why, no, darling, not that I've heard of. Ah. Hugo yawned hugely and turned his gaze to the cosily flickering fire, listening with contentment as a gust of wind sent rain spattering against the windows. How splendid to be inside and warm and dry. Of course, other people might be worrying right now about how many leaks there were in the roof. But he wasn't, as he had no intention of tramping upstairs tonight to find out. Nor was he brooding, possibly with a certain sense of pressure, about the fact that their situation was quite a bit worse than he'd thought. There was nothing he could do about it right now. And tomorrow was a new day, filled with possibility. Hugo yawned again and got up, saying, Well, Mama, I'm to bed. Half an hour later, having said good night to everyone, including Senor Rodrigo, who, according to Gwendolen, gave every sign of wanting to kiss him also, he civilly declined the honour, Hugo was in his bed, utterly relaxed and deeply, peacefully asleep. Wake up, mademoiselle! Catherine didn't open her eyes, but only groaned, twisted onto her side, and tugged the soft, rich bed covers up around her chin. Don't want to, she muttered to Celeste. The morning is well advanced, mademoiselle, and breakfast will soon commence. Catherine groaned again. I'm tired. When you stay up very late, it is to be expected. Celeste's tone was unsympathetic, which was hardly surprising given that she slept on a truckle bed right next to Catherine's own vast luxurious one, and so had endured, as she often did, the full blaze of a candelabra set on a side table while Catherine, propped up on pillows, read until her eyes grew too weary to continue. And not just reading, also ignoring Celeste's grumblings and rustlings. Countless times had she suggested that Celeste move the truckle bed to a nice shadowy corner of the gargantuan bedchamber, but Celeste always refused, saying, with the unnecessarily dramatic air of a martyred saint about to be lashed to the pyre, I know my duty, mademoiselle. So if Celeste didn't feel sympathetic toward her, she didn't feel sympathetic toward Celeste either. Last night, she had read nearly into the morning hours, which, of course, was why she was so tired. She'd been devouring Mrs. Radcliffe's The Italian, or The Confessional of the Black Penitents, a preposterous novel filled with lurid and improbable plot twists, but nonetheless wonderfully entertaining. In the end, the beautiful heroine, Elena de Rosalba, was released from the convent where she'd been held against her will. And also, she learned that not only was she not of humble birth, as she'd believed all her life, she actually had royal blood running through her veins, thereby making her completely eligible to marry her noble and heroic love, the dashing Vincentio di Vivaldi, who more than once almost died for her sake. Plus, all the nasty villains were exterminated in horrible and very satisfying ways. Speaking of devouring, while she was reading, she'd also eaten all the remaining fifteen diabloutins. Really, now that she thought of it, the 
Italian was a kind of bonbon in itself, a delicious confection for the brain. And now she was hungry for more. Unfortunately, having finished the Italian, she'd have to reopen negotiations with Celeste for a fresh supply of chocolate and forbidden novels. Bother! Catherine frowned and twisted onto her back, wincing. Blearily, she opened her eyes. What's the weather today? Is it still raining? she asked Celeste. Oui, mademoiselle. Catherine's frown deepened. It was pleasant last night, listening to the rain pattering against her windows while she was tucked up snugly in bed. But rain this morning meant that father and the other men wouldn't go out hunting and shooting. Instead, they would crowd into the drawing room after breakfast, where they'd hang about complaining, drinking, making an elaborate pretense of reading the newspapers, and sleeping, thereby taking up a great deal of space on the best sofas, as well as rendering Catherine's enforced interval among mother and the other women doubly tedious. The day stretched before her, predictably and endlessly. Catherine pulled the covers up over her head. Maybe, if she was lucky, she would suffocate here in bed, die a peaceful death, and ascend to heaven, in her mind a lovely, quiet place where no one nagged at you, kept you from doing the things you liked, made people you despised sleep in the same room as you, or woke you up before you wanted. In fact, maybe heaven was a place where you could be absolutely alone. That be a treat. Get up, mademoiselle, s'il vous plaît. Le friseur will soon be here. What? Why? Votre maman mentioned to me earlier that your coiffure requires immediate amendment. But she had it done over last week, and now I have a fringe and look just like a Shetland pony. Isn't that enough for her? Apparently, mademoiselle, your appearance is not yet satisfactory. Even though Celeste's voice was muffled due to the bed covers over Catherine's ears, she could still hear within it a distinct note of malicious satisfaction. She said, more to herself than to Celeste, it never will be. She was able to state this with some certainty. It seemed that for all her life from mother, from father, had issued an endless stream of remarks suggestive of some fundamental lack. Her hair, for example, or her posture, her complexion, her attitude, and so on and so forth. It had been drearily familiar at school, too. Pay attention, Miss Brooke. Head up, eyes forward. Do stop gnawing at your fingernails. It's most unseemly. What are you scribbling there? No, you may not have more ink. You would be infinitely better off, Miss Brooke, if you could only conform. That is, after all, why your parents have sent you here, so that you might model yourself after the other young ladies. If you behave as though your background is without stain, you may, at least, foster that illusion when among those of impeccable breeding. Will you kindly turn your attention, Miss Brooke, to the front of the classroom? This constant daydreaming really must stop. More candles? What for? The reading interval is over. Put down that book at once. It's a scientific fact that excessive reading damages the delicate tissues of the female brain. So troublesome. Again. Really, Miss Brooke, it's most trying. The memories had come crowding in, and rage ran through her now, ran through her body like a storm. A savage, merciless storm that could turn the sky black uproot trees, sweep away houses. At the same time, she was rapidly amending her idea of heaven. It was a place where nobody wanted to change you. Catherine waited for the rage to subside, bit by bit, and in the slow wake of its receding devastation came deep sorrow, loneliness, and another thought there was a strong likelihood she'd never gain admittance to heaven. For really, she wasn't at all sure that she was a good person. For one thing, she was quite unfilial. 
She couldn't remember the last time she'd summoned a scrap of affection for either of her parents. For another thing, she furtively spent most of her pin money on illicit goods. Also, quite frequently, she made a pretense of listening to people when really she wasn't, occupying herself instead by thinking her own thoughts. No, it was the other place where she would probably end up, being prodded with a pitchfork by a devil who would look exactly like Celeste. Get up, mademoiselle, or else I know! Catherine threw back the bed covers, or else ma chère maman will chide us. She sat up, and her back began to hurt her even more. Damn, she said, but very, very quietly, lest Cher Celeste report to mother that Catherine had been heard to utter a dreadful, low, vulgar word, just like the grandchild of a minor, which, undeniably, she was, a troublesome fact that Mrs. Brooke had for many years laboured to conceal. Having enjoyed breakfast with his usual hearty appetite, and then unearthing a pair of his old brogues, entirely suited for a good tramp through the countryside, Hugo had set off for Brook House, cheerfully disregarding both the light rain overhead and the mud underfoot. He was home. He'd slept well, there was no tripe put in front of him this morning, and here he was, quite literally moving forward with his plan to fix things. As he walked along the sodden lane, Hugo tried to summon to his mind an image of Catherine Brooke. She had dark hair, he remembered that, and perhaps her eyes were dark also, but he could recall nothing else about her appearance. In her letter, Mamma had said that Catherine was sweet and lively. This did align with Hugo's memory of her. She seemed always to be chattering on about books, dolls, kittens, flowers and fairies in such a droll, engaging way that one couldn't help but be entertained. Despite generally preferring to discuss horses, fishing, army manoeuvres, a seal carcass which had washed up on the beach, that sort of thing. He remembered now, Mama once saying, Poor little girl, she's here so often it almost seems as if she wants to live here but of course I haven't the heart to turn her away. There was more to be known about the Brooks, had Hugo wished to consult his mother or cook or Whitehaven's most fruitful source of information, the wonderfully knowledgeable butcher's wife. At the time of which Hugo was thinking, the Brooks had lived next door in a large, handsome brick house, very much like that of the Penhallows. It belonged to Catherine's grandfather, old Joseph Bugle, who had begun his working life as a child joining his father in the coal mines, and eventually, through relentless effort and ruthless ambition, amassing ownership of a dozen mines and an incredible fortune to boot. Having married the equally humble daughter of a collier's agent, he shrewdly snapped up the brick house on the beach when its unlucky owner had fallen on hard times, and there established his bride. They were blessed in due course with one child only, a daughter, Hester, who had inherited her father's soaring ambition, except that hers was focused on the social sphere rather than on the financial. At twenty, she'd managed to leap up the ladder by eloping with Roland Brooke, the son of an impoverished Yorkshire baronet, who had promptly disowned him for sinking so low as to marry the offspring of a low-bred labourer. But Roland hardly noticed. He'd made his choice, had staked everything on his chances with the bugles. Never one to willingly part with his hard-earned money, old Joseph had insisted that for the sake of economy, Hester and her new husband live under his roof, and for several years explosive acrimony had reigned within. Joseph loathed his son-in-law Roland, whom he castigated as a pretentious, dandified ne'er-do-well. Hester resented this as an aspersion on her own cleverness, and told her father so, deliberately throwing in French phrases which he didn't understand, and which rendered him nearly apoplectic with rage. Roland, for his part, 
tolerated his father-in-law as one would a large primate with whom one was trapped in a cage, a primate with a finite lifespan that happened to be sitting on a bulging chest of gold coins. Within weeks of their wedding, Roland and Hester discovered that aside from a mutual interest in social advancement, they had nothing in common, and it wasn't long before they were fighting about everything, including whether the sky was really blue and if pigs could fly, albeit in low tones so infused with vitriol that in a way their arguments were worse than if they were shouting. Old Joseph's wife, wilting in this turgid atmosphere, quietly and gratefully passed away when Catherine was nine, and the next year Joseph was dead too, having tumbled into one of his own pits, an accident felt by many in the community to be cosmic justice. The lawyers had barely finished articulating the terms of Joseph Bugle's will before Roland, with Hester's eager assent, had sold the mines and the old brick house and bought a large piece of land five miles past town on which they proceeded to have built what they called Brook House and quite a few of the Whitehaven wags termed Broke House due to its staggering expense. Had such calumny come to their ears, Roland and Hester would have ignored it, secure not only in the three hundred thousand pounds worth of profit from the mines, but also in the additional monies that were coming in from Roland's new investments. Not all of them were successful, of course, but that was how business went. Anyone with half a brain knew that. Why, only last week Roland had suffered an aggravating loss in the wool market, but yesterday he had received a very satisfying cheque from the proprietors of the Swansea and Mumbles Railway, in whose daring venture he'd had the impressive foresight to invest. Of this, naturally, Hugo was not aware, but all that really mattered to him was that the Brooks had a daughter, who was yet unmarried, with whom he had, in childhood, shared an affectionate friendship. He smiled at the memory. Maybe, just maybe, there was still a reservoir of that attachment between himself and Catherine. Perhaps they could find real happiness together. He walked on. Absently, Catherine eyed Sir John Bronrig, who was seated in the chair next to hers and had been talking volubly and at great length about sealing wax. But as she had been pretending to be deaf, she now had no idea as to his current topic. Cabbages, perhaps, or the king's latest maniacal outburst. It occurred to her now, all at once, that Sir John reminded her of Monsieur de la Motte, late of the Basingstoke Academy. He was romantically slim, dark-haired, dark-eyed, plus he had a habit of quoting, inaccurately, from Robert Southey's epic poem, The Curse of Kehama, with a throwaway air that everyone said was positively mesmerising. Catherine waited uneasily for that deadly flicker of response. But there was nothing. No giddy flutter, no longing, no desire to bring him any closer than he already was. Excellent. She was completely in control, as cold as a block of ice and as safe as any locked box. Into her mind flickered a memory of herself at fifteen, rendered helpless with desire for Germaine de la Motte and its ugly aftermath when they'd been discovered. What a silly little fool she had been but never again. Catherine kept her gaze fixed on Sir John, idly wondering if, three or four years into the future, her parents would consider him an acceptable matrimonial candidate. Earlier this year, during her season, as unquestionably the richest young lady on the marriage mart, she'd received quite a few offers. But father and mother refused them all, as they'd been holding out for a duke or a marquis at the very least. None had been forthcoming. Naturally, it didn't help that they hadn't received vouchers for almacs or invitations to the ton's most select gatherings. Discreet douceurs, as mother called them, 
bribes were what they were, to certain financially challenged hostesses, had gotten them admitted to some of the better parties. But, alas, no duke or marquis had fallen on his knees before Catherine and offered her his hand and heart. For Catherine's next season, her parents had indicated they would settle for an earl or a viscount. Failing that, Catherine supposed, the year after that, a baron such as Sir John would have to suffice, or even, if all hope by then was lost, a hereditary knight. And what came below that? She knitted her brows, thinking hard. There was a regular sort of knight, which, progressing from dukes downward, pretty much covered the nobility and the gentry, unless you factored in aristocrats from Ireland, Scotland, and so forth. What about the well-born from further afield? There was the rest of Europe, and Asia, and America, north and south, along with that interesting bit in the middle. And Catherine was mentally circumnavigating the globe, and so missed the stately entrance of their butler Turpin, who announced in solemn tones, Captain Hugo Penhello, and also she failed to notice the awed ripple that swept throughout the room, as well as the rather piquant sight of her parents surging forward to meet their unexpected guest, hailing him as a former neighbour, and therefore a cherished member of their acquaintance, and jockeying for the privilege of being the very first to greet him. It was only Sir John saying, Miss Brooke, in a loud voice, that brought Catherine out of her reverie. He went on, more quietly, but with a distinct note of awe. You know him? Who? Him, said Sir John, and she followed his gaze to see an enormously tall, broad-shouldered man walking toward her, with thick golden hair cropped short and eyes the vivid blue colour of sapphires. Goodness, she thought, surprised, how had a Greek god descended from Olympus and arrived in their hideously overdecorated drawing room? Even as that fanciful thought ricocheted through her mind, even as she stared at him, registering in a second wave of heightened awareness the stunning handsomeness of his face, the muscular strength of him, and the easy grace with which he moved, an unwelcome, galvanic energy snaked its way through her body, supple and sinuous and merciless. Oh, God, no. She'd done with this. She'd quashed this dangerous and humiliating tendency. Her feeling of safety evaporated, and a hot red flush rose up from her throat to her face, rendering her, she thought, with awful self-consciousness, the exact shade of a ripe cherry. And why on earth was he smiling at her? Hello, Kate. Catherine blinked. The man had stopped before her, flanked by mother and father, who had suddenly the aspect of guards keeping a prisoner in check. Although he was clearly so powerful he could, like mighty Zeus, say, or Apollo, flick them away like flies. It made for such an appealing image that she didn't respond only gazed up at him as if entranced. Hello, he repeated in a deep, pleasant voice, and then it came to her in a flash. It was Hugo. Hugo from her childhood. Hugo Penhallow, whose memory, curiously enough, had surfaced in her mind once or twice during the season, thanks to that dreadful old relative of his, and then sunk away into oblivion. Still, she said nothing as he bowed and added, That is to say, Miss Brooke, how do you do? Reflexively, through long habit, suspicion rose within her, and Catherine steeled herself to resist that smile of his, that friendly charm, that impossibly glorious, horribly perilous masculinity. What platitudes could she force herself to utter? Oh, yes. The old fallback. How do you do? I'm very well, thanks. Think, think, you fool. Regurgitate another platitude. You're in Whitehaven, visiting your family? Not a visit, no. 
I was in the army for several years, but I've sold out and come home. Oh. Catherine wished he would go away, wished her fiery blushes would subside, wished she were safely tucked back in bed with a book. Not with a book, but with him, came the wicked thought, with Hugo, and she scowled in an attempt to disguise her deepening fear as she reeled out of control. Catherine, do smile, said Mother. Isn't it mother you that Captain Penhallow has come to call on us? Her lips were curved upward, noticed Catherine, in a simulacrum of a smile, but in her eyes was the icy alertness of a raptor. Mother was on the hunt again. Without waiting for Catherine to respond, she went on with arch animation. We recently had the pleasure of meeting your esteemed relation in London. I refer, bien sûr, to Mrs. Henrietta Penhallow. Such graciousness, such cordialité. London was positively abuzz with rumours about her reasons for participating in the season after such a long absence. So very titillating, don't you think so, Captain? Hugo Penhallow looked at her rather blankly. I beg your pardon, Mum? Mother's artificial smile widened. Why, her search for a suitable bride for her grandson, Gabriel. So many young ladies entertaining hopes. But one hears that a rather unexpected jeune fille somehow managed to dominate the field. As to that, Mum, I can't say. I can tell you that my cousin's engaged to a fine young lady, Miss Livia Stewart. Yes, but who is she? No one's ever heard of her, said Mother, plainly hoping for confidential information, which could provide her with some status-elevating gossip. And Father put in, You're the heir, though, aren't you, Captain? If Gabriel Penhallow doesn't have a son, or happens to die soon... By now, Catherine was plunged so deep in embarrassment that willingly could she have murdered both her parents. In front of all the gaping guests, with, say, the exquisite and expensive fan she held, on which the rosy figures of winged cherubs cavorted like idiots. If you used enough force, even delicate hornsticks would work, wouldn't they? Father, she muttered. He glanced down at her. What? Happens all the time, doesn't it? Life's like that. Unpredictable. Brushing aside what she no doubt considered a pointless divagation, Mother jumped in again. And what about yourself, Captain? Have you selected a fortunate demoiselle to call your own? Repressing a groan, Catherine slid down three or four inches in her seat. If she pretended she was boneless... Maybe she could ooze off the chair, congeal in a puddle of shame, and be absorbed by the soft fibres of the luxurious oriental carpet on which her kid's slippers rested, thereby disappearing forever. Still, she couldn't keep from looking up at Hugo Penhallow, on whose handsome face was still that expression of courteous blankness. Ah, uh, no, ma'am, I haven't he said to Mother. What a loss to womanhood, she replied, brightening. I do hope you'll remedy that très bientôt. And then she swung around to Sir John Bronrig. Oh, Sir John, I'm sure you won't mind giving way to le cher Captain Penhallow, will you? He and Catherine have so much to catch up on. Do get up, s'il vous plaît. What? Oh, of course. Sir John shambled to his feet and was instantly borne away by father, while mother stood at a remove of some five or six feet, her vigilant posture making it very clear to anyone of even the dimmest intelligence that her daughter and her distinguished guest were to enjoy an uninterrupted tête-à-tête -tête de la plus délicieuse. Anyone might look, of course, but they had better not approach, or they might be very, very sorry. Chapter 3 Hugo sat down. For a moment he wondered which was worse, being stared at or tripe. It was an unanswerable question, 
and instead he looked over at Kate, at Catherine Brooke, hoping he'd done reasonably well at masking his surprise at her appearance. Of course, he hadn't come here expecting to find a little girl. He knew she'd be all grown up. But it was rather difficult to simply see her as she was now. One's attention was inexorably drawn to the large glinting jeweled ear bobs and to her dark hair pulled up into a sort of high bundle around which strings of pearls and diamonds had been wrapped, leaving a thick straight fringe arrayed across her forehead with a stiff, crisp appearance. Also, Hugo was no judge of women's fashion, nor was he a critical sort of man, but it did seem that Catherine's gown had quite a lot of ruffles on it, running from her waist down to the hem, which had its own perpendicular set of them, along with multiple bands looping round the shoulders, and at the wrists as well, giving Catherine overall a rather puffy look, and also a sparkly one due to the diamonds in her hair, and the three or four strands of them hung round her neck, and which lay across her bosom in a glittering display. Another thing he hadn't expected was her reaction to him. She hadn't smiled. She hadn't seemed at all glad to see him, and altogether she gave the impression of being sorry that French sharpshooter hadn't done a better job of trying to annihilate him. As he looked at her, she slid a little lower in her seat, her face flushed a bright red, and on it an expression of sullen hostility. Puzzled, and conscious that her mother was well within earshot, Hugo said politely to Catherine, It's nice to see you again. Thank you, she muttered. Been a while, hasn't it? Yes. Thirteen years, by my calculation. I suppose so. At my father's funeral? Yes. You are still living next door to us? Yes. Miss the ocean and the beach? I don't know. I never think about it. Enjoy living in the country, then? She shrugged. Did you like London? he asked. She shrugged again, and silence hung between them, almost like a physical thing. Hugo now wondered which was worse, being stared at, tripe, or sitting next to someone who disliked you. He tried again. So, you met my Aunt Henrietta in London? Not really. But here Mrs. Brooke darted forward. The charmante Mrs. Penhallow, quite the first lady of London. I simply dote on her. Catherine, my douce, I'm sure that Captain Penhallow would absolument adore seeing our new ruins. Why don't you take him for a little tour? Catherine glared up at her mother. It's raining. Mrs. Brooke gave a little tinkling laugh. Oh, hardly at all. A bit of rain won't melt you, après tout. Are we to go without a chaperone, mother? Catherine's tone was sardonic. Oh, you and the captain are old friends, n'est-ce pas? Most unobjectionable. Do go, ma chère petite fille. And she gave Catherine a look which made it clear she wasn't asking, she was commanding. Fine, Catherine said dourly, then glanced at him. If you want to. It was less a question of wanting to view new ruins, and wasn't that an oxymoron, incidentally, than being given an excuse to leave this stuffy, crowded drawing room. Hugo rose to his feet with alacrity. I'd love to. For a moment, he would have sworn that Catherine was afraid of something. Him? How could that possibly be? And then she gave a deep, annoyed-sounding, entirely audible sigh, and got up also, grimacing as if something hurt her. Quickly, Hugo offered her his arm. Miss Brooke? She actually leaned away from him, as if he were some kind of repulsive, bad-smelling troll she'd found lurking under a bridge somewhere, and dropped her unfurled fan onto her chair. Let's go. As they walked away, Hugo heard from behind him Mr. Brooks saying to someone in a loud whisper, The Whitehaven branch of the Penhallows, you know. 
poor as church mice, but still, a penhallow is better than a duke any day. Mrs. Brooke saying, such a handsome couple, ne sont-ils pas? As well as, inevitably, somebody else commenting, Captain Penhallow looks just like a Greek god, doesn't he? Hugo resisted the impulse to growl at this last and all too familiar remark and ignored the others. He and Catherine then passed an awkward mute interval in the cathedral-like great hall while they waited for a maid to bring her a pelisse and a hat, with the butler and his several satellites standing about. They at least had the courtesy not to stare. In the meantime, Hugo gazed up at the ceiling, which displayed an astonishing quantity of arched panels and gold leaf. This, he thought, wasn't so much a home as a sort of bizarre museum. A damned uncomfortable place to live, if you asked him. In due course, the maid arrived and assisted her mistress into a high-necked crimson police, heavily trimmed with ermine, and then placed over the high knob of Catherine's hair a red velvet hat festooned with lace and several large artificial flowers. She had brought with her soft kid gloves, as well as a pair of half-boots embroidered with so much silver thread it was difficult to see the leather underneath. If Mademoiselle would step into the salon just over there, the maid said, I shall help you with the boots. Catherine seemed about to comply, but then she glanced up at him. An arrested look came onto her face, and for several moments she simply stood there, stock still, as if consumed by her own thoughts. Your boots, mademoiselle, if you would be so good as to come with me? I don't want them. But mademoiselle, your slippers will be ruined. Very likely. Votre maman, whispered the maid. Catherine only shrugged. Let's go, she said again to Hugo. Mademoiselle, your gloves. No. Turpin, the door, please. At once, Miss Catherine, and the butler signalled to a subordinate who hastened to comply. A cool, playful breeze from outside whirled to meet them, causing the white lace on Catherine's hat to flop wildly about, and together they crossed the threshold into a damp, pungent world of scudding grey clouds high above, everywhere the rich smell of wet earth and fallen leaves scattered at their feet in a wanton riot of red, orange, green, gold. They made their way along a wide, winding path toward a thickly clustered grove. Once they had reached it, and followed along three or four of its long, gentle curves, Brook House disappeared from their view as if it had never existed. Hugo looked over at Catherine. She was frowning a little, with her gaze fixed on the muddy ground in front of her, giving the appearance of one who was mentally a thousand miles away. Kate, he said, do you really want to be out here, with me? Again, he would have sworn he saw a little fearful tremor run through her, but she only replied, I am Catherine now, and you should call me Miss Brooke, you know. Miss Brooke he repeated pleasantly. Shall I take you back to the house? No. As you wish. Ha, huh, she said, as if she couldn't help it. I beg your pardon? Nothing. Never mind. Well, Hugo thought, this had turned out rather badly. Not that it wasn't refreshing to be around a woman who didn't fawn all over him, complimenting him about his looks until he heartily desired to be elsewhere, but it was obvious that Catherine Brooke found him unappealing. His chances with her were plainly nil. It was a setback, if not an outright blow, but at least he'd made the attempt. Rapidly, his mind moved across his alternatives. He'd need to immediately confer with their man of business and together try to reach an accommodation with their various creditors. Remembering his offer to Mama at thirteen to become a sailor, he wondered now if he might make good on that. He had always loved boats, had spent countless hours at the wharves looking at them. He'd hate to ship out and leave the family so soon, and the money would hardly make a dent in the enormity of their pressing needs, but it would be a start. And wouldn't it be jolly to climb a rigging at last? 
There it is, said Catherine. They had come round another bend in the path, and before them loomed a high, massive, flat-topped structure made of artfully worn tan-coloured bricks, featuring a long series of tall, graceful archways. Around it had been placed great tumbled blocks of the same tan material, conveying the impression that time had, across countless millennia, slowly and gently softened their hard geometrical lines. It was an extraordinary set-piece, intended to evoke an ancient biblical era. The exotic, fertile crescent, turbaned people in colourful robes and dusty hemp sandals, camel trains, a blazing sun, swaying palm trees and so forth, and it had been placed in the middle of a sylvan English wood. Egad, said Hugo, having thoroughly looked it over. That's not something you see every day. My parents just had it built, Catherine answered, but absently. A deep furrow had formed between her dark brows. What is it exactly? It's supposed to be the ruins of Babylon. He wanted to laugh, but instead said, It's certainly unusual, feeling himself to be on solid ground with this honest observation. As she did not reply, he went on, well, we've seen it. Shall we go back? He half turned away, but then Catherine did speak. Wait, let's go inside. Is that what you want? Yes. And so he followed her, among and past the huge artificial blocks and into the building itself, where the archways allowed cool grey light to flood the colourfully tiled interior. Against one wall was a low stone platform. On it were two high-backed marble thrones of an unpleasant ochre colour, reminiscent of dried blood, and even worse, they were ringed by a threatening phalanx of large carved wooden creatures that looked like a cross between an angry lion and a dyspeptic monkey. Catherine went to sit on one throne, and Hugo reluctantly sat on the other. One feels like King Solomon, he said, dispensing judgments and telling women to cut their infants in half. Not my cup of tea. Never mind that. Catherine swivelled around in her seat. He was damned if he'd keep thinking of them as thrones, and looked him straight in the eye. You asked if we met your Aunt Henrietta in London. He nodded. We didn't meet her, precisely, we saw her at the Royal Academy of Art, and my parents tried to introduce ourselves to her, to bring me to her attention. Catherine smiled without humour, hoping she'd choose me for her grandson, to have Gabriel Penhallow marry me. Hugo pictured in his mind his elegant, slender, silvery-haired relative. Elderly she might be, but she was still sharp as a tack, and with a posture as ramrod straight as that of any soldier. Also, she was the haughtiest, proudest, and frequently the most caustic person he knew. It wasn't hard to imagine what happened when she'd been approached by what she would doubtless pronounce a set of ghastly, brazen parvenus. He said, Didn't go well, I expect. No. Snubbed you horribly? Yes. He nodded again. I'm sorry. Don't be. We deserved it. My parents are desperate, you see, and that stripped them of any subtlety they might ever have had. Desperate? About what? That humorless smile of hers was still there. Well, I'm their only hope, I'm afraid, and I'm not exactly a help, am I? Oh, damn, Hugo thought. This was just the sort of conversation he hated, filled with opacities as treacherous as any fugas, the dreaded landmines which could suddenly blow the unwary to bits. Bluntly, he replied, Their only hope for what? To establish themselves among the beau monde. Ah. It seemed to him rather a trivial goal, but then again, he reminded himself, he was hardly in a position to judge. Wasn't he here strategically deploying the Penhallow name, after all? 
Then something Catherine had said looped again in his brain, and he looked at her more closely. Her skin was very white and smooth, he noticed suddenly, and her lips the exact colour of a ripe cherry. Delicious, tempting, but not for him, alas, to taste. He pulled himself together and went on. They see you as their only hope. Puts rather a lot of pressure on you, doesn't it? Her big, dark eyes seemed to shimmer for a moment, but then she sat up a little straighter and said, Oh, you should save your sympathy for my parents, Captain. It's been quite an arduous gamble for them, after all, especially since I'm of so little value, being, you know, a less-than-ideal commodity in their high-stakes game. Well, here was another conversational landmine, especially given the reason for his visit today. Hugo wondered again how he might bring this awkward conversation to a close and make a graceful exit. In the sudden silence that fell between them, he watched as her gaze travelled over him and abruptly she dropped her eyes. He saw her hands clenching tight in her lap. A minute ticked by, then another, and another. A red flush bloomed again on her face, spreading across the soft alabaster of her cheeks. Finally, she said, Let's talk about something else. Certainly. What would you like to discuss? You. Catherine didn't dare look at Hugo Penhallow any longer, for fear she might actually do what she urgently wanted, what her traitorous body was yearning for her to do, which was to go over to him, put her hands on those broad shoulders, lean close, and... Oh! lick his face, rub her face against the dense gold of his hair, put her mouth hard on his, and more. No! No! She took a deep, calming breath, could almost feel herself cooling down into that reassuring block of ice. Oh, better. She looked down at her feet, and registered with pleasure the fact that her slippers were indeed muddy and ruined, precisely as Celeste had warned her they'd be. Back there in the great hall, she'd been just about to obediently change her slippers for the half-boots, but then she'd let herself glance up at Hugo, at that magnificent face, with its proud, straight nose, perfect mouth, those extraordinary blue eyes filled with light, and inspiration had come to her. So fast, and so dazzlingly, it felt like there were fireworks inside her head. She had an idea. Sitting in this ridiculous building on this absurd marble seat, it suddenly occurred to her that the young Catherine that was would have invited Hugo to play at being kings and queens, would have pretended that those bizarre wood creatures surrounding them were their courtiers, or their servants, or their enemies, or their children, or... She broke off this distracting train of thought, wrenched herself back into the present, and looked again at Hugo, pleased at how steady and firm she felt. She said, I heard father talking as we left the drawing room, Captain. Is it true that you're poor? Yes, he said calmly. And were you telling mother the truth, that you're not affianced elsewhere? Yes. Catherine nodded. Oh, damn. Her heart was hammering hard within her, as if it were a caged animal trying to burst free. To combat it, to bring herself back into coolness, into her mind she summoned an image. A certain passage from one of her hidden history books, this one about the ancient Romans. Cornelius Tacitus had written in 97 AD about the Cetones, a tribe in northern Europe which was believed to be a matriarchal society. Among the Cetones, Tacitus said, the women were powerful. The women chose their mates. It was a wild, a radical idea back then. Disapprovingly had Tacitus commented upon its harmful effects, and it still was, of course, seventeen hundred years later. Even in this modern era, in which civilization had evolved with things like the printing press, steam engines, inoculations, gaslights, the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and Herschel's great telescopes, 
women were still supposed to demurely sit around waiting for some man to ask her to be his wife. But an hour ago, Hugo Penhallow had unexpectedly strolled into her parents' drawing room, and maybe, just maybe, they could effect a trade to their mutual benefit. It was not, to say the least, a romantic proposition, but it had been a long, long time since she had indulged in girlish dreams of love, a soulmate, happily ever after. And here, right in front of her, was an opportunity to escape Brook House. So to Hugo she said, in a voice that was only a little bit breathless, Marry me. She saw his blue eyes widen and the look of surprise on his face, and then, and then, he laughed. And Catherine shrank back in her chair, almost as if he'd pushed on her chest with one large, strong hand. To her horror, it felt as if her face was crumpling, giving her away, showing too much, and quickly she brought her hands to cover it. Her fingers, she noticed distantly, were icy. I should have worn my gloves. What a stupid girl I am. And what was I thinking, asking him such a thing? I deserve to be mocked. Out loud, she said in a low, choked voice. Go away. Kate, he said, not laughing now. Oh, Kate, I'm Catherine. It was a shriek, but muffled by the hands she still pressed hard against her face. Go away! Then, startling her, his own hands were upon her bare wrists, and with enormous care he drew them away and onto her lap. He was kneeling before her, his expression one of deep contrition. God, but I'm an oaf. I wasn't laughing at you, Miss Brooke, I swear it. Pleasure at his touch, at his warm hands upon her cool flesh, shivered through her, and just as quickly came the old, devastating fear. Misinterpreting that shiver, perhaps, he released her wrists, but remained on his knees before her. She said rather roughly, What's so funny, then? I laughed because you said the very thing I came here to say to you. She stared at him. Are you joking? No. But... She broke off. His admission made everything very easy. But why was it so painful to hear? At least he'd had the decency not to pretend he was madly in love with her. She took refuge in curtness. Oh, do get up. You look foolish like that. He only smiled, as if her words had no power to sting then rose to his feet in a single lithe movement and sat again, with such easy self-assurance that despite herself, she couldn't help but think how penhallows and thrones just seemed to go together. She recalled that brief, humiliating encounter with Mrs. Henrietta Penhallow, an imperious and queenly dame who, you could tell, moved through life with effortless grace, as one to the manner born, without ever having to question where she belonged. Or if she belonged. Those lucky, lucky Penhallows. Then it blazed through Catherine's mind, like a comet lighting up the night sky. This marriage could not only set her free, it would make her a Penhallow too. Catherine Penhallow. She could practically hear herself saying, with a confident little toss of her head, Will I be going to Almack's this evening, you ask? Yes, of course. All of the patronesses have called and presented me with vouchers. The Queen's drawing room? To be sure I am. The latest Carlton House fate? That also. Of course, her future in-laws would despise her. She was certain of that. She was no Elena di Rosalba, the saintly, high-minded heroine of the Italian. She wasn't angelically and perfectly beautiful, nor was there royal blood running through her veins. She was just a person. But what did she care? To her came again an image of Henrietta Penhallow, this time one of her scandalised outrage when she received the news of Hugo's betrothal to that dreadfully common girl whose parents had shoved her forward at the Royal Academy. Catherine smiled, just a little. 
She couldn't blame Mrs. Penhallow for her reaction, but still, wouldn't it be enjoyable to meet her again one day as equals? And wouldn't it be wonderful to have a very different season next year, a chance to do it all over again? How rarely in life did such an opportunity come along? Catherine's breath caught in her throat with a fierce, terrible joy. She said to Hugo, You need money. Yes. I've got plenty of it, or rather my father does. So I've heard. Your name for Brook money. That seems like a fair exchange. He smiled ruefully. I hope so. That's all I've got to give you. Oh, but you're wrong, she very nearly blurted out, as helplessly her eyes travelled down the long length of him, then writhed as a hot, horrifying wave of shame flowed over her, much as she imagined lava might feel upon naked skin. Are you all right? Repressing the urge to frantically unbutton her police, sorry she had left her fan behind in the house, Catherine gripped the marble arms of her seat, welcoming their hard, inanimate coldness. I'm fine. Are you? You reminded me of myself when my leg's troubling me. What do you mean? She asked defensively. I broke it a while back, and it hurts a little when I'm tired. You looked as if... How did you break your leg? She interrupted, wanting very much to change the subject. Oh, some mad American came leaping upon me with a bayonet, and after I clouted him with my musket, I fell off my horse onto another American, broke my leg, but it was a stroke of luck for sure. How was that a stroke of luck? Why, that second fellow was creeping up behind me with a tomahawk. Hugo laughed. I'm afraid he was rather done in after I fell on him. There's so much of me. Catherine eyed him in surprise. How lightly he spoke. He wasn't bitter, nor was he boasting as so many military men seemed to do. Among her parents' acquaintance, for example, was a relic of the Maratha wars fought against India in the previous century, and his single subject of conversation was his prowess on the battlefield, the terror he struck into the hearts of the enemy, the vast numbers of them he slaughtered, his expertise in every weapon known to man, and on and on, until she'd wondered if he had actually bored the poor Marathas to death by talking to them. A tomahawk is a type of axe, isn't it? she said. I've read about it. Egad, have you? Nasty things. Frightfully effective. Not well known here in England, though. Where'd you read about it? Oh, she answered vaguely, somewhere, and felt yet another awful flush coming over her. She had so much to hide from him. The books she read, the chocolate she ate, the kind of person she really was inside. Before Catherine could stop herself, she said, You remember my grandfather the miner, don't you? She waited for his face to change, for the look of revulsion, whether open or masked, but Hugo only said, Yes, Joseph Bugle, wasn't he? He used to terrify me when I was a boy. As I recall, he shouted more often than he spoke. That's about right, but he was a minor captain. I know that. You're not worried about the taint to the Penhallow line? She saw that he was looking at her curiously. He said, Taint? Is that how you think of it? Don't you? No. I expect there was that sort of talk about bloodlines when my father married a vicar's daughter, but it's all rot in my opinion. Coming from a Penhallow, this was hard to believe, but still she gave him one last chance to easily withdraw. Are you sure you want to marry me? Very sure. You're helping my family, and I'm grateful to you. I hope you won't regret it, Captain. I won't. How can you know that? I just do. In his deep, calm voice was obvious confidence, and Catherine envied him that. She, on the other hand, was still aflame with that hot, revealing blush, and her mind was skittering in a thousand different directions. She hardly knew what to say or how to act. To her fevered imagination came a sound, the distinctive rasp of massive old gates swinging open, 
the noise Elena de Rosalba might have heard as she was released from her lengthy confinement in the convent. And then the sound shifted somehow, to the little scratches of a quill moving across a piece of paper. She needed now to be a Cardinal Wolsey or a Thomas Cromwell, those towering, fiendishly clever figures from Henry Tudor's time, writing their letters to kings and popes, to dukes and generals, masterfully negotiating pacts and orchestrating events. She wasn't about to surrender herself entirely to Hugo Penhallow. If her parents' marriage was anything to judge by, she needed to make certain of her sovereignty. She must be hard and sure, could at least pretend to be, even if she felt like blancmange on the inside. Catherine made her lips curve upward in a smile. Very well, then, she told Hugo Penhallow. I reiterate my offer. The bride takes a groom. Chapter Four It was done. It was really going to happen. Hugo felt a huge wave of relief wash over him, and he bounded to his feet, more than ready to leave the ruins of Babylon and return to the comforts of 1811. I'm glad, very glad. I'll do my best to make you happy, Ca He stopped himself just in time. Miss Brooke. It's nonsensical to talk of happiness in an exchange of commodities, a business arrangement. Where are you going? Out. Aren't we done here? Not yet. Before we seal our bargain, you must consent to my terms. Terms? Of course. I just told you, this is a business arrangement. He looked down at her curiously. He had spoken of happiness. She talked about business. Go on. You're to make your own completely separate financial arrangements with my father. I'll want my own money, to spend as I like. Agreed. You're not to tell me what to do. Of course not. That includes... The line of her mouth tightened. That includes our intimate life. By Jupiter, he hadn't even thought about such things. The delights of the marriage bed. But now that he was, it occurred to him how much he'd relish a stable arrangement. A wife, to have and to hold, someone with whom to give and receive pleasure across the decades. As a long-time soldier on the move, opportunities for sexual encounters had come to him all too erratically. Unlike the other men, He'd never actually had to pay a woman to lie with him, much to the envious derision of his fellow officers, but undoubtedly a benefit for one so perpetually purse-pinched as himself. However, given what Catherine had just said, it didn't seem that this aspect of their marriage was going to be at all simple. A landmine of a different sort, evidently. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound— and quite an apt metaphor under the circumstances, wasn't it? Affably, he said to Catherine. What do you mean, precisely? You must do as I say. I must be in control of... It. When it happens. What happens? Her face, he saw, was as intense a red as her police, and her big dark eyes had a fiery glitter in them. She reminded him of a pugilist against the ropes, on the verge of bursting out in a frantic rush of violence against a foe. He hoped, very much did he hope, that she didn't think of marriage as a boxing ring, with a husband and wife approaching each other with fists raised. Well, Captain, what do you say? I accept your terms. Swear it. I swear it, Miss Brooke. Her shoulders, which had been lifted tensely high, relaxed. I suppose you think me shockingly crude mentioning such things, she said, sounding defensive, and to propose marriage in the first place. And I suppose, he answered, smiling a little, you think I should consider it crude. Don't you? I'm the wrong person to ask. As I said to Cousin Livia the other day, I'm barely fit to be around proper people. Been living the rough soldier's life for a long time. Livia? Oh, you mean the woman who's to marry your cousin Gabriel? You were with her recently? Yes, 
at Sermont Hall, stopped there on my way home. I know all about the hall, thanks to my parents' obsessive interest in the Beaumont, one of the country's most magnificent old homes, the Penhallow seat from time immemorial, 15,000 acres of the finest land in Somerset, and so on and so forth, ad infinitum. It's quite a place, he said. Speaking of which, we'll need to decide where we're going to live. Anywhere but here. Anywhere else in England. Whatever you like. But I'll want to also spend time in Whitehaven with my family. Ugh, I loathe Whitehaven. Do you? Quite fond of it myself. Well, you needn't come with me. Your place will be at my side, Captain. Her tone was imperious, her face set in hard, determined lines. He answered mildly. Then I hope you'll join me. If I don't want to go, then you shouldn't either. Miss Brooke, my family is important to me. But they're not to me. You agreed to my terms, remember? Hugo felt as if that pleasant, all-encompassing wave of relief was abruptly and all too rapidly receding. He looked down at her face, tense again and very pale, at those fiery, dark eyes, and thought suddenly, strangely, of an actress upon a stage. And then his gaze went to the rich, ermine-trimmed pelisse she wore, and that velvet hat adorned with so many silky artificial flowers, so much frilly lace, that it seemed as if somebody had for some perverse reason set out to cram it as full of decorations as humanly possible. Hugo thought of Gwendolen, who probably hadn't had a new hat in quite some time. He doubted Mamma had either. Oh, Lord, they needed his help. They all did. But a man had his limits. It would be a terrible irony to make them secure financially, but be exiled from them forever. He said, Then we may have a problem. There was a new note in his voice, very subtle, but Catherine caught it at once, and a terrible, creeping panic clutched at her. She had gone too far in playing her little Machiavellian game, had enjoyed too much the sudden and unusual feeling of power, and now he was going to change his mind. He was going to withdraw, and she'd be right back where she was. No, it would be worse, much worse, for she'd had an intoxicating glimpse of freedom. Oh, bother! Why did he care so much about spending time with his family? An incomprehensible desire. Families meant nothing but arguments and demands, dissatisfaction and strife. She herself couldn't wait to be separated from her own family. In fact, Catherine nearly gasped out loud. An idea had sprung into her head, brilliant, fully formed, wonderful and ingenious. She tucked it away for further rumination, later, when she was alone. But in the meantime, it was of the utmost importance to solidify the agreement with Hugo. An occasional visit to Whitehaven wouldn't kill her. She said to him, There's no problem. You're sure? Yes. And just so we're clear, I want to go back to London next spring, for the season. Fine. He smiled at her. Anything else you'd like to discuss? It was all right again. Thank God. The creeping tension that had gripped her so tightly now began to fade away. And something else came in its place. She tried to fight it down, but here it was. Something warm and exciting, shivery and delightful, shameful and wrong, just like those delicious secret meetings in the garden long ago. A pulsing, lovely heat seemed to fill up every empty corner of her being, and she was powerless against it a little bit of driftwood swept along by the tide. No, she said slowly to Hugo. Not to discuss, Captain, but... Yes? I... Yes? I want you to kiss me. He looked down at her, surprise in his handsome face. Oh, what a forward girl she was, Catherine thought, her hands gone all clammy. What a bad, bad person. She could almost picture Lucifer writing in his book of sins. He would have one, wouldn't he? 
St. Peter, at the gates of heaven, had his book of life, so surely Lucifer would also want to keep track of his prospective flock. 22nd of October, 1811, Catherine Brooke coarsely demands kiss from a man she hasn't seen in thirteen years. Another one of her episodes of lust. Thought she'd tamed it, but no. Am running out of space on her page already. Note to self, reserve, special place for her. Suddenly, it was as if all the light was blocked from her vision, and her heart gave an odd, frightened lurch within her breast. Darkness already? No. It was Hugo. So big. So very big he was. He'd come close to her, leaned down, and now his face was so close to hers, his warm fingers cupping her chin, those incandescent blue eyes. Catherine stopped breathing, and then his lips were on hers, warm, firm, soft, gentle, utterly masculine, and her mind fell apart. Oh, God! Oh, God! Her eyes closed of their own volition. She drew in an abrupt, audible breath of pleasure through her nostrils, her hands, which had been clenched, relaxed. All too soon it was over. So quick, so brief. She opened her eyes. Hugo was straightening, stepping away from her. Was that the best he could do? And why was he smiling? Had he seen her vulnerability? Was he glad he'd gained the upper hand over her? Unable to stop herself, Catherine snapped, You called that a kiss? He looked surprised again. I beg your pardon? You should. I should beg your pardon? Now he looked perplexed. For kissing you? I'm sorry, Miss Brooke, but I thought you wanted me to. I certainly didn't want to be kissed in that cursory way. His face cleared. Is that why you're upset? Already Catherine was sorry she'd been so frank. She slid down in her seat, ashamed all over again. It's not important, she muttered. It's just that I thought, well, I assumed that's how one would kiss a lady, under the circumstances, you know, wanted to behave as a gentleman should. Now he looked rather mischievous. I'd be glad to try again if you like. His offer only deepened Catherine's chagrin. You needn't patronise me, Captain, she said tartly, and got up, ignoring the ribbons of pain dancing up and down her back. Now that everything's settled, let's go. As you wish. Hugo stepped aside with a courtly gesture and offered her his arm, which she also ignored, just as she had in the drawing room. It was dangerous. Dangerous to be that close to him. Together, they went toward the long bank of archways where, in a silent moment of confusion about which way to go, it ended up that they each passed through their own separate arch, and so re-entered a world gone greyer and wetter. The drizzle that had accompanied them on the way here had turned into a cold, steady rain. I say, Miss Brooke, you're going to be soaked, said Hugo, looking at her with concern. Let me go on ahead and come back with an umbrella. Catherine shook her head. There's no need, she answered, and began walking on the path that would lead them back to Brook House. Hugo caught up with her in a single stride of his long legs. Your clothes may be ruined. I don't care. Actually, now that she thought about it, she did care, in the sense that she'd be thrilled if they were spoiled. The brim of her hat was already sodden and drooping around her face, and her gown's ruffled hem was getting just as muddy as her slippers. Hurrah! They walked in silence, the air around them filled with the soft sounds of rain pattering on leaves. Finally, as they came round the bend that left the woods behind and brought Brook House looming into view, Hugo said, Shall I come in and speak with your parents? No. I want to think about the settlements. Come again tomorrow, and be prepared to present your demands to my father. As long as they're not unreasonable, I'm sure he'll be willing to accept them. She laughed. Actually, you could probably ask for anything you like, 
a chest of ancient Spanish doubloons, a dozen elephants, the Pope's mitre, and he'll say yes. To see his daughter wed to a penhallow, the very pinnacle of his aspirations, and mother's too, they may literally grovel. Can you be here around eleven? Of course. He stopped then, and so did she. Would you like me to escort you to your door, Miss Brooke? There's no need. Besides, you'll want to go off toward the stables. Why? To get your horse. I walked here. She stared. You walked? It's all of five miles. My horse needed a rest, he said easily, and I like the exercise. I'm not, she said in a challenging way, a great walker. To each his own. As long as you keep that in mind. I will. Why don't you take one of our horses, or one of our carriages? Thank you, but no. I'm looking forward to the walk home. The rain hasn't let up. If anything, it's raining harder. I'm used to it, he said, smiling a little. The rough soldier's life, etc. Just so. Well, I'll take my leave of you then, Miss Brooke. Thank you again. Catherine didn't answer, because with maddening irrationality, she was hoping that he would seize her hand, like a hero in one of Mrs. Radcliffe's silly novels, and raise it to his lips, or even just clasp it in that big warm hand of his. But he only smiled at her in that mystifyingly friendly way he had, and bowed slightly. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, Miss Brooke. Goodbye, she echoed. But there came again a twist of fear, the eternal need for concealment, and she said, Captain? Yes? She tried to make herself sound both authoritative and casual all at once, although she wasn't quite sure if she succeeded. You won't tell anyone that I propose to you, will you? One of Mrs. Radcliffe's characters would have said, with a sinister gleam in his eye, Your secret is safe with me, miss. But Hugo only replied in a pleasant tone, As you like, Miss Brooke. And instinctively, Catherine knew he wouldn't betray her. Goodbye again, she said, reassured, and turned toward Brooke House, knowing she'd be pounced upon by her parents and exhaustively quizzed about what she and Hugo Penhallow had discussed. It would be easier to simply tell them about the betrothal, but instead she was going to hoard this extremely interesting little nugget of information, mention in an annoyingly vague way that Hugo might possibly be coming again sometime, and enjoy every single minute of her parents' ignorance. Ha! Who had the power now? Catherine walked up the broad stone steps to Brook House, a sudden fancy floating across her mind. If Brook House was a castle, and it certainly was big enough to be. And if she were a princess, doomed by an evil curse to sleep her life away, and if Hugo were a prince, and he definitely looked like one, who came to kiss the sleeping princess and broke the spell, why, she'd just been awakened with a kiss. Catherine smiled, then just as quickly assumed an expression of bored indifference as the front door swung open. She turned around, a last look. There was Hugo off in the distance, and there below her on the steps, she saw it now. She had left behind her a trail of filthy, dirty, messy, muddy footsteps that were as dark as, as black as sin. Hugo walked on toward Whitehaven, within him an odd jumble of emotions. The intense relief was still there, yet it also felt a little like he'd just come through a battle. He'd survived, but not without cost. It was rather a silly thought. Catherine Brooke wasn't his enemy. Was she? He sidestepped an enormous mud puddle and recalled her saying in a surprisingly unemotional voice for someone who'd just agreed to be married, This is a business arrangement and he remembered how, on the way to Brook House just a few hours earlier, he'd wondered if perhaps there was still an old bond of affection connecting himself and Catherine. A foundation on which to build genuine happiness together. 
It had been an optimistic thought, but it was clear that no such foundation existed. The lively, laughing, sweet little Kate he'd known so long ago had grown up into an entirely different sort of person. Well, that was life, wasn't it? Unpredictable, as Mr. Brooke had truly said. Nonetheless, he'd accomplished his mission, would save his family from ruin. That was the important thing. Soon, very soon, things were going to be different. Catherine's money was going to provide his mother and the children with a better, infinitely more secure future. He was tempted to immediately share his good news, but until he'd formally codified things with Mr. Brooke, it was better to keep it to himself. Hugo continued on to Whitehaven and then home, where he found, to his pleased surprise, that Grandpapa, Mama's delightful father, was there, and Mama's older sisters, Aunt Verena and Aunt Claudia, too, the three of them having defied the elements to come from the parsonage on George Street. Also gathered in the big drawing room was a middle-aged man he didn't know, introduced to him as their neighbour, Mr. Beck, along with his son, Christopher, a sulky-looking young man of seventeen or so, and his daughter, Diana, who was just about Gwendolen's age. Rather guiltily, Grandpapa admitted to having splurged and bought a crate of oranges and a pineapple to properly celebrate Hugo's safe return, even as Mr. Beck was loudly hailed by all the children for bringing with him from the confectioners a veritable riot of marzipan, sugared almonds, sticky taffy and licorice, and Mamma said, apologetically, that despite the expense, she simply had to have a nice fire lit so that everyone would be comfortable. Hugo laughed, swept her up into a hug, said blithely, Of course you did, Mama," and helped himself to an orange. Later, after their guests had gone home and after supper, the six of them were cosily settled in the library, dispersed among the various chairs and sofas. The dogs lay in a sleepy mass on the hearthrug, and Gwendolen conducted an affectionate, low-voiced conversation with Senor Rodrigo, who perched on her fine-boned wrist and seemed to find much of what she said vastly amusing, because he cackled a great deal. Hugo was leafing through an old volume of nautical illustrations, but looked up when Percy cleared his throat and said, I say, Hugo, we've got something we want to tell you. Hugo closed his book and set it aside, noticing that all his siblings were now sitting up very straight, on their faces expressions of eager alertness. Even Senor Rodrigo had quieted and was fixing him with a sharp, beady eye. To Percy, Hugo said, What is it, old chap? We know how badly off the family is. Mama's done her best to keep it from us, but we all know it's true. Oh, Percy, darling, said Mama in distress. It's all right, Mama, Percy said. We're not little children, you know. He looked again to Hugo. We couldn't be more glad that you're home, but it's our turn now. We want to help. We've been talking amongst ourselves, said Francis, and we've decided that we boys can get jobs. I'm going to ask at the Globe Hotel if they need a stable boy, said Percy, resolution in his voice. I wouldn't mind that sort of work a bit. I could try the other inns as well, although the Globe stables are the best in Whitehaven. I can do some tutoring, said Francis, and Bertram said, I'll try to get something at the salt works. I've been reading over Papa's papers. Hugo, did you know he left masses of them? He had some very interesting things to say about salt production. I want to help too, Gwendolen said. I'd love to be a pirate because I could get quite a lot of money very quickly and also it would be delightful to be a dreaded scourge of the high seas and Rodrigo would simply adore it, wouldn't you, darling? Leave them to the brisket, replied Senor Rodrigo agreeably. But, Gwendolen went on with a sigh, it's not a very practical plan, is it? I don't have a ship or a crew or even a single cutlass. So I've decided I can be most helpful by marrying someone who's already rich. I know I'm only 14, but I've asked Christopher Beck to marry me, and he says he will. The difficulty is that he won't come into his money for four more years, and by then it would be too late. So I thought perhaps I could somehow persuade 
Mr. Beck to marry me, even though he's terribly old and a widower, which really, when you think about it, is a very troubling word, isn't it? I always think of spiders. But of course, if Mr. Beck weren't a widower, I couldn't marry him. Yes, Gwendolen concluded, her tone surprisingly cheerful for one prepared to throw herself away on a man four decades her senior. It would certainly be a sacrifice, and I dare say I wouldn't like it at all. But one shouldn't cavil at doing distasteful things when one's family needs one. Besides, I'd be just like a tragic heroine in a novel, and that would be consolation enough for me. I'd wear black every day and droop just a little so that everyone would know how greatly I suffered. She demonstrated this by leaning her slender frame forward and lowering her head, thus creating a poignant suggestion of a tender spirit irreparably broken. Hugo didn't know if he wanted to laugh or join Mamma in a quiet bout of weeping, so touched was he. But he subdued both extremes of emotion and only said to the children, It's awfully nice of you. Thank you. We can talk about it more at another time, but for now, I'd love to know what you'd do if money weren't a question. You mean, if we had a secret benefactor who died and left us his entire fortune? Gwendolen asked, straightening up. I'd like that more than marrying Mr. Beck. Yes, that's what I mean, Hugo said, smiling at her. I'd go to Eton, like you, Hugo, said Percy without hesitation, and get my commission in the army when I'm eighteen. I'd go to Eton too, Francis said, and then on to Oxford, so I could be a scholar and a clergyman like Grandpapa. School for me also, Bertram said. And later, I'd like to study in Frankfurt, as Papa did, as long as they're able to keep those odious French away. Then, of course, I'd become a scientist like he was. Duly noted, answered Hugo. What about you, Gwenny? Oh, Hugo, I don't know, really. Gwendolen's exquisitely pretty face was thoughtful now. On the one hand, I want to do something useful and important. But on the other hand... I'd like to have some adventures, and I'd want so much to have a London season and go to a different ball every night and have a beautiful wardrobe with all the latest fashions and meet my one true love. You could do all of this, Francis pointed out. It doesn't have to be just the one thing. Gwendolen brightened. That's true. And then all the light went out of her expression. But it's only make-believe, Hugo, isn't it? We're just building our castles in the air. Then Mamma said in her soft voice, There may be a way, after all. Mr. Beck has asked me to marry him, and I believe he's quite well off. At this stunning pronouncement, everyone stared dumbly at her with open mouths. Shiver me timbers, said Senor Rodrigo, and began to preen the few bedraggled feathers with which his scrawny breast was adorned. Do you? Do you want to marry him, Mamma? Hugo asked. Oh, dearest Hugo, not in the least. Mr. Beck is a very amiable gentleman, and he's been a wonderful neighbour to us for these past few years. But I often think that I buried my heart along with my darling Antony when he died. The wifely part of my heart, I mean. However, she added stoutly, I'd do anything for my family. Oh, Mamma! It would be dreadful to marry someone you didn't love, put in Gwendolen earnestly. I'd do it, but that's only because I haven't had my one true love as you have, so it wouldn't matter as much. I'd do it, said Bertram, but only if the girl I married promised not to bother me, especially when I'm doing my work. I'll be busy in other countries, fighting and all that, so I suppose it wouldn't be a problem, Percy said. I'd never have to see her, which would be good because she'd naturally be beastly. What about you, Frank? Of course I'd do it, said his philosophical twin. But that doesn't mean Mamma should. We'll get by, Mamma. Mr. Beck is awfully nice, but don't marry him unless you really and truly want to. It's better to eat tripe than to be unhappy. The other children agreed in a chorus, and Mamma's troubled expression finally lightened. Well, if you don't mind, darlings, I'd rather not, and just remain friends with Mr. Beck. Hugo felt as if his heart would burst with love and gratitude for all of them. 
he was more tempted than ever to reveal his news. Through a Herculean act of will, he refrained, although he was caught up short when Mama said, Dearest Hugo, you look exactly as you did when you'd pulled a great prank and were longing to tell everyone. He tried to make his face blend. What do you mean, Mama? You look very mischievous, my darling. Oh, Hugo, said Percy eagerly. Have you done something ripping, like the time you jumped off the roof into a water barrel? Hugo laughed. How do you know about that dark incident from my past? Hoyt told me about it ages ago, and I'd give anything to try it. Did he also tell you I twisted both my ankles so badly I had to stay in bed for a month? Percy's face fell. No. Did you miscalculate the angle of your descent, Hugo? said Bertram. You'd have to factor in the pitch of the roof, of course, along with the estimated velocity and the force of impact. People think water would make for a soft landing, but they're wrong. As I found to my dismay, said Hugo, laughing again. He leaned back on the worn, comfortable sofa and laced his fingers together behind his head. I say, do you suppose we could have some tea? And is there any marzipan left? Too excited to sleep, Catherine lay awake all night, trying to read, ignoring the tossing about and irritable muttering from Celeste in her truckle bed, and wishing she had another stash of Diablotin. When morning came at last, she was tired and rumpled, but so placid that Celeste looked at her suspiciously, and under her breath said something about informing la chère maman that Catherine had refused to get much-needed rest. Go ahead and tell her, said Catherine. I don't care. And when Celeste, as usual, very roughly dragged the hairbrush through her tangled curls, told her, for the very first time, to stop it. As if hearing something new, something different in Catherine's voice, Celeste did, looking at her, for the very first time, just a little bit uneasily. Chapter 5 Having stopped in Whitehaven for a very helpful visit with Mr. Storage, their man of business, Hugo arrived at Brook House, promptly at eleven, with a very precise sense of his needs. As he went up the steps, he smiled, thinking how Mr. Storage had, in a very short time, gone from a mood that could only be described as gloomy pessimism into a state very nearly approaching cheerfulness. The massive front door was swung open, and he was, with reverence, ushered by the butler Turpin into a colossal library where, having refused an offer of refreshments, he was left to await the family's arrival. Hugo took a turn about the room, marvelling at the sheer quantity of books lining the mahogany shelves. There were several hundred if not thousands. How Francis would love it, he thought, and paused before a shelf housing a magnificent array of tall, elegant tomes bound in soft burgundy calfskin. The complete works of William Shakespeare. He took A Midsummer Night's Dream, wasn't that the one with all those weddings in it, and opened it up, only to find that the pages were blank. Odd. He took out Much Ado About Nothing. Its pages, too, were blank. He went to another shelf and opened up Chaucer's Treatise on the Astrolabe. Also blank. Another shelf, Homer's Odyssey. Blank. Machiavelli's The Prince. Blank. Yet another shelf, Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Blank. Beowulf. Blank. Voltaire's Candide. Blank. Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther. Blank. What the devil? He was still holding open Sorrows of Young Werther when the library's door was flung wide and in hurried Mr. and Mrs. Brooke, followed at a more leisurely pace by Catherine. At the sight of her, Hugo blinked. She was wearing a blindingly white, high-necked gown ornamented from throat to feet with a double column of large topaz buttons that glinted and twinkled. 
Over this, she wore a loose gold-colored robe fringed with silky tassels, and on each of her wrists jangled several gold filigree bracelets studded with topaz gemstones. It did not seem to Hugo that yellow was a color particularly suited to Catherine's complexion, but then again, what did he know about fashion? He closed the book and restored it to its brethren on the shelf, and came forward to greet the brooks, as he did so flashing an inquiring look to Catherine, on whose face was an expression that struck him as rather impish. Very slightly did she shake her head, which at once communicated to him that she hadn't told her parents why he was here. He had to wait for half an hour until Mr. and Mrs. Brooks's flow of urbane small talk began to show signs of ebbing, and another fifteen minutes while the butler and four of his underlings solemnly paraded in and proceeded to lay out a quantity of food and drink sufficient for a small army. And then, at last, when they had gone, he made known to the Brooks his wish to marry their daughter Catherine. The aftermath was protracted and deeply embarrassing to him. As Catherine had cynically predicted, her parents, in their extravagant effusions, seemed to him very nearly on the verge of sinking to the floor and prostrating themselves before him. Catherine, he saw, sitting at her ease in a high-backed chair upholstered in emerald green velvet, and in one hand a plate heaped high with macaroons, gave the strong impression of barely restraining a wild outburst of laughter. Eventually, the discussion proceeded to terms. Having established with Mr. Storridge an appropriate sum, encompassing his brother's education and the means by which to establish them in their careers, Gwendolen's education, season and dowry, Mama's maintenance and comfort, including much-needed repairs to their house, and, finally, a modest amount which he could invest for his own sustenance, Hugo now named it, and made mention that Catherine, that is, Miss Brooke, wished to keep money matters separate. He glanced over at her and saw that she was nodding, as well as jiggling her feet in their yellow kid slippers, as if this was the only way to contain an intense impatience. Mr. Brooke agreed at once to his terms, and began talking fluently of elite fiduciary instruments, capital enhancement, private partnership versus public ventures, joint stock firms, and South Sea share flotation. So you see, Captain, he concluded, it would be much to your advantage to allow me to reinvest this sum rather than merely placing it at your disposal. Naturally, as family, I'd be delighted to forego the customary three percent emolument for such services. That's very kind of you, sir, said Hugo, but I'd prefer a check. Still, Captain, Oh, Roland, do stop, mon cher, it's all so tedious, intervened Mrs. Brooke, with a smile on her lips and venom in her eyes. Enough prosing on about les investissements. Let's talk about the wedding and about next year's season. Ma foi, but it shall be a very different experience. We must lease a different house, with un salle de bal for four hundred at least, and hire a better sort of staff, and— But my dear Hester— said Roland, in an affectionate voice, issuing from between visibly tightened lips. What could be more important? First things first, and now Catherine's financial situation must be dealt with. He turned toward her and launched into another long speech peppered with so many arcane terms, as well as self-congratulatory allusions to his financial acumen, that after a minute or so, Catherine stopped listening. A long and painful chapter in her life was closing, and she was about to wrap it up by delivering her coup de grace, the revolutionary idea she'd had yesterday. Goodness, how father could talk, 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 and how obviously was he enjoying himself. Finally, about to explode with impatience, she interrupted him. Oh, do as you like, father, just as long as the income is mine alone. How much will I receive each quarter? He disclosed a figure which, Catherine saw, had Hugo opening his eyes wide in astonishment. 
She only nodded and responded. Very well. Is it all settled then? Are the captain and I officially betrothed? Yes, said father quickly, as if forestalling any potential objections from Hugo Penhallo. Mother clasped her hands together under her chin and exclaimed, Je suis ecstatique, absolument enchantée. Aren't you, Catherine, my douce? Oh, yes, answered Catherine. I'm enchanted too. With a certain ostentatiousness, she popped another macaroon into her mouth. Let me see, Mother went on, oblivious for once. We could make arrangements for a special license and have the wedding right away, but preparing a suitable trousseau will take a great deal of time and— I suppose, Captain, Father broke in, you'll be inviting Mr. Gabriel Penhallow and Mrs. Henrietta Penhallow to the wedding, won't you? Of course, said Hugo, although— if you sent an express today, father went on, they'd get it in four or five days, and it would be at least a week before we could expect a reply, and I dare say it would take a minimum of three weeks for them to get here. Old ladies travel so deuced slowly. And then there's Christmas. So shall we set a date for the beginning of January? That's fine with me, sir. I'll write to them today. However... Merveilleux, cried Mother. Only think of it, a wedding with La Chère Mrs. Penhallow in attendance. And Mr. Gabriel Penhallow, too, will be quite the talk of the town. And then, after the wedding, the four of us will travel to London en famille in plenty of time for the little season. Here it was. Mother had unwittingly provided the perfect opening, and it took everything Catherine had to keep from grinning like a hyena. Struggling to keep her voice calm, she said, No, we won't. These three simple words produced just as satisfying an impact as she had hoped. Her parents looked as if she'd just announced with irrefutable authority, The world is ending tomorrow, the sky is falling, and pigs can fly. I beg your pardon, said father, clearly unable to believe the evidence of his own ears. Captain Penhallow and I will be going to London, but you and mother are to be elsewhere. Elsewhere? mother said sharply. What does that mean? Ordinarily, that tone in mother's voice would have made Catherine's stomach clench. But today, oh, today was different. She thought of old Mrs. Penhallow, standing in the Royal Academy of Art as if she owned it, and how she had managed with superb aplomb to look down her nose at people who were taller than she was. Catherine did her best to mimic the old lady's haughtiness and answered, It means, ma chère maman, that you're to stay out of London. It pains me to mention it, she went on mendaciously, but you and father will, I'm afraid, only hold me back. Do be logical. How often has father rebuked you for your lowly birth, and how often have you told him, mother, that he's merely the son of an obscure, pauperized baronet? So you see, it's really all for the best. She picked up the last macaroon from her plate, and as she bit into it, glanced at Hugo Penhallow, whose expression was now quite blank. He probably thought she was the worst sort of harpy. If only he knew what her life had been like. Pride made her lift her chin, look away as if she didn't care. I'll withhold my consent to the marriage, you devious little baggage, said father, his face a rather comical shade of red. You can't. I'm twenty-one. My birthday was last month, as perhaps has slipped your mind. You won't get a penny, then. And when Captain Penhallow asks to break off the engagement, I'll permit it and cut off your pin money. It was a clever gambit, Catherine had to admit, her nerves prickling in alarm. The slightest misstep could destroy everything. And if she was left without funds, how could she pay for her books, her sweets? Money was such a comfort when you had nothing else. Stay the course. Stay the course, she warned herself, feeling a little sick with sudden tension, as well as from eating all those macaroons, unable to resist the opportunity to brazenly do it right in front of Mother. I don't care, she said, making her voice cold. 
It's not as if this is a love match, and I'll wither away and die of a broken heart. Cut off my pin money. Lock me in my room. It doesn't matter to me. There was a silence, but not a peaceful meditative one. No, it was a silence filled with so much roiling hostility, so much enmity and malice and spite, that it was practically deafening. Father looked as if he could happily throttle her, and Mother was wringing her hands in, had she but known it, a very effective imitation of Lady Macbeth's anguished out-damned spot scene. Hugo Penhallow went without hurry to the window, turning his back as if to remove himself from what had become a ghastly little family confrontation. It also gave Catherine an excellent view of his broad shoulders and the narrowing line of his athlete's torso, showcased by his austere, buff-coloured tailcoat. A very masculine, very appealing line. Oh, she liked it. And oh, here it came again. Damn it! Damn it! She wanted him! For a few disorienting moments, Catherine was just about to back down, tell her parents she'd changed her mind, do anything to keep Hugo Penhallow. But instead she dragged her gaze away, looked down, and began to turn one of the bracelets on her wrist, as if it were the most fascinating activity in all the world, something she could do all day, into the night, and possibly forever. Turn, 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 round and round. It occurred to her, abruptly, to wonder if what she had said was hurtful to Hugo. Surely not. Surely he knew she was playing a desperate game, playing hard and for keeps. Roland, mon petit chou, I beg you to reconsider, said Mother, in an unusually soft, persuasive tone. Catherine's success will be our success, n'est-ce pas? We can go to Bath, or Weymouth, or Tunbridge Wells. Those little watering holes, retorted Father with contempt. C'est vrai, they're not London, but they are very lively, very sophisticated, and keep in mind that no one, absolutely no one, will be able to eclipse us. We'll be able to say, our daughter, Mrs. Penhallow, will be the cynosure of all eyes. That will be very agreeable, we. Oui? Yes, father replied slowly. Yes, it would. There is much in what you say. Stealing herself to remain calm, Catherine glanced at him where he sat very still in his seat, one hand rubbing at his chin. Then at last he turned hard eyes on her. Very well, he said in a curt voice. The marriage can proceed under the terms to which we've agreed. Later, we'll revisit the question of London for the year after next. To be sure, father, Catherine said demurely, while thinking at the exact same time. It will never happen. Never. I'll find a way to ensure that, rest assured. And then it hit her. I've won. I've won. I'm free. An extraordinary feeling came to her then. It was a kind of buoyancy, lightness, as one might feel perhaps having eaten not a handful of Diablotin, but a thousand. Oh, wait, interrupted her busy mind. That's not a good analogy. If you ate a thousand Diablotin, you'd be sick and maybe die. I think what you mean is that you're... Well, isn't this splendide? exclaimed Mother. But it was Hugo Penhallow at whom Catherine was looking, as slowly he turned around on his handsome face that same expression of courteous, inscrutable blankness. Did he loathe all of them? Who wouldn't, really? But she, she was different from her parents, wasn't she? Catherine couldn't help it. A curious, almost desperate impulse compelled her to stand up, to walk over to Hugo, to draw near him and quietly say, over the awful jangling of her bracelets, you were wondering about that book you were holding, Captain, when we came in. It's a fake. They all are in this library. I see, 
said Hugo politely, pleasantly. But it seemed to Catherine that the light inside her drained away in a single beat of her heart, and that the sweet taste of triumph had all at once turned to ashes in her mouth. Hugo's news about his sudden engagement was received by his family with reactions varying from blasé acceptance to astonishment. Catherine Brooke, said Gwendolen, eyes wide. She used to live next door, didn't she, when I was little? And now she lives out in the country, in a house so big it's like a palace. Yes, that's her, answered Hugo smilingly. Oh, Hugo, is Catherine your one true love? You've never stopped loving each other all these years, and Catherine's been waiting for you to come home so that you can claim her for your bride. Hugo was spared the necessity of thinking up a suitable reply when Cook, who had billowed into the library with a plate of her lemony Shrewsbury biscuits, remarked as if off-handedly on her way out, Butcher's wife says those brooks have more money than they know what to do with. Are we going to be rich then, Hugo? asked Bertram. Because if we are, Grandpapa and I could do a very interesting experiment on glass sintering. Not rich, Bertie, but comfortable. And yes, you and Grandpapa can sinter away, whatever that is. Oh, good, said Bertram, as if this entirely wrapped up the conversation and went back to his book. Hugo, Gwendolen said, her voice trembling with excitement. Does this mean I'm going to have a season? To be sure, but not, you know, for a few more years. I can wait. I'll wait so very, very patiently now that I know it's going to be happening. Thank you, Hugo. He smiled at her and took one of Cook's delicious-looking biscuits. It's Miss Brooke you ought to be thanking. I will, Gwendolyn promised breathlessly. Of course I will. Oh, Hugo, she must be the nicest, kindest person in all the world. Hugo hesitated, not quite sure how to reply, as he was not at all certain if, in fact, his betrothed possessed either of those qualities in abundance. Thoughtfully, he wondered what he could say, and bit into the biscuit. By God, Cook had done it again. Somehow, on the tightest of budgets, she'd managed to produce the world's best Shrewsbury biscuit. He reached for another one. Eva! You build sucking scallywag, said Senor Rodrigo, in such a darkly menacing manner that Hugo burst out laughing and offered him a piece of biscuit, which Rodrigo, in a sudden turnabout, accepted in his outstretched claw with an air of gracious condescension. And so the subject of Catherine's personal qualities was closed, although later that day, when Hugo went to the parsonage to further share the news with his grandfather and aunts, Grandpapa took Hugo into his study, shut the door, and said in his quiet way, My dear Hugo, are you quite certain about this plan of yours? I am, Grandpapa. Indeed, I see your resolution, and how can I not appreciate the sacrifice you're making for the family? But, his grandfather hesitated, but yours is an affectionate heart, Hugo, I should have liked to see you marry for love, as I was fortunate to do, and as my own dear Elizabeth did with your father. It's a kind thought, Grandpapa, and I appreciate it, but I'm not repining. I've never fallen in love, nor had any particular expectations about it. Perhaps you haven't had the opportunity, or you haven't yet met the right woman. That may be, or perhaps I'm not cut out for it, at any rate. You needn't worry, though. I'm content. I can see that also, Grandpapa answered, and turned the talk to something else, though Hugo, in his turn, could see that his grandfather was not himself at all content. 23rd of October, 1811 Dear Cuz, trust this finds you all well. Things were rather topsy-turvy when I left Sermont Hall a few weeks ago, but I hope everything's been satisfactorily resolved. I'm getting married on January 2nd here in Whitehaven to Miss Catherine Brooke, and wonder if you, Livia, and Aunt Henrietta would like to attend. Unless I miss my guess, it's to be a great elaborate affair, 
Not how I'd have preferred it, but so it goes. I know it's a goodly distance to travel, but of course, it would be splendid to have you all here. Yours ever, Hugo. In between sending announcements to all the really important periodicals, writing glutingly to everyone they knew, feverishly planning the wedding, and assembling a trousseau of a magnitude not unlike that which travelled with young Marie Antoinette to her marriage to the Dauphin of France, Catherine's parents did manage to find the time to call upon Hugo's family, dragging along a reluctant Catherine in their train. The visit was just as bad as she'd thought it would be. First, there was something deeply intimidating about the sheer physical presence of those six pen hallows, each and every one of them tall and straight, with lustrous golden hair and vivid blue eyes, altogether surrounding her with so much dazzling human pulchritude that she found herself beating a mental retreat to a fascinating extract she had once read. It was about the genetic laws of nature, and pondering the mechanisms by which such consistently fine specimens had been produced. Second, no sooner had she sat down than a pack of dogs had swarmed into the drawing room, one of which was so big that it could look her in the eye, which it did, and then tried to lick her face, and she had squeaked in a very loud and mortifying way. Those twin brothers of Hugo's, who looked exactly and unnervingly alike, had, at Hugo's command, ushered the dogs out of the room. But it was a little too late for her damaged dignity. Third, Hugo's sister Gwendolen had mortified her by drawing near and thanking her with such sweet and obvious sincerity that all she could think to do was to nod in a very lame, tongue-tied way. Fourth, Mother had said to Hugo's mamma in a kindly tone, What a pity, cher Mrs. Penhello, that your husband left you all so poorly provided. One wonders why he frittered away his time with his petit effort de la science that brought in no reward. In the hush that followed, Catherine noticed with a kind of detached amazement that one's blood could actually feel as if it was boiling within one. Maybe she really would die from shame, which, although not her first choice, would still result in a tidy escape from Brook House. But then, fifthly, she herself provided the distraction to break the ghastly lull when a hideous bedraggled parrot had somehow, unnoticed, stumped toward her, climbed onto her nankeen half-boot, demanded, "'Kiss me, you saucy wench!' and she had squawked in surprise, sounding not unlike a bird herself. Gwendolyn hurried over and coaxed the bird onto her outstretched finger. Oh, Miss Brooke, do forgive Senor Rodrigo, but he likes you, you know. He only wished to make friends. Who? said Catherine, trying to conceal her embarrassment by ostentatiously resettling her skirts. This is Senor Rodrigo, el Duque de Almodovar del Valle de Oro. Gwendolyn smiled at the ugly thing with an affection that Catherine found unfathomable. Who kept a bird as a pet? I wanted to once, came the sudden thought, and in its wake the memory of the injured seagull she'd found long ago on the shore. Mother's revulsion and father's indifference and nobody to help her at home. And then, to her infinite relief, Hugo taking the bird gently in his hands and bearing it off toward his house where, he had assured her, his mamma would know just what to do. Catherine blinked, fought her way back to the present and said, That's quite a name for a bird with hardly any feathers. Oh, but Miss Brooke, I have so much hope that he will. Every day I tell Senor Rodrigo that he's perfect just as he is, but that some day, when he's ready, He'll grow the most beautiful green feathers in the world. He couldn't possibly understand what you're saying. He might, remarked Hugo's youngest brother, Bertram. I once read an article in the Journal of Natural Philosophy which said that animals may understand quite a large number of our words. Catherine's interest was caught, but then father put in with a patronising chuckle. Out of the mouths of babes... 
just as if Bertram was a freakish exhibit in a travelling show, and Catherine could not have been more glad when Mother rose to her feet and said, "'Well, how charmant this has all been, and we've so enjoyed your delightful menagerie, animals everywhere, how quaint! But I'm afraid we must hurry on home. Catherine has a fitting scheduled this afternoon for her new court dress, as she will, naturally more, attend the Queen's drawing-room.' She was unable to go this past year due to an occasional trifling indiscretion. Catherine just barely repressed a snort. Yes, if you could call a complete absence of invitations a trifling indiscretion. Later, as she stood in Mother's enormous sitting-room encircled by the harried dressmaker and her half-dozen minions, looking, as she had no doubt, ludicrous in a set of hoops seemingly as wide as she was tall. Catherine glanced morosely at the rich lengths of pale blue velvet and stark white satin, the tassels and lace, the elaborate turban and the white ostrich feathers, all of which would make her look like an eye-popping spectacle in a travelling show. Suddenly, inspiration struck, and she said, Mother, I think this gown will need more diamond brilliance on it, don't you? As this was the first time during the lengthy fitting process that Catherine had offered a single comment that could in any way be construed as helpful, Mother looked a little startled. But then she agreed with alacrity. And inside herself, secretly, Catherine smiled. 10th of November, 1811 Dear Hugo, apologies for my delay in replying. Livia and I have only recently returned to the hall. We were both delighted to hear your news and we wish you very happy, as does Grandmama, who is, I believe, writing to you also, tendering an invitation which may be of interest to you and Miss Brooke. And speaking of invitations, although we would of course like very much to join you for your wedding, it is with regret that we must decline. Urgent matters keep us here. For one, I am deeply immersed in seeing that the workers' cottages are completed before the really bad weather sets in, and that employment is found for anyone who needs it during the winter. Two, having been gone for so long, it feels especially important that, for the sake of the local folk, the family be here for the Christmas season. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to inform you that Livia and I are to be married next week on the 15th. I am, I must confess, an impatient bridegroom, and especially having come far too close to losing Livia forever. There's an odd little story about that, by the by. I'll tell you about it when next I see you. Suffice to say, I feel like the luckiest man on earth. Wishing you every felicity, Hugo. I remain, etc. Gabriel. 10th of November, 1811. Dear Hugo, From Livia I have learned that you left Sir Monthall so abruptly because you were in pursuit of a likely heiress, and now Gabriel has informed us that you were successful. He mentioned also that prior to your departure you both reimbursed him for the cost of your commission and insisted that he stop your allowance. It must be said that I had no idea you were experiencing such severe financial difficulties, else I would have, of course, stepped in to help. It grieves me to confess that for quite some time I have been far less perceptive than I would have wished. It must also be said that it does you great credit to have sought an independent solution to your difficulties. As I have more than once declared— a Penhallo never fails to perform a necessary act, no matter how distasteful, and I am gratified to see that you are following the Penhallo way. If memory serves me correctly, I met the Brooks in London earlier in the year, although met is hardly the word to describe the encounter. The less said about the parents, the better. Their daughter, at least, didn't look stupid, although it was difficult to ascertain this given the extraordinary number of artificial cherries with which her hat was embellished. They were permitted, in someone's mind, no doubt, artistically, to drape low across her forehead, and I wonder she was able to see where she was going. 
I cannot pretend, Hugo, to rejoice in my knowledge of the young lady's relations. It pains me to think of them even uttering the word Penhallow with any kind of claim to intimacy. Nor can I approve of someone who would venture out of doors wearing a hat so abominable. However, it is worth mentioning that I entertained the gloomiest sentiments about Livia when she and Gabriel were betrothed, and I am happy to say I was proved wrong. Therefore, if you and your bride would like to stop over here at the hall as part of your honeymoon, we should be glad to have you. Affectionately yours, Aunt Henrietta. P.S. In the interest of clarity, please note that this invitation does not, under any circumstances, encompass her unfortunate parents. One does have limits. Go to Sir Mont Hall, said Catherine to Hugo, who had come to Brook House to relay Aunt Henrietta's offer. She's invited us. Yes. Why? In Catherine's voice was suspicion, but once again Hugo thought he detected within it a certain apprehension. He answered, I believe she'd like to get to know you better. Oh, surely not. Catherine said, low, almost as if to herself, then quickly added, as if to move the conversation beyond a remark she wished unsaid, It's a signal honour, I dare say. That could be. He could almost hear the wheels and gears in her brain turning, and finally she said, Very well. Tell her yes. I'll write and let her know. There's one other thing, Miss Brooke. I know it's a lot to ask, but... What is it? she said, and he saw how her shoulders had gone up, tense, defensive. He went on, I've enrolled Francis and Percy at Eton for the winter term, and it would mean a great deal to me to bring them with us. My grandfather could take them, but it would be a wearying journey for him, and I'd prefer not to pay someone, a stranger, to escort them. We could drop them off at school, as it's more or less on the way, then go on to the hall from there. He was unable to decipher the differing expressions that flitted across her face, but she merely said, If you like, make the arrangements. We're to stay in the best inns, of course. We'll enjoy it vastly, the boys and I. Thank you. Catherine only shrugged, and he watched as a crimson tide of colour washed across her face. She looked down, fiddled with one of her rings, and added, Oh, and Captain? Yes? I want separate bedchambers, if you please. This, he mused, recalling their conversation in the ruins of Babylon, was not unexpected, and not particularly promising either. But he thought of his family, and out loud he said in a pleasant voice, Certainly, Miss Brooke. There was a tap on the door of the little saloon in which they'd been permitted a few minutes of privacy, and the butler Turpin came in to let Catherine know that the Bow Street runners had arrived and hoped she would be willing to oblige them with a few minutes of her time. The runners, said Hugo. What the hell? I beg your pardon. What are the runners doing here? Last week, my maid Celeste ran away with father's valet, Catherine replied, and she took one of my diamond aigrettes, several bracelets and an emerald brooch. I suppose she realised I'd rather die a thousand deaths than bring her with me after the wedding and decided to leave before Mother either demoted her or let her go. Or maybe she was really in love with that shifty-eyed popinjay valet of my father's, though it's hard to imagine. My God, you should have seen Father when we realised they'd gone, and that Robert took several of his best rings also. I thought for sure he'd have an apoplexy on the spot. Hugo took this in, then asked, curious, Why would you rather die a thousand deaths than bring Celeste with you? We didn't get along, that's all, Catherine said, vivid colour mounting again to her cheeks. At any rate, father is still furious, which is why the Bow Street runners are here. I doubt they'll find Celeste and Robert, she added, rising from her chair, as Celeste is a very resourceful person but if you find such activity amusing, Captain, Father's been taking bets with a great many of our house guests as to the runner's success. I'm sure you'd be welcome to join in. 
Hugo stood up also. Not a gambler myself, but thank you. She gave him a small, cynical smile. Aren't you? And yet here we are, betrothed. He laughed and left her and went home, where he wrote a note to Aunt Henrietta. Then he spent several happy hours during which he fixed the hinge to the library door, put in new windows on the uppermost story where Bertram liked to conduct his experiments, chopped up a huge pile of wood for Cook's stove into neat rectangular lengths, and repaired a broken drawer in Gwendolen's armoire, which, she said, had been troubling her for a very long time. As he worked, he thought about Aunt Henrietta's letter. Although he'd been acquainted with her for many years, he couldn't have said that he knew her very well, and this was the first time she'd ever written directly to him. It was surprising to see those patches of warmth and affection in her note. Gabriel's letter had surprised him a little, too. There'd always been something rather aloof about his older cousin. But in his letter there was a new warmth also, and a kind of openness. It was a nice change, Hugo thought, and slid the drawer smoothly home. 21st of November, 1811 Dear Aunt Henrietta, Miss Brooke and I are delighted to accept your kind invitation. Very many thanks. I expect we'll be arriving around January 16th. I'll write when we're en route to the hall to confirm that date more precisely. If it's convenient for you, shall we plan to stay a week or so? We'll proceed to London thereafter. With affection and gratitude, Hugo. 4th of December, 1811 Dear Hugo, thank you for your letter. We look forward to seeing you next month. You mentioned going on to London in late January, which leads me to believe you intend to partake of the so-called little season. To this plan I strenuously object. Penhallows simply don't go to town until March at the earliest. If you and Miss Brooke would care to linger at the hall for a few more weeks, it may be that I would be willing to offer you the use of the family townhouse in Berkeley Square during the season. It would add a decided luster to what I assume is Miss Brooke's ambition to assert her newly enhanced position in society. As a side note, Miss Brooke may benefit from the very circumstance of additional time at the hall. I do not say that osmosis in the metaphysical sense is a real thing. However, it couldn't hurt. Affectionately yours, Aunt Henrietta. She's dangling the notion of the family townhouse like a carrot, observed Catherine to Hugo, who'd again come to call. As if I'm some kind of horse. Is it really so bad to go to London so early? He laughed. You're asking the wrong person. Don't you care? Not a bit, I'm afraid. Catherine thought about it. The old lady could not have made a more tempting offer. There wasn't a more prestigious dwelling in all of London, excepting the residences of actual royalty. But weeks at the hall, among all those Penhallows. She already knew what old Mrs. Penhallow was like. Hugo's cousin Gabriel was no doubt just as arrogant, and his new wife Livia was probably the same one of those haughty, proud, supercilious society ladies. How could she stand those long, long weeks? An image of the magnificent Penhallow townhouse floated through Catherine's mind. While in London, several times had her parents directed the coachman to drive past it, and on their faces had been such naked, greedy longing that Catherine had averted her eyes, praying with all her heart that on her face was nothing but bland indifference. And so here was a chance, exclusively for her, to not only go inside the townhouse, but to live in it for a while. Was she as bad as her parents? For a brief moment, Catherine pictured herself as a Shetland pony, eagerly craning its neck toward a carrot. She said to Hugo once again, Tell her yes. Chapter 6 Time passed, 
The marriage contracts were signed, and the wedding took place on a cold, frosty morning in January. The bride, her face as white as snow, wore a gown of amber silk bobinette, so heavily embroidered with metallic gold thread that she literally sparkled, as well as a long, double-stranded necklace of pearls, rumoured to have once belonged to Mary, Queen of Scots, and a trailing manteau of rich, shimmering cloth of gold that extended behind her for some six or seven feet. The groom was dressed simply in dark grey trousers, a black jacket, and a slate-grey waistcoat, looking so handsome and serene that quite a few of the guests gathered in Whitehaven's largest church wept to see it. After the ceremony, as the lavish wedding breakfast at Brook House was drawing to a close, Roland Brook took Hugo aside and, with an elaborate flourish, presented him with a check. Here you are, my dear fellow. Thank you, sir. You're certain you wouldn't like me to manage it for you? I am, but thank you. Mr. Brook sighed, a gusty exhalation suggestive of regret and, perhaps, disapproval. Then he looked up at the gold-panelled ceiling over at a potted palm, next at a large glossy portrait of the king, and finally at Hugo. One other item before you go, Captain. Sir, said Hugo politely. My daughter. Yes? Mr. Brook cleared his throat. My wife has, naturally, enlightened Catherine as to her, uh, conjugal obligations. If there was a less appealing phrase for sex, Hugo thought, he'd yet to hear it. Poor Catherine. Also, he wondered what Mr. Brook expected him to say. Somehow, thank you, sir, seemed decidedly wrong. Luckily or not, Mr. Brook continued in the same confidential tone. Thought you ought to know, Captain, that apparently Catherine was, uh, less than grateful to receive my wife's advice. A difficult conversation, according to Hester. That's Catherine, I'm afraid. May as well tell you, now that the knot's all tied safe and secure, she's a thoroughly troublesome sort of girl. Well, that's the way it goes in business, eh? Full disclosure, once the deal struck. He chuckled. The money we've spent on her over the years. Dare say it'd shock you to hear the sum. I was beginning to think it an investment that wasn't going to pay off. And then you came along. Well, well, well. In any event, you're a great strong fellow. I'm sure you'll know what to do if she doesn't obey. Hugo felt his face hardening. That's not my way, sir. Trust it's never been your way with Catherine or Mrs. Brooks, either. Something in his voice seemed to register with Mr. Brook, who took a step back as if involuntarily. Of course not, Captain, I assure you. Words have always sufficed. He ran a manicured hand over his smoothly shaven jaw. Powerful thing, words. The carriages one for Catherine, the other three for her trousseau, stood ready in front of Brook House. The horses for Hugo and his brothers were waiting. All the guests were dutifully assembled, despite the chill, and everyone wondered where the bride and her parents were. Now wearing her going-away gown and a pale blue pelisse, embellished everywhere with black braid as well as with shiny jet buttons the size of small pancakes, Catherine was, in fact, placing in her father's hands her enormous jewellery case. Here, she said. What's this for? he asked, startled. I'm not bringing it with me. Don't be stupid, mother said sharply. You'll need your jewels. Catherine said nothing and began to pull on her gloves. You have only that dreadfully plain band Captain Penhallow gave you, mother went on with a sniff, belonging to his grandmother, ma foi. Would have thought he'd go out and buy you a new one, father rumbled in disapproval. Bigger, shinier. Your appearance is so bare, added mother, her frown deepening. Si demodé, Roland, take out those diamond strands. I'm not your servant, father said, and thrust the case rather forcefully at her. You do it. Catherine said, interrupting the quarrel which was just about to begin in earnest, I'll choose my own jewels when I get to London, then added airily, Well, goodbye.
and without a backward glance, she made her way toward the front door to freedom. Their cavalcade stopped for the night in the town of Keswick, pulling up into the capacious innyard of the large and luxurious White Lion. The roads had been rough, and even in the beautifully sprung carriage, Catherine had been jolted about. She winced as Hugo handed her out, for those flickers of pain in her back were more severe than usual. Are you all right? Yes, she answered, flustered, taking a few stiff, awkward steps, then heard one of the twins laughing. For a brief, terrible moment she thought he was mocking her, but realised he was instead grinning at his brother, who was walking with long, wide, comically exaggerated strides, as if rendered bow-legged after his long hours in the saddle. What's so funny, Frank? he said, with an air of oblivious innocence, then straightened up when Francis, she supposed, leaped upon him with a boisterous clinch hold. Aren't you going to stop them? she asked Hugo, watching mystified as the twins mock wrestled with loud shouts of laughter. God, no. Doesn't it bother you? He laughed. You're looking at them as if they're a pair of tigers escaped from a zoo. It's just the excitement of the trip, you know. If you say so. Better they get it out of their systems now instead of at dinner. As long as they don't actually roll in the mud and dung, I'll be pleased. How strange boys are, she said, and he only smiled. It wasn't long before Catherine was in her room, a handsomely appointed chamber which she surveyed with deep satisfaction. If there was a truckle bed, she didn't want to know about it. Ha! Didn't need to know about it. Mother had had one of the other maidservants sleep in Catherine's room after Celeste had run away, and tried to force Catherine to bring on her honeymoon someone from Brooke House, but she had adamantly refused. Not perhaps a practical response, but who cared? As if on cue, there was just then a tap on her door, and Catherine admitted one of the inn's own servant girls to help her dress for dinner. She was eager to please, but not adept, and so when Catherine sat down at the table in their private parlour, she wasn't surprised when one of the twins blurted out, I say, your hair's all sideways. Percy, said Hugo. He's right, Catherine said. I look like the leaning tower of Pisa. Perhaps, she thought, a slight improvement over resembling a Shetland pony, and wasn't it a nice change to select for herself what she was going to wear? Catherine spread her napkin across her lap and looked across the table where Hugo sat, her eyes travelling from his strong, capable-looking hands up the lengths of his arms, to the sturdy column of his neck and to his handsome face. He looked so cheerful, so calm. Not, she had to admit, as you would picture a groom on his wedding night. Not like someone who could barely wait for the evening to pass so that he could seize his willing bride and have her up against the wall of their room, so great was his violent passion. Or maybe he'd lift her up in his strong arms and so sweep her off to the bed. Would he fling her onto the bed covers or lay her down gently as a feather? Which would be better? And by her, who did she mean exactly? Was she imagining herself or some other made-up person? Catherine, Hugo said. She jumped. What? Would you care for a little of this chicken? Chicken? He smiled. Yes, this roasted chicken. It's very good, put in one of the twins. I've already had two servings. So have I, said the other one. They had chicken at your house earlier on, Catherine, even though it was supposed to be a breakfast. I've never seen so much food in my life. It was ripping. Frank, how many servings did you have of the chicken? Only two, but I had five slices of the ham and seven or eight potatoes. Is that all? I had that and some of the pheasant. There was pheasant? Damn, I mean, blast it. I missed that. Did you try the gooseberry pudding? Yes, and the ices too. Also, some of the cakes. Looking very pleased with himself, Percy, she supposed it was him, took an enormous piece of the broiled salmon and resumed eating. Catherine, said Hugo with unabated patience, may I give you some of this chicken? 
Yes, thank you, she answered. And so the meal proceeded, concluding when a chocolate roll was brought in. Hugo and his brothers each took a large slice, and oh, she would have liked to have one too, but the very fact that she wanted it so much brought on an all-too-familiar wave of shame. So she refused it, then eyed the others resentfully, and finally said, trying to keep her tone neutral, Aren't you worried you're going to burst from eating all that food? No, answered Percy, if it was him, and had another slice. Cook says we have hollow legs, Francis, she guessed, said, doing the same. Which always makes Bertram tell her about human anatomy, muscles and bones and blood vessels and so on. The dear old chap. And his twin added, It'll be splendid to bring him with us next year. He'll love it. It's all thanks to you, Catherine. We're awfully grateful. He smiled at her, and she flushed all over again, embarrassed, and changed the subject. How on earth do people tell you apart? You look completely alike. Oh, it's easy. Percy is the ugly one, and Francis is the stupid one. Laughing, the twins began trying to hook their feet around the other's legs, and in a minute or two the table began to shimmy. That's enough, said Hugo affably, and they stopped it at once. When they all went upstairs, Catherine was further embarrassed to see that Hugo's room was right next to hers. Of course, you fool, she chided herself. Why wouldn't it be? Why, oh why, hadn't she realised ahead of time how difficult this was going to be? She'd been so busy daydreaming about freedom, picturing herself in the season to come, making over in her mind all the unpleasant and painful events that had happened last year, that she hadn't focused on more imminent concerns. I get to be in Hugo's bed, exclaimed one of the twins. You get the truckle bed, and dove into the room, and the other one said, very well, blast you, but we switch tomorrow, and went inside in a more leisurely fashion. Hugo came to where she stood at her own doorway, and she noticed that she was feeling more than a little breathless, and that her heart was beating hard within her, so hard that it seemed to make her back sting and throb, and that she was suddenly very warm all over, and... Well, Catherine? Well, what? She folded her arms over her chest to make herself seem confident, also to try and subdue that willful thumping heart of hers. He said, What would you like for me to do? Oh, God, she didn't know. She didn't know. What did he think about all this? Had she wounded him by demanding separate bedchambers? How might she have felt if he'd done that? Rejected? Dejected? What did she want him to do? She had no idea. Wildly bargaining for time, she said, For one thing, not stand here in the hallway where anyone could see us. Come inside. She whisked herself into her bedchamber, and quickly, stiffly, she sat down in a chair set near the fireplace. Hugo came near, but remained standing, on his face a quizzical expression. Are you going to sit down? she said making herself sound brusque, desperate to disguise the fact that she felt all soft and warm, vulnerable, confused, and deeply, deeply afraid. That depends on you, Catherine. Go ahead, then, she said with deliberate rudeness. Sit down. Without hurry, he complied, sitting on the chair opposite hers, and crossed one long booted leg over the other. He was looking steadily at her, Calm, friendly, patient. She had a sudden image of herself with her gown on fire, her hands flapping at the flames in an urgent attempt to put them out, only the flames felt very good, which meant they were actually very bad and wrong. Almost at random, she said, I never dreamed you'd share a room with your brothers. It seemed a logical choice under the circumstances. Yes, but it's all so so awkward. In her voice was just the right touch of hauteur. She congratulated herself, and she pictured in her mind the flames all beaten away, her gown all black and charred, but no longer was she flaming hot. Good, good. Catherine, he said patiently, 
Tell me what you'd like me to do, and I'll do it. A flame leaped up. She blurted out. What if I were to ask you to stay with me? I would. Do you want to? Hugo was silent, and Catherine watched with bemused fascination as a slow smile curved his mouth. It was an alluring smile, a warm and horribly seductive smile. Finally, he said, Yes. The charred gown of her imagination burst into flames again, but frantically, fearfully, she beat them down, because she was in control, because he had agreed to her terms. She said firmly, Well, I don't want to. Hugo said nothing. She saw his smile fade, but still he looked at her, calm and steady. Hugo found himself thinking of the time he'd been marching with his men out of the Pocatière settlement, with orders to rejoin their regiment at Fort George. They'd gone about five miles or so when scouts had returned with the unsettling news that to the east of them was a detachment of French foot soldiers. To the west was Mohawk territory, and apparently the site of a recent and rather nasty massacre and directly ahead was a large encampment of excitable and hostile Americans. He'd turned them around and had them retreat to La Pocatière, where its disgruntled townsfolk he knew would not be pleased to see them, and might even try to keep them from re-entering. But that's the way things went sometimes. Sometimes the situation was just plain bad. And so here he was with his new bride, who gave every appearance of disliking him. Holy hell! He would have liked to stay and consummate the marriage, although not, of course, with someone who was glaring at him the whole time. And yet, and yet he had the oddest feeling somehow that once again there was more going on here than what she was saying, more beneath that hard, brittle demeanour of hers. Why was it, he wondered, that women were so hard to understand? Why were they so confoundedly complicated? Men, on the whole, were simple creatures. She'd asked him if he wanted her, and he said yes, and then been promptly rejected. Still, he wasn't sorry about being honest. Not only did he hate lying, he was bad at it, and it was obvious when, on the rare occasion, he did prevaricate. Hugo repressed a sigh. Just as returning to Le Pocatier had been the lesser of the various evils, so too did discretion now seem to be the better part of valour. He had the distinct impression that no matter what he said, he would somehow make things worse. Perhaps if he had been one of those eloquent, articulate sort of fellows who went about mesmerising women with a rakish, smouldering gaze and quoting epic poetry left and right, well... There was no use even contemplating it, because he wasn't. Regretfully, then, he relinquished his earlier anticipation of a night spent in connubial joy, which was just as well because Catherine said, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. Good night. She was pretending she was an empress, the indomitable Hatshepsut, for example, or the iron willed Wu Zetian, dismissing a lowly subject a disloyal, maddening, horribly forthright subject. With every evidence of an unruffled temper, Hugo stood, said, Good night, Catherine, and left the room. The moment he shut the door behind him, she brought knuckled fists to her eyes, because she wasn't going to cry, because everything was fine, because she'd gotten everything she wanted. Because Hugo had kept his word, and hadn't leapt upon her in a wild frenzy of unbridled lust, and instead had behaved in a perfectly gentlemanlike manner. Damn him! Twenty minutes later, having sent downstairs to the kitchen for a large slice of chocolate roll, and disrobed in a maelstrom of haste, Catherine was back in her chair near the crackling fire, clad in her ugliest cambric nightgown, and with her plate in hand, her copy of La Divina Commedia, it having arrived, luckily, the day before Celeste had decamped for parts unknown, waiting on the little table set between the two chairs. 
She cast a scorching glance at the empty chair, which had recently housed Hugo's large, delectable frame. Was there, she mused, staring at the Commedia, Dante's equally scorching divine comedy, a suitable punishment for husbands who had the gall to abandon their wives on their wedding night. That is, who had the gall to graciously accede to what was essentially an order to leave. Viciously, she took a bite of chocolate roll. And then another. And another. And when it was all gone, she put the plate onto the little table and reached for her book. She could at least find some comfort there. But instead, she got up and, moving with a surreptitiousness that was silly, given that she was alone in her sumptuous bedchamber, went to the wall which separated her from Hugo's room. She pressed herself against it, feeling all at once so lonely that she wished her atoms could disengage, penetrate the elegant flowery wallpaper and plaster and wood, and emerge on the other side, where she'd be reconstituted to her original form, and possibly even as a better version of herself. Suddenly, she heard a faint thumping sound issuing from the room next door. Somebody, it sounded like one of the twins, yelped. There was another thump, and then a crash, as if furniture had been knocked over, and one of the twins gave a high-pitched yip. Catherine caught her breath in horror. Good God, was Hugo... Was Hugo beating them? Had he left the room so secretly infuriated by her rejection that he'd gone and taken it out on his brothers? Was it her fault? There was another thump, and Hugo's voice saying, You're in for it now, lad, and Catherine waited no longer. She ran from her room and into the corridor, heedless of anybody who might see her only in her nightgown, and banged on Hugo's door. She could hear one of the twins saying, Uh-oh, and then the door was opened, and there was Hugo, in breeches and unlaced shirt, his feet bare and his hair rumpled, a pillow tucked under his arm. He looked down at her, surprise and concern in his expression. Everything all right? Let me in. She shoved her way past him, even though he practically filled up the doorway, and into the room which looked like a storm had just roared through it. In the dim light of a single branch of candelabra, set high atop an armoire, she could see that the bedclothes were in a wild tangle of comforters and sheets, pillows were scattered, a truckle bed was pushed higgledy-piggledy into a corner, an end table lay on its side. And there were the twins, one standing on a sofa and the other half concealed behind a column of draperies, each holding a big, plump pillow and looking rather guilty. The three of them had been having a pillow fight and obviously a rollicking one. Oh, hello, Catherine, said the twin on the sofa. Sorry for all the noise, we were laughing like maniacs. And then the other one said, in tones of deep respect, I say, Catherine, your hair, you look just like a Valkyrie. All you need is a flaming sword. Or one of the Furies, said the first twin, getting into the spirit of things, descending upon unwary mortals. It's simply ripping. Why do you keep it all scraped back during the day? asked the other. You look better with it loose. Percy, said Hugo from behind her, and Frank, that's enough. Oh, her wretched hair. Catherine clutched at it. When she'd been getting ready for bed, she hadn't even bothered trying to braid it, and here she was with her untamed riot of curls, in all probability looking as if she'd been in a pillow fight. Which she never had, of course. What, she now wondered, would that be like? She pictured herself swinging a pillow hard with all her might and landing it with a gratifying thwack. Did we say something wrong? said Percy, she supposed. I was complimenting Catherine, and his twin put in. It's just we were surprised, Hugo. She looked so different. And then Hugo said from right behind her now, in his deep voice and urgency that startled her. Catherine. Your back is bleeding. There's blood on your nightgown. Had she been embarrassed before? It was as nothing to the raging torrent of mortification which subsumed her now. It's nothing, she said quickly. I'm fine. 
Well, good night. She turned, saw that Hugo had gone to one of the trunks. What was he doing? Avoiding looking at her? And made her way to the door in a kind of blind confusion. Then she realized that Hugo had caught up to her and was carrying a small wood box. I'll be right next door, he said to the twins. I say, is Catherine all right? One of them, Francis, said. Can we help? Should we send for a doctor? Maybe there's one in the common room. I'll go. We'll both go. Blast it. Where are my shoes? Oh, I kicked them under the bed. Rot you. I'll just put on Hugo's boots. By Jove, I'll look awfully grown up. Thank you, said Hugo. But for now, I want you to stay put. As soon as they were alone in her room, gently he steered her to the bed and had her sit. Will you let me see? he asked. His touch on her arms had been light, impersonal, which should have pleased her, but it didn't. So Catherine said, If I say no? I won't press you, but I'd most certainly send for a doctor. And have him gawk at me. She felt a little horrified shudder ripple through her. No, thank you. Go on, then, if you must. Hugo drew aside the tangled spirals of Catherine's dark, curling hair. He would have liked to let his fingers play upon the long silken strands, but he set aside this tempting distraction. Whatever had happened to her back had created an ugly lattice of dark red on the white fabric of her nightgown. My God, Catherine! I'm all right, she said grudgingly. It was only the carriage jostling me about. How could the carriage do that to you? With even greater reluctance, she replied, It's because of my, well, because of my corset. And how could a corset make you bleed? It has steel bands to keep my spine straight. Are you wearing it now? No. You seem to be doing just fine without it. What do you mean? You're sitting straight. What? I said, you're sitting straight. I'm straight. Now she sounded dazed. Yes. Why do you wear it? Oh, don't you remember? When I was small and how my spine was crooked? No. Well, it was, and so my mother had a special corset made for me. And you've been wearing it ever since? Yes. Twelve years, eight months, and seventeen days, in various incarnations, of course, as I got bigger. Christ, he said. Then, it must hurt you like the devil. How did... how do you stand it? I suppose I got used to it. Besides, my mother said I'd grow up into an awful hunchback if I didn't. With an unusual burst of anger, Hugo said, I'd like to see her wear the damned thing. You would? Well, not actually see her, but you know what I mean. I do know, Catherine breathed, as if she liked the image he'd conjured. Will you let me put something on those wounds? I'll be all right. I wish you'd let me. You risk infection otherwise. Oh, of course, you're right. But how will you do it? That fearful note had crept into her voice again. I'll cut open your gown. In the back. Oh. Are you worried I'll harm you? You needn't. Been doing this sort of thing for years. The rough soldier's life. Just so. Have you dealt with some really bad injuries? Yes. I'm not a doctor, of course. Sometimes you only do what you can. So may I? I... yes. From his kit, he took a small pair of shears. If you could... Bend your head so I can get at that ruffled collar thing round your neck? Thanks. There, it's done. I'm going to dab at those wounds with a cloth. Sorry, Kate, I know it hurts. Catherine. Catherine. He was silent for a while, methodically working his way down her lacerated back. The deep welts, the raw red marks on her otherwise smooth white skin made him furious. Holy hell, he'd like to do more than put her mother in the corset and cinch it extremely tight. As for that smug, overfed father of hers. Deliberately, 
Hugo took a breath and let it out, let the rage drain from him. In a voice that was a little rough, he said, You may have some scarring. A memento. She sounded steady, calm. A bit more lightly, he went on. Well, we'll be able to compare scars then. Do you have a lot? Quite a few. From being a soldier? Some, he laughed. Also some mementos from my misspent youth. Misspent how? Have you forgotten? Ever one for a lark, that was me. I'm still surprised they didn't kick me out of Eton. I can only hope Francis and Percy aren't regaled with too many hair-raising stories of my exploits there. Like what? Like the time I snuck a cow into my dormitory. A cow? Yes. Really? Yes. Why did you do that? It seemed like a good idea at the time, I suppose. I had no idea it would start mooing at two o'clock in the morning or leave behind its own mementos. The entire dormitory smelt like a cow pasture. He laughed again. Did you like school? Oh, I loved it, though I can't say I was the best student. Too restless to sit around with my nose in a book. I drove more than one master insane, I dare say. I'm nearly done here. You're being very brave. I'm just going to dab at this strand of hair. There's blood on it. If you don't mind my asking, why... He broke off, but she said, Why what? Hastily, Hugo said, Never mind, a foolish question. Go ahead. I was just wondering why your fringe is so... He trailed off, feeling very much like the proverbial bull lumpering around a china shop. Stiff? Well, yes. Because it's straightened. How the hell? That is, how is that done? he said. With hot irons. You're joking. No. Steel corsets and hot irons. All very medieval. And you think boys are strange. Why do females do such things to themselves? Could you lean forward? Excellent. Here's some basilicum powder. You do have another nightgown, don't you? Yes. It's going to be mucked up also. These abrasions are raw. They're going to take some time to heal. I've got more than one. He heard, for the first time this evening, the faintest note of amusement in Catherine's voice. Of course you do. Would you like to put off our journey? Why? To give your back a chance to heal. Her little smile fading, Catherine sat very still, with her hands at her chest to hold up the fabric of her nightgown. What a thoughtful question. She breathed in deeply and felt her ribcage expanding. For a moment, just a moment, it felt as if her soul was expanding too, as if Hugo's gentle hands at her back, his kindness, had, in some strange and mysterious way, made it happen. When, she wondered, had she last had a kind word, a soft touch from anybody? How sad that she couldn't even remember. Catherine? Yes? Would you like to put off tomorrow's journey? She pulled herself back into the present and shook her head. No, I don't. If you're sure? Yes. She half turned and saw that Hugo had gathered up his things, including the bloodied cloths which he held without the slightest appearance of revulsion. Is there anything else I can do for you? I... No. That's all, then, he said. I'll be next door if you need anything. Good night. And he turned, and he left her room, and she was, once more, alone. Good, she told herself, just the way she liked it, in her very own version of heaven, solitary, peaceful. So why did she feel so lonely and sad? Was it because he had left her, again, with such calm courtesy, too. Again, what was the matter with him? This had to be the strangest wedding night ever, and yet he seemed to be taking it all in stride. Ha! Huh. He was probably glad he didn't have to do the deed with her, didn't have to fulfil. 
What was that revolting term Mother had used before she had begun to pretend that Mother was a bug, a tiny little nasty talking bug with a voice so small it was impossible to hear? Oh yes, their conjugal obligation. The very phrase made her feel rather ill. So off Hugo had gone all too cheerfully, leaving her behind, with her stupid bloody back and her stupid bloody hair and her stupid bloody personality. Maybe her wounds would get infected, and the sepsis would spread with inexorable speed, and soon, very soon, there she'd be on her deathbed, with her hair somehow transformed into a pleasing golden shade, all straight and smooth, perhaps woven into neat plaits, with a celestial blue ribbon on each end. No, a white ribbon would be better. It would be more symbolic of saintly goodness, and she'd look so lovely and peaceful that everyone who'd ever hurt her would be sorry, so sorry. Dwelling on this improbable image, she hardly knew whether she wanted to laugh or to cry. So instead, she stood up and went to the armoire. She stripped off the damaged nightgown, tossed it aside and put on a clean one. Her glance then fell upon the discarded corset. She was tempted to put it into the fire, but the smell would be terrible. Instead, she snatched it up, grimacing at the pain in her back, and rushed to one of her windows. Why not throw it out into the courtyard and let the horses trample on it? She was just about to open the window and do just that, but then came a cold and unpleasant twist of fear. What if she were to need the nasty thing again? Out loud, Catherine muttered to it a line from Richard III. Bloody thou art, bloody will be thy end. She contented herself with dropping the corset on the floor and giving it a vigorous kick. Then she blew out the candles, gingerly got into bed and lay on her side, listening to the deep silence all around her. Good night, Mrs. Penhallow, she said into the silence into the darkness. But of course, there was no one there to answer her. Chapter 7 They departed in good time the next morning, Hugo having somehow acquired several large soft cushions to help Catherine ride more comfortably in her carriage. Their journey was uneventful for the next two days, aside from Percy once trying to ride standing up on his horse and falling, inevitably, into the mud, and on Saturday they arrived in the bustling market town of Kendal, where Catherine, having made inquiries of their innkeeper as to the poorest church in the vicinity, told Hugo that she wished to attend services there on Sunday. Fine, he said, looking at her curiously, but made no further response. And so there they were the next morning, sitting in a small, draughty chapel permeated with such a dank, musty odour that one of the twins, Francis, was moved to whisper approvingly and all too audibly, It smells like a dungeon in here. The clergyman continued, as if unaware of this irreligious remark, with his sermon a short, uncomplicated oration on the new year, new life, new hope a topic that might, to some, be at odds with his dismal surroundings, as well as the general tone of his rather shabby-looking parishioners. Mr. Stafford was a careworn elderly man, who nonetheless received Catherine warmly when she approached him after the service, and asked if she might speak with him. "'How can I help you, my dear?' he asked, with such a look of piercing compassion on his face that she was momentarily startled but then she thought back to that moment in Mother's sitting room when she'd been encased in those hideous court dress hoops and answered, I have some things to give you, Mr. Stafford. You can sell them or do whatever you like with them. What things, my dear? Another memory rose up, or rather, a whole array of them. Sunday after Sunday, year after year, watching her father place in the church collection plate a few copper pennies, counting them out one by one, plainly loath to part with them. She herself, little Kate, trying to add more to it from her own pin money, and being told again and again to stop wasting it. After a while she had simply given up. 
It was strange, though, how she'd forgotten all about it until recently. She said to Mr. Stafford, Clothing, sir, and hats, shoes, fans, shawls, and so on. Twenty or thirty trunks worth. Your trousseau, Catherine, Hugo said. What the devil? Oh, begging your pardon, he added to Mr. Stafford, who, most luckily, seemed disinclined to take offence. She lifted her chin. Yes, my trousseau. I'm giving it away. Every gaudy dress, every garish bonnet, every tawdry shawl, every flamboyant, florid, ostentatious pair of shoes, everything. I say, Catherine, said one of the twins admiringly, you do use the best adjectives. And the other one added, surely not everything, Catherine, because then you wouldn't have anything left to wear. The first twin said, enraptured, you could be like Lady Godiva. Not riding in a carriage, you ass pointed out the other. She could borrow my horse if she liked. Boys, said Hugo, and they subsided. And Catherine said, they're right. I didn't mean literally everything, but almost everything. She looked to Mr. Stafford again. Will you accept it, sir, so that it might be used to do a little good in the world? You're sure, my dear. I've never been more sure of anything in my life. Very well, then, he said finally and thank you. Whatever you have to give will be a great benefit to our little parish. There's such need here. But is there anything I can do for you? She knew a sudden crazy impulse to say, very sincerely, bless me, please bless me, for I'm a wandering lamb, but instead only said softly, nothing. And so it was done. Mr. Stafford's struggling parish was soon to be enriched beyond the wildest dreams of many, with food, clothing, bedding, fuel, even a few precious books. For quite some time afterwards would his parishioners tell wondering tales of a mysterious, dark-haired Lady Bountiful who had come and gone in a day, leaving behind all her earthly belongings. Many would speculate, in fact, if she were actually an angel who had briefly descended to earth before returning to her celestial abode. The days wound themselves along as their travels continued taking them southeast, and Hugo found himself looking thoughtfully at Catherine, curiously. She was still aloof, brusque, yet he had also noticed that she was unfailingly courteous to servants, generous in unobtrusively offering gratuities. She never passed a beggar in the street, but that she reached into her reticule to press something into an outstretched hand. In Kendall's meanest parish, she had given away a trousseau worth hundreds, perhaps thousands of pounds. Gwendolen had exclaimed, upon hearing the news of his engagement to Catherine, Oh, Hugo, she must be the nicest, kindest person in all the world. He hadn't been sure of that, but he caught glimpses. Still, in her intense self-containment, she reminded him a little of, in his mind he searched for the image rising up to him. Yes, rather like a warrior clad in protective armour. But even the hardest soldier inside was just as vulnerable as any other person. He wondered what she was like inside. In due course, the Penhallow party arrived in Eton. Francis and Percy were settled in at school, and now it was just herself and Hugo travelling on to Somerset. Unfailingly was Hugo polite, affable, pleasant, as each and every evening they went to their own separate rooms, and increasingly did Catherine feel that she was re-enacting that old story of Beauty and the Beast, only it had gotten all twisted up somehow. It was the Beast who would ask Beauty night after night if she would marry him, and Beauty who would say no. Only Hugo, who was certainly no Beast, asked nothing of her. But wasn't she supposed to be the heroine, Beauty? Or was it she who was behaving beastfully? Yet what was wrong with wanting to be alone? Hadn't she earned the right to peaceful solitude after all those years of relentless surveillance? These thoughts would whirl round and round her head until, inexorably, would come the dreadful sneaking suspicion. 
was Hugo glad to not be invited to her room? And on this dark dread she would ruminate and brood and gnaw upon her nails to the very quick. Really? What was the matter with him? What kind of man was he? How could anybody remain so genial when he'd been barred from his wife's bedchamber? Maybe, just like in some of those novels she'd read, Hugo, the hero, had a dark secret. Maybe, she thought, that chaste peck in the ruins of Babylon was all that he was capable of. Perhaps, an awful possibility, an injury had somehow, well, incapacitated him. He'd mentioned scars, a broken leg, falling off his horse, having dealt with very bad injuries. Gory images formed, vivid and realistic, and the question stayed in her mind, built and grew, tormenting her, until finally, on the evening before they were to arrive at Sermont Hall, Catherine felt she had to say something or burst. They were alone in their private parlour having dinner, and abruptly she said to Hugo, is there something wrong with you? He paused in the act of lifting his fork, on which was embedded a juicy piece of rare roast beef. I beg your pardon? I have some questions. I want to know if there's something wrong with you. In what way? Almost was Catherine a little sorry she'd even raised the topic. Hugo's tone was so mild. But she blundered on. Why are you so good-natured all the time? He put his fork down. This troubles you. It's not normal. I don't know about that. It's just how I am. I don't believe it. It's true. Have you forgotten? In this way all my life. Feel free to ask my mother the next time we see her. Maybe I will. Do, he said cordially. He picked up his fork again and proceeded to eat his roast beef. For a moment... Catherine envisioned herself as an alpine climber, attempting without success to gain purchase on an icy slope. Although really it wasn't a very good analogy. Hugo was tall and big and therefore could be considered mountain-like. But as for being icy, no, no, he was warmth and life, fire and light. She veered away from this unhelpful train of thought and doggedly went on. You're happy all the time. It can't be real. I'm not happy all the time. You act that way. I'm not acting at all. But you're so... so cheerful. Catherine twisted the linen napkin in her lap as if it had suddenly come alive and she had to dispatch it. I suppose, she added in a belligerent tone, you wish I were more like you. I think you should be who you are. In her frustration and confusion, the words just came out, Oh no. You wouldn't want that, I assure you. Why not? Defiantly, she reached for her wine glass and took a long swallow. Because I'm not a good person. Really? His voice was calm. What have you done? Where to start, she thought. Where to start? And had another drink of her wine. How curious on the tongue, tart and sweet all at once. She had never been allowed to drink anything other than lemonade at dinner. Metaphorically, she thumbed her nose at those inane strictures and finished off her wine at a gulp, then looked at Hugo, waiting for him to remark upon her intemperate consumption of alcohol and try to make her stop. But he only said, More wine? She eyed him mistrustfully. Then, Yes. Already she could feel her body getting a little bit of a floating feeling, her brain getting a trifle soft around the edges. How intriguing. How pleasant. Because sometimes she got rather tired of how her mind ran and ran and ran. What have you done? Hugo had asked. Oh, but wasn't she supposed to be unmasking him, not talking about her fell deeds? She tried to hang on to this stern resolution, but found herself taking another big swallow of wine and saying, in a voice that seemed to be a little louder than was really necessary, Do you remember telling me about the cow you snuck into your dormitory at school? He smiled. Yes. I went to school too, you know. Did you? Where? 
in Coventry at the Basingstoke Select Academy for Young Ladies. By Jove, what a ghastly name. A ghastly name for a ghastly place. And you weren't the only one to have exploits. I had some shocking ones too, you know. My, she thought. It was so interesting how the candle flame seemed to be flickering in Hugo's eyes. How deep and blue and fascinating they were. She stared. It felt as if she were falling into them, gliding, floating, pleasurably yielding to the forces of gravity, drifting downward like a feather. And maybe, maybe she'd never come up again. Catherine was looking rather adorably owlish. Gazing at her across the table, Hugo thought of several things at once. One, she had, apparently, given up on trying to coax the various inn maidservants to put her hair up in anything approaching what he supposed was the fashionable style, very high and smooth. Instead, her dark curls were gathered into a loose sort of bunch at the nape of her neck, some of which trailed down alongside her bare throat, spilling onto the white skin above her gown's bodice, all in a simple, unfussy way he found very attractive. Two, he was aware of a strong pull of desire, of wanting strong and urgent, which he doubted would be fulfilled any time soon. One had to be thankful for all those years of military discipline, he supposed ruefully. Three, she had said, I want to know if there's something wrong with you, which was followed by, I have some questions. This suggested the possibility of further interrogation, which made him wonder, half amused, just what her fertile and inventive brain might produce. Four, he thought, not for the first time, just how complicated she was. He remembered suddenly a set of gold and silver nesting boxes a school friend whose father had been attached to the British Embassy in China had once shown him. You opened one box, only to find another box inside. You opened the next box, and there was another one, and so on. And here was Catherine, who evidently had had some adventures of her own. Another box revealed. He said, I'd love to hear about them. She played for a moment with a curl that lay upon her collarbone. Once, she said, leaning forward, after someone said something nasty to me, I put worms in her bed. He nodded. I had that happen to me at school also. My cousin Thane did it. Were you angry? Furious. I thrashed him right in front of a housemaster. My only consolation was that we both ended up being caned. Were you found out? Yes. I was put in what they called the reflection room. That sounds bad. It was actually a closet off the dining hall. The punishment was that I had to sit in there and reflect on my iniquitous behaviour. Did you? No. Good for you. How long did you have to stay there? They locked me in for half a day. I'd have gone mad. She nodded and took another swallow of wine. I spent a lot of time in the reflection room. Due to further exploits? Yes. Getting into arguments with the other girls, speaking rudely to the teachers and not doing my work. The only thing I liked to do were the compositions, but not the way we were told to do them. Catherine's smile was grim. Oh, and they expected us to go to bed absurdly early, like babies. They sometimes caught me reading late at night, using candles which I'd, well, which I stole from the various parlours. Gad, it does sound like a ghastly place. I'm still not sure, though, why all this makes you not a good person. Murder anybody? I'd have liked to murder the headmistress, or at least thrashed her, like you did to your cousin. That in itself makes me not a good person. She fell silent, but looked at him with an odd expression on her face. It was as if she were longing to tell him something, of an earth-shattering nature, while at the same time she was struggling not to. He waited. If she chose to tell him, he'd listen. If not, that was fine too, as he himself loathed it when people tried to force confidences. He took a sip from his wine glass. Good stuff, this. 
It was called Methune, red and white Lisbon wines mixed and very expensive. If someone had asked him ten years ago how he imagined his future, it certainly wouldn't have summoned an image of himself sitting in a luxurious inn, drinking costly wine and in the company of a clever, fierce, strong-willed, intensely complex wife who, it seemed, found him quite unappealing. How strange life was, and, for better or for worse, how infinitely interesting. He took another drink of his wine. Catherine said, there was a music instructor at school. I, I was drawn to him, and we used to find places where we could be alone, so we could, we could kiss. Did you? he said calmly. Catherine seemed taken aback, as if expecting an entirely different reaction. Yes, we did, she replied, looking more owlish than ever, and added, Ask me why I did it. Why did you do it? It seemed like a good idea at the time. And then she laughed. It was something between a giggle and a chuckle, and the pleasing sound of it was like an echo from the long ago past. It was as if he were hearing Kate, his friend Kate, laughing again. And he laughed too. She said, You don't mind my talking about it? No. His name was Monsieur de Lamotte, Germain. A blasted Frenchman. Naturally. Did he quote poetry to you? Yes. How did you guess that? Seems inevitable. Does it? At any rate, he was so handsome and charming, so debonair. At least, that's how he seemed to me. I knew it was wrong, so horribly wrong, but I did it anyway. May I have some more wine? He filled her glass again, and then his own. Something tells me this all leads to the reflection room. Oh, yes, we were discovered eventually. One of the servants saw us and told the headmistress who, well, who caught us in the act. An awful scene, I dare say. Yes. Catherine sipped at her wine once, twice, and again, then looked at him with eyebrows raised. Don't you think I was awful? He smiled. No. No? No. And I don't mean to be boastful, but I think I can top you with the time several of my friends and I decided we wanted to become, uh, more intimately acquainted with the fair sex. So money was pooled, and because I didn't have any to spare, I was delegated to slip out very late at night, go into a certain part of town, and bring back with me two of the finest impures I could find. Her eyes were sparkling. And? We'd set up an elaborate communications chain which would let us bring our guests into the dormitory without being noticed. Unfortunately, our sentry in the second-story stairwell fell asleep and snored so loudly that one of the matrons heard him and the jig was up. So when I came strolling up to the back entrance, arm in arm with a delightful pair of impures, who do you suppose was waiting for me just inside? Your headmaster. Yes. Never saw a sadder sight than those luscious women hurrying away back into the night. And what happened to you? Whippings all round, though I got the worst of it, having been deemed the most enterprising one of the lot for having gone into town. He laughed. It was worth it. I received some very satisfying and educational tokens of their esteem on the way towards school. How old were you? Just fifteen. I was fourteen when it all began with de la Motte. Well, in that case you've topped me. You are far more enterprising than I. I've topped you? She shook her head, as if trying to galvanise her brain into better processing what he'd said. Haven't I shocked you even one little bit? she demanded. No, that school of yours sounds so dreadful that had I been in your place, I'd be looking for anything to make it a bit more bearable. Catherine sat back in her chair, looking dazed. Then, abruptly, Do you remember asking why I'd never have brought my maid Celeste with me? He nodded. It was the day I came to tell you about Aunt Henrietta's invitation. 
Yes, that's right. It was after the de la Morte incident that my parents, at the headmistress's request, sent a maid to sleep in my room on a truckle bed. A spy? Yes. The story was given out that she was there to look after my health, but it was a lie. It made everything even worse, and Celeste was so mean, I despised her. Understandably. Catherine fell silent and turned again to her wine. Hugo finished his roast beef and moved on to the asparagus en croute. I remember now, she suddenly said. Remember what? I've remembered something else I wanted to ask you. Yes, he said politely. Are you functional? I beg your pardon? Her face was a vivid crimson, and her gaze wavered a little as she looked at him. I was just wondering if you lost some of your your vital parts in the war, if that's what's wrong with you. He wanted to laugh, but managed to restrain himself. Another box revealed. How long, he wondered, had she been puzzling over this anatomical question? Gravely, he replied, No, I'm intact. Just as gravely, she asked. And functional? Yes. She leaned forward again. Prove it. Don't laugh. Don't laugh, he told himself. And how would you like me to do that? Let's go upstairs. You can... you can have me. He assessed her with an experienced eye. Yes, it was a good time for them to leave. I await your convenience. I'm ready. She finished off her wine at a gulp and off they went, up the stairs and along the corridor and into her bedchamber. Hugo closed the door behind them, then turned to see that his bride had sunk into a chair. Hugo? Yes, Catherine. Oh, Hugo. Yes. Oh, Hugo. I don't feel so well, she said, and Hugo, without surprise, moved quickly to take the ceramic basin from the washstand and make himself useful as Catherine retched and then, in the charming colloquial parlance of the soldiering corps, flashed the hash, and in spectacular style too. Later, later, after he had mopped her face, given her a little water to drink, and helped her into bed, he pulled a chair up close and sat down. She was very white and wan. There was nothing left of the pugilist within her now. Even as he thought this, Catherine's eyes opened to exhausted slits. One of her hands groped its way free from underneath the covers and weakly reached out to him. He took it in his own, noticing how white it was, the close-bitten nails, how the long, tapering fingers seemed at once both delicate and strong. An interesting hand, and rather beautiful. Hugo? Her voice was a faint little thread. Yes, Catherine. I'm sorry. He smiled at her. Don't be. Happens to the best of us. To you also? My God, yes. Really? Oh, Hugo, I feel terrible. I know you do. You'll feel better tomorrow. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, thank God. Her eyelids drifted shut, and he waited, watching her. He thought she'd fallen asleep, but she opened her eyes again and looked up at him. Hugo. Yes? Thank you, she said. And then she did sleep. He waited for a while before carefully disengaging his hand from her relaxed one and stood up, blew out the candles, and went to his own room. Once in his large, elegant bed, he lay awake for a while, thinking. Boxes concealed, boxes revealed. In his mind he heard again, as if in a pleasant echo from the past, the sound of her laughter tonight. Her eyes big, dark, and lovely, had lit up when she laughed. In the darkness, Hugo smiled a little and turned onto his side, noticing, as if for the first time, just how much empty space there was. 
This bed, he thought, was far too big for just one person. Then he, too, was asleep and dreamed of the big, beloved house on the beach, the ocean's waves unfurling as they always did, one after the other, a welcome reminder that while some things changed, other things never did. Everyone inside the house was sleeping, safe, sound, content. Chapter 8 Morning had come, and Catherine was back to sitting at the table in their private parlour, her eyes closed, leaning her throbbing forehead on her hands. Inside her skull, a gang of industrious little demons was, apparently, pounding away, with mallets, gavels, spiked mauls, flanged maces, quarterstaffs and broad axes. Oh yes, and with tomahawks too. She vaguely remembered Hugo saying last night, you'll feel better tomorrow. She supposed he was correct, in that she wasn't vomiting in a horribly sordid way any more. Dear God, could there be anything more embarrassing, more unromantic than that? Right in front of him. The immaculately beautiful Elena de Rosalba, for example, would never have done something so low and vulgar. Nor would saintly Elena have had too much wine. But if she were to feel unwell, she would only look interestingly pale and perhaps press a white handkerchief to her lips and her noble swain, Vincentio di Vivaldi, would keep a respectful distance and inquire, in the most delicate and flowery language, as to the state of her health. Unlike Hugo, who had swung into action and deftly produced a basin exactly when she needed it, without a single word of reproach. Would Vincentio have been so pragmatic? Or would he have wasted valuable time calling for a maidservant or producing from somewhere on his person his own handkerchief, which, in any case, would not have been very useful? On the whole, she would rather have had Hugo nearby at such a moment. Catherine heard the sound of the door opening, and with every fibre of her being she hoped it wasn't yet another maidservant popping into the room with a further offer of food, which only made her gorge threaten to rise again. If she could just sit very still, without moving, without thinking, she'd even try not breathing if it would help. Good morning. I've brought you something. She opened her eyes. Here was Hugo, looking so cheerful and pleasant, so healthy and robust, so utterly in contrast to her own enervated state, that she stared at him as one might view a visitor from another planet. Then she saw that he was carrying a silver pot, and to her nostrils came wafting the unmistakable aroma of freshly prepared coffee, slightly sweet, faintly bitter and woodsy. She waited for the nausea to swell up, but it didn't. Normally, she didn't drink coffee, but then again, neither did she normally consume alcoholic beverages until she was violently ill, so when Hugo poured some into a china cup and held it out to her, she reached out her hands to accept it. Thank you. You're welcome. It'll help your headache quite a bit. How did you know I have a headache? Don't you? Yes, a horrid one. Catherine sipped at the fragrant coffee, and as if by magic, the pounding in her head began to recede and her stomach settled. Two, her brain began to reanimate, and all at once she remembered that not only had Hugo cleaned her up and put her to bed, just prior to that she had brazenly told him he could have her. What a ridiculous thing to say! and to have used such a melodramatic phrase. She felt a hot blush coming over her, and resisting the temptation to squirm like a snake under somebody's boot, looked across the table to see that Hugo had sat down, picked up a newspaper, which a maidservant had left on the table, and was drinking his own cup of coffee. He glanced over at her then and said, Feeling better? Yes and she added in the tone of one being dragged to a miserable doom. I can be ready to go in half an hour. Oh, you needn't hurry. 
I sent one of the carriages onto the hall early this morning with a note that we're probably going to be late. So take your time. Catherine stared at him again, flummoxed. In her mind's eye, she seemed to suddenly see a marquetry table on which ivory alphabet tiles had been laid out in preparation for a game. She could form so many different words, different sentences with the tiles. For example, she could create, Oh, thank you. How kind of you. Or, No, I'm already worried about what your relations will think of me, and arriving late on our first day there will only make it worse. Or, Let's just stay here forever. We could become innkeepers and hide from the world. Or, You should just go on without me. Maybe that would be better. Or, How dare you make a unilateral decision that affects me? It was this last sentence that struck the deepest chord within her, its note of withering resentment entirely familiar to a person raised within the turbulent confines of Brook House. How often we reflexively turn to what we know, and so Catherine said to Hugo, You ought to have asked me first. Well, I did poke my head into your room, but you were sleeping so soundly I didn't have the heart to disturb you. The tiles reformed. A few months ago, I was longing for a life in which nobody jerked me awake. Would have, in all probability, sold my soul for such a thing. Then, I'm losing control. I'm losing control, I'm afraid. Her shoulders went up. You should have woken me anyway. Hugo looked across the table at Catherine. She was flushed, visibly tense, her dark eyes glittering. A very different Catherine from the one last night, who had reached out her hand for him to clasp, who had shared with him a sweet moment of connection. But now she looked more likely to use that beautiful white hand to lash out at him with it. Was this how it was going to be between them? An unfamiliar feeling came over Hugo then blazing through him, dark and bitter, like a shadow voraciously darkening the world. It was regret. Sorrow for what he had done, a glimpse of a future he didn't want. The shadow swallowed him up, blackness bitter and corrosive, serving up as if maliciously a memory. Standing in the so-called ruins with Catherine, they had come to their agreement. She had said, I hope you won't regret it. And without hesitation, he had replied, I won't. How absolutely sure he had been. How laughably sure. And then, with an intense effort, Hugo cast off the shadow. To regret was to live life backward, and that was not his way. He gave himself a little shake, resettled himself in his chair, but not before he realised that Catherine had seen on his face what he had been feeling. Reflected back in her expression was recognition and a kind of horror. The fire was crackling cheerfully in the capacious hearth, and the low bank of windows admitted into the room the soft grey light of a winter's day. She could hear from outside in the inn-yard the muted sound of men's voices, Horses, a dog barking, carriages rattling in and jangling away. Inside, there was silence. He's sorry, Catherine thought. He's sorry he married me. The tiles reformed to create a new word. T-R-A-P-P-E-D. Oh, who wouldn't be sorry he'd married such a hard, difficult person? Shame and panic, unspeakable, whirling inside her like a storm, made her rise to her feet to say to him, I'll be ready to leave within the hour. You needn't hurry, Hugo repeated pleasantly. I will, though. She was already on her way, walking quickly away from him and out of the private parlour, up the stairs as if pursued, perhaps by her own frightened thoughts. An hour later, there they were, each in their own separate sphere. Hugo riding, Catherine in her carriage. On her lap was a book, a dog-eared copy of Robinson Crusoe, and a hat she had been too harried to put on. 
It was made of amber velvet and trimmed with a brilliant green feather, which, strangely enough, reminded her of that poor bird back in Whitehaven, Senor Rodrigo. How he would have liked the feather, she thought with an aching sadness. How he would have liked it if it were his own. A memory rose. Herself and Hugo. They were children then, standing near the column of bay trees, the boundary between their two houses. He had squeezed between two of the brushy trunks, come to show her a little bird he had constructed out of paper, which carefully he held in his hands. She had stared in fascinated admiration, and neither of them noticed that her grandfather had approached until he'd said over her shoulder, What's that? I made it, sir, for my mamma, answered Hugo, for her birthday. Silly thing for a boy to do, grandfather had said in his loud, blustering way, his voice full of scorn. Haven't you anything better to do, you great block? She had seen instantly the look of hurt on Hugo's face. He had gone away, and later, as soon as she could, she crept between the trees. She found him sitting behind the stable, the paper bird still held cupped in his hands, and without a word went to sit next to him. It was some time before he spoke. People think because I'm big I don't have feelings, that I'm stupid. I don't think that, Hugo. She had leaned her head against his arm. And I think your bird is beautiful. They had sat together behind the stable, and finally he said, Thank you, Kate. The carriage rolled smoothly on into Somerset. They passed vast, hilly grasslands, winding rivers, towering woodlands. Catherine heard again Hugo's voice from long ago, not yet deepened by burgeoning maturity. People think because I'm big I don't have feelings. Her fingers clenched too hard on the amber velvet hat, crumpling it. Her own voice, Catherine all grown up and determined to take control of her life, seemed to ring shrilly in her ears. You ought to have asked me first. You should have woken me anyway. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. Good night. I want separate bedchambers, if you please. It's not as if this is a love match and I'll wither away and die of a broken heart. It doesn't matter to me. It's nonsensical to talk of happiness in an exchange of commodities, a business arrangement. Had she hurt him? And had that been her, really been her, talking like that? 15th of January, 1812. Dear Mamma, a quick billet before Catherine and I leave on the final stage of our journey to Sermont Hall. All's well here. Trust the same is true for you. All of you? Storage assured me that the money would very soon be made available to you. Do use it. Also, I've had fifty pounds put on your account at the linen drapers. The clerk said some very nice new woolen fabric had just arrived, entirely suitable for winter gowns, and there will be a parcel arriving for Bertram shortly. Don't let him rattle it about. It's a microscope. Love all round, Hugo. P.S. I almost forgot. You know the milliner next to the linen drapers, of course. I saw a hat in the window which rather reminded me of an admiral's bicorn, and so I bought it for Gwenny. Send her to pick it up, will you? She'll look ripping in it. Their cavalcade had turned off the road and stopped at a large stone and brick building of elaborate Gothic design, where they were greeted by the middle-aged lodgekeeper, a Mr. Allard, who hospitably waved them on. Catherine sat up very straight and stared out her window as her carriage rolled forward. A dozen or so diablotins would come in very handy right now, she thought, with a sudden intense craving, or a big slice of chocolate roll. It seemed to take forever to wind their way among the woods to arrive at open land. It was like being in one of those eerie tales by the Brothers Grimm. You never knew what dreadful thing lay just around the bend. A shuddery prickle ran down her spine, and involuntarily her gaze went to Hugo, who was riding ahead. He was only some twenty feet away from her, 
but it might as well have been a million miles. He sat tall and straight in the saddle, easy and graceful, every inch a pen hollow. A pen hollow with more of them ahead. Together, one of the greatest families in England. What in heaven's name was she doing here? And then Sir Montall came into view. Catherine couldn't stop herself. She craned her neck to see it, caught her breath at its grandeur. The hall was enormous, with several wings added on in differing styles of architecture, telling the tale of a long and noble heritage, and all combining to somehow create a powerful impression of pleasing unity. It made Brook House, very large also, but built on the strictest lines of symmetry, seem uninspired, raw, gauche. The carriages pulled up on a wide gravel drive. Hugo swung himself down from his horse. Quick, quick, you, Catherine thought. Pull yourself together. Lift your chin. Arrange your face. Don't rush your sentences. You may be a stranger in a strange land, but you're just as good as they are, so stop that stupid trembling at once. Footman had materialised as if out of thin air. Her carriage door was opened and she was helped out. Be dignified, she told herself. Be calm, stately, just like Livia Penhallow would be. A fluttering movement low on the ground caught Catherine's eye, and she half turned to see that a large black chicken with an immense spray of curling tail feathers had come pelting around the side of the hall its bright red comb wobbling madly. A few seconds after that, a pretty young woman followed behind, the white hem of her gown rippling and scarlet cloak streaming behind her as she ran after the chicken. Oh, I hope the poor servant girl won't be in trouble for letting the chicken get loose. Impulsively, Catherine stepped forward, as if to try and block the chicken's escape. The chicken, in turn, seemed to check for a moment, which enabled the girl to swoop it up in her arms. You miserable, wretched thing, she said to the chicken, but with affection palpable in her voice, and the chicken clucked and settled against her, now as docile as any pet. Then her gaze shot up, and her vivid green eyes went wide. Oh, you're here, she exclaimed, and Hugo said with a laugh, Hello, Liv. Liv? Livia Penhallow, thought Catherine, astonished. Could it be? This lively-looking girl, surely no older than herself, with her unswept auburn hair rather tumbled, her feet in sturdy, muddy boots, and holding a chicken. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, I lost track of time, said the girl, looking remorseful. A footman approached, offering to relieve her of her feathered burden, but she said, no, thank you, James. Nobody else should be forced to deal with this silly bird. She came forward then, smiling, and said, a little shyly, You must be Catherine. I'm so glad to meet you. I'm Livia, you know. Won't you forgive me for being a bad hostess already? How do you do? answered Catherine, still in such a state of amazement that the words came out sounding stiff, stilted. The chicken eyed her with a malevolent gleam, as if she were an equally silly bird it would very much like to peck. And Hugo, Livia went on, sounding considerably less shy. It's wonderful to see you again. Likewise, warmly answered Hugo, and coming around to Livia's side, hugged her, careful to avoid the chicken. Gone in for poultry, have you, Liv? She nodded, laughing. I'm obsessed. I promise not to bore you with long-winded stories about my Hamburgs and Blue Andalusians. Won't you both come inside? The wind is so sharp. They followed Livia up the short flight of shallow stone steps to the porch and past the massive door of dark knotted wood, which another footman held open, and into an immense hall, where Catherine caught jumbled glimpses of a huge fireplace flanked by gleaming suits of armour, an armament display, a coat of arms carved into the chimney piece with the words et honorum et glorium featured upon it, honour and pride. All throughout was gracious stateliness, 
and then abruptly realised that in the centre of the great hall stood a tall, extremely good-looking man with brown hair and piercing brown eyes gazing with wintry sternness at another, shorter man clad in rusty black. Behind them ranged half a dozen brawny men dressed in rough, ragged clothing, on their less-than-clean faces expressions ranging from sullen defiance to outright fear. The tall, handsome man said, in his deep, cultured voice such hauteur that involuntarily Catherine took half a step back, I don't tolerate attempts to forcibly impress the men of my estate. If there are any who wish, of their own accord, to join His Majesty's Navy, then that, of course, would be a different matter. The other man drew himself up to his full height. Well, as to that, Mr. Penhallow, impressment's legal, don't you know? Although Catherine would not have thought it possible, Gabriel Penhallow, it had to be him, looked yet more regal and commanding. He said, icy cold, try coming again, sir. Come again and try to kidnap the men of my estate. You may trust me when I tell you won't enjoy what happens next. You're, you're threatening me? Yes, said Gabriel Penhallow, his voice lethally soft. The other men stared up at him, and Catherine could almost see the bravado collapsing. Come on, he said roughly to his ragtag group of men, and they all hurried to the door and out of the hall with a scuttling sort of haste that struck her as more than a little comical. The chicken in Livia's arm gave a squawk, and Gabriel Penhallow turned to look at his wife. Catherine watched, fascinated, as into his brown eyes came a subtle but unmistakable warmth, and the corners of his handsomely moulded mouth quirked up ever so slightly. My dear, he said, must you bring that absurd creature into the house? She laughed. Oh, Gabriel, I'm sorry. I only meant to bring Catherine and Hugo inside and then dash away. I must say, you were splendid just now. I was very nearly shaking in my boots. You were splendid, Coz, said Hugo. Those impressment fellows are a beastly lot. Wish I'd kick them in their pants for good measure. Now that, Gabriel Penhallow said, would have been an undignified spectacle, but not altogether displeasing. He came forward to where Catherine and Hugo stood, and Hugo said, Coz, may I introduce you to my wife, Catherine? Or ought I have to introduce Catherine to you? What an oaf I am. Catherine, here's Gabriel. How do you do, said Gabriel. His eyes no longer had that devastatingly attractive warmth, which perhaps he reserved only for his wife, but his tone was entirely civil. We're delighted you've come for a visit. I hope your journey here was a smooth one. Catherine wondered rather wildly if she should curtsy, then caught herself and said with all the composure she could muster, Yes, thank you. I'm very pleased to meet you. Gabriel and Hugo warmly shook hands, and as they did, two servants came into the great hall from a side corridor. The butler, and, Catherine thought, a housekeeper. Crenshaw, said Gabriel, send a dozen or so men, armed, after the impressment gang, please, and tell them to make sure they go well past the boundaries of the estate. Mrs. Blake, would you take Captain and Mrs. Penhallow up to their room? Oh, but Gabriel, I wanted to take them, put in Livia quickly. I'm so proud of how nice it looks. He looked at Livia again, and Catherine saw again that same subtle warmth, that same small smile. But perhaps, he suggested, without the chicken. Livia returned his smile and held his eyes with her own. It was only for a second, but it enabled Catherine to see, with a startling clarity, how deeply in love she was with her husband, and he with her. Then the moment passed, and Livia turned again to her guests. Would you mind very much waiting while I run to the poultry yard and return the wayward Hetty to my flock? I won't be but a few minutes, I promise you. Not at all, said Catherine, still feeling bewildered. Gabriel Penhallow was 
everything she had expected. But Livia? She couldn't have been less of a haughty society matron. How, she wondered, had Gabriel come to marry her? Surely his aristocratic grandmother would have fought against this unconventional union with every breath in her body. And speaking of whom, Catherine glanced nervously around the great hall. This was an encounter which, she imagined, would go rather like a case presented before the ancient Greek jurist Draco, whose famously harsh sentences produced the term draconian. Her uneasy gaze collided with Gabriel's, who said in his calm, reserved way, You are looking for something, perhaps? Flustered, she answered, No, that is, well, I was wondering where your grandmother is. My grandmother routinely naps in the afternoon. However, she's looking forward to renewing her acquaintance with you at dinner this evening. Catherine had to admire his tact. She managed to say, I also, and was grateful that Livia soon re-entered the hall, her red cloak exchanged for a simple wool shawl and her sturdy boots for a pair of delicate slippers. Please won't you come with me, she said to Catherine and Hugo, and as they walked with her up a grand and curving staircase, she went on, I feel dreadfully about not greeting you properly. When we got your note, Hugo, I thought I might just spend an extra hour or two in the kitchen garden and poultry yard and allowed myself to get distracted. Kitchen garden? Poultry yard? The mistress of Sir Mont Hall actually dealt in such things. Fuddled, Catherine blurted, But it's so cold out, Mrs. Penhallow. You didn't mind that? Livia flashed a smile at her. Oh, please won't you call me Livia. We're three Mrs. Penhallows now in the hall. It's bound to get confusing. As for the cold, no, I don't mind it a bit. I'm one of those people who have to get outdoors no matter the weather. I grew up practically living in the woods. Into Catherine's mind instantly came an image of Livia as a child, feral, wearing animal skins and being raised by a family of wolves, which, she thought wryly, might have been better than growing up in Brook House. They made their way along a lengthy corridor, past several ancient galleries and through a vast old-fashioned drawing room, until finally they came to a beautifully panelled hallway with a high arched ceiling. They walked past another wide stairway and came at last to a handsome, intricately carved oak door. Livia opened it and ushered them inside. Here we are. I hope you'll be comfortable here. Catherine paused just past the threshold, and in her memory suddenly heard again Gabriel Penhallow saying, Would you take Captain and Mrs. Penhallow up to their room? Room. Not rooms. Panic overtook her, and unthinkingly she looked up with a kind of desperation at Hugo. He met her glance and said at once, Live. I wonder if... No, 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 she mustn't know about us, thought Catherine, and quickly placing her hand on Hugo's arm, interjected, Thank you, Livia. It's a delightful room. I'm sure we'll be very comfortable. I'm so glad you like it, answered Livia smilingly. I think it's the nicest of the guest bedchambers. Aren't those old wall hangings beautiful? Supposedly, they're a gift from Henry the Seventh who was said to have stayed here in 1487, but Gabriel's grandmother says the resident Penhallows would never have allowed such an upstart to stay with them. At any rate, in the morning, you'll have a spectacular view to the front. When we knew you were coming, we made sure all the work was done in plenty of time. Work? repeated Catherine. Oh, we've been fixing and renovating everywhere around the hall. Last week, for example, part of the roof in the Elizabethan wing collapsed, and yesterday Mrs. Blake found more rats' nests in one of the saloons downstairs. More? Catherine was starting to feel like a parrot, dazedly echoing Livia. Did, did you find any in here? Livia laughed, but kindly. No, please don't worry about that. We did unearth an old packet of letters written by someone named Anne. Granny says she has no idea who that is, perhaps a guest who stayed here a long time ago and left them in a cupboard. Well, 
I won't keep you any longer. The servants should be here soon with your trunks. Do ask them for anything you need, of course. And won't you please come downstairs at five to the great drawing room? We'll all assemble there before going in to dinner. All, Catherine repeated hollowly and parrot-like, and realised that she was still clutching Hugo's arm as if he were ballast in a stormy sea. She released it, but didn't dare glance up at him this time, afraid now she might see again in his eyes that harrowing look of regret. A footman placed before Henrietta Penhallow a shallow bowl of fragrant potato leek soup, the surface of which had been dotted with exquisite care with fresh green chives. She thanked him and marvelled, not for the first time, at the circumstance of sitting along the side of the burnished mahogany table rather than at her accustomed place at the foot. Change had come, as it would, she mused, whether one embraced it or not. She let her gaze travel around the table. A small party this evening, Gabriel and Livia occupying, and, rightly so, the head and the foot. Hugo's new wife Catherine sitting to Gabriel's right, and herself next to Catherine. Evangeline, her long-time companion, on Gabriel's left, and next to her, Hugo. A flare of pain, remembering others who ought to have been here, her own dear Richard and their children. Henrietta picked up her spoon with a steady hand. The pain would fade away whenever it was ready. She took a sip of her soup. It was delicious. She made a mental note to send a complimentary message to the kitchen. Or no, that ought perhaps to come from Livia now, not herself. How strange, after all these years, to let the reins of management begin to slip from her grasp. It wasn't as difficult as one would have thought. Perhaps she had gotten a little more tired than she had realised. Henrietta's gaze went again, lightly and unobtrusively, to Hugo's wife, the granddaughter of a fabulously wealthy, extremely low-born miner and an unimportant, dissipated, bankrupt Yorkshire baronet. Not at all the sort of person whom she herself would have wished to join the family. Her own parents would, if such a fanciful thing were possible, be rolling in their graves at the very idea. And yet so it was. Catherine, Henrietta observed gloomily, seemed to have very little conversation. Her hair was pulled back so tightly it seemed to actually stretch her countenance, and also her gown was dreadfully outré. And yet Catherine wore no jewels, aside from the thin, elegant gold band on her left hand. That in itself was interesting. When she did speak, she gestured in an unconsciously graceful way that seemed to illuminate her words. Additionally, one couldn't help but notice that her large, dark eyes were brilliant and alive, alternatively dreamy and alert. The Brook girl was a thinker, there was no doubt of that, and the world could certainly benefit from more of those in it. Henrietta Penhallow, despite herself, was intrigued. Livia Penhallow, as she ate her soup, hoped that everyone was having a good time. This was her first dinner party since becoming the official mistress of Sir Mont Hall, and she wanted so much for it to be a success. The menu, which she had carefully planned with Granny's assistance, was both delectable and nicely varied, and people were talking, although Catherine so far hadn't said much. She would have liked to include Catherine in her conversations with Granny and Hugo, but how annoying, one wasn't supposed to talk across the table. At least she had managed to overset the usual modish rule of having enormous centrepieces cluttering up everything so that you felt visually isolated from the people who weren't sitting right next to you. It was especially nice, as she could look directly at Gabriel. How handsome he was! How distinguished in his dark evening clothes. Her husband. Her husband. 
it was still sometimes hard to believe that they were really and truly married. There had been times, months ago, when that had seemed an achingly impossible prospect. Oh, she was lucky. Lucky. Livia looked again to Catherine, sitting between Gabriel and Granny. She hoped Catherine didn't feel intimidated. When she had had her first conversation with them, she'd felt very much as if it were two against one. They had, then, seemed to take up so much space, and she herself to occupy so little. Tomorrow, Livia vowed, she'd make sure that she would claim a seat next to Catherine. Hugo noticed with pleasure how happy, how blooming Livia looked. It was enjoyable, too, catching up with her news since he'd last been here at the hall during the autumn. They'd gotten on well together since they'd first met. Very easy and unaffected she was. And Miss Evangeline Cott, on his right, was just as quiet and pleasant as he remembered. Just as self-effacing, too. He'd had to draw her out on the subject of her forthcoming marriage to the local parson. It turned out, in a reminder of just how small a world it could be at times, that her Arthur Markson had actually gone to school with Grandpapa at Oxford. As their soup bowls were removed, Hugo seized the opportunity to glance at Catherine, catacorner to him. She hadn't met his eyes once since sitting down for dinner, and she seemed decidedly ill at ease. Not that he could blame her, placed as she was between Gabriel and Aunt Henrietta. They were veritable strangers to her, and that could, of course, make it difficult. That time he'd had to travel with Gabriel from school, in the aftermath of father's death, he'd barely known him. And although Gabriel hadn't been hostile, neither had he been particularly friendly. He himself, still stricken with grief, hadn't bothered to try and drum up conversation between them, and so they had passed the journey from Eton to Sermont Hall pretty much in a silence that had grown more awkward by the mile. And Aunt Henrietta, he'd thought her rather a ghastly old dragon. Catherine still didn't meet his eyes. Toward him she had been, since the morning's exchange, utterly remote, as if she were, or would have preferred to be, a million miles away from him. A footman set before him a plate with two very thin-sliced cotelettes de poulet in a light, buttery sauce blanche, and Gabriel Penhallow nodded his thanks. He assumed that the cutlets did not have their origin in the renegade chicken which this afternoon Livia had brought into the great hall. No, Livia was too fond of her newly acquired brood, being, as she had only last week explained with delight and deep absorption in the early stages of coaxing them to produce fresh eggs. Gabriel smiled within himself, his unconventional bride. A year ago, he would have been horrified at the idea that a Penhallow wife would sully her hands with such mundane matters, literally holding a chicken, let alone take an interest in them. God, what a starchy fellow he had been, and still was sometimes, he thought ruefully. But thanks to Livia, he was trying hard to overcome it. He looked down the table at his wife, just now talking animatedly with Hugo. She was, without doubt, the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. So fiery and intelligent, and so infinitely fascinating. How lucky he was! Lucky beyond words. He could have dwelled on his miraculous good fortune for quite a while, but courtesy recalled him, and he turned again to Catherine Penhallow, wondering what additional topics he might introduce. He'd tried all the usual ones, the weather, the state of the roads, details of her journey here, the health of her family, and so on. Her responses had been short, verging on the curt, and he knew briefly a moment of instantly suppressed exasperation, and then he saw that her hands were trembling just a little. Damn it! Had he done it again? How had Livia used to put it? Assumed the arrogant, aloof Penhallow mask. He said to Catherine, hearing in his voice the slightest edge of desperation, 
My wife has been trying to persuade me to take up Mrs. Brunton's new novel, Self Control, which she says is unintentionally one of the funniest books she's ever come across. Have you by any chance read it? Catherine's eyes lit up, and Gabriel was startled at the change in her. It was like watching a statue come suddenly to life. She answered, Oh, yes, and it is funny. There's a scene in which the heroine, having been spirited away to America, escapes the villain by lashing herself into a canoe and letting herself be carried away by the rapids. Amused, Gabriel replied, A plucky young lady, I perceive. Well, yes and no, and that's why it's so humorous. Mrs. Brunton seems to view her heroine as a kind of blank slate on which she can scrawl whatever she likes as the plot barrels along, rather than developing her in a credible fashion. An intriguing observation, and is the same true of the villain? Catherine laughed. It's hard to say. He's a dastardly rake, you see, who offends the heroine initially with his coarse proposals, but then he spins about and offers to honourably marry her. She, however, refuses him, no matter how alluring his title and fortune and... She broke off, looking abruptly and profoundly self-conscious, and Gabriel in his heart pitied her, and began to talk about a little tour through the Blue Gallery tomorrow, which, he said, she might perhaps find of interest, as they contained some very fine works by Rembrandt, Bosch, the Bruegels, Van Eyck, and the Limburg brothers. Was Catherine familiar with Peter Bruegel the Younger's The Village Lawyer? an excellent example of a remarkable workshop technique called pouncing. Had she heard of it? There was also a charming little sketch by Rembrandt, which was believed to have been drawn when he was a young student in Leiden. Gabriel went doggedly on. He feared, he very much feared he was rambling, but he'd talk till midnight if necessary, if only to give Catherine the time to recover her composure. Miss Evangeline Cott, who had for many years served as the companion, confidant, and general aide-de-camp to her long-time friend Henrietta Penhallow, partook in a limited way of the next course, rare white truffles in a red wine sauce, as it would not, she knew, agree with her tomorrow. She continued to make easy, pleasant conversation with her table partners, Gabriel Penhallow and his cousin, Captain Hugo Penhallow, even as she pondered, as she had many times before, her curious position as one who was part of the family and yet outside of it at the same time. It enabled her to trace, with an interest that was both detached and kindly, the shifting lines of connection among them. For example, Henrietta and her grandson Gabriel had, for many years, sustained a distressingly cursory relationship. Then Livia had unexpectedly come into their lives, bringing with her the bright sunshine of her personality, and had changed everything in the best possible way. It was due to Livia, in fact, that she and her beloved Arthur had been reunited after decades apart, and were now soon to be wed. An intense joy filled Evangeline at the thought, although she concealed it behind the usual calm placidity of her expression. She went on asking Hugo about his various family members. It was easy to see how much he loved them all, how deeply he cared about them. Unfortunately, mused Evangeline, she could see very little in the way of connection between Hugo and his wife Catherine. She knew, of course, that Hugo had married to save his family, for pragmatic reasons. But still, one would have hoped that despite these inauspicious circumstances, such an unlikely couple would become more to each other than a means to an end. And there was so much potential in each of them. She repressed a faint but heartfelt sigh, and without missing a beat said to Hugo, how delightful to know that your twin brothers are now established in their educations. And your sister Gwendolen? What are the plans for her? Evangeline listened with genuine attention to Hugo's reply, even as another part of her continued to observe, ponder, plan. For one thing, 
she had not yet mentioned to Henrietta her hope that she would soon engage another companion. Despite her new happiness here at the hall, there was within Henrietta a deep and relentless loneliness, one which, perhaps, would never be remedied in this lifetime. But a sensitive, steadfast companion, such as she herself had been, Evangeline had no false modesty, might help here and there to at least partially assuage it. For another thing, she had noticed a change in Livia, a very promising one. Livia hadn't spoken about it, but perhaps even she wasn't aware of it. Also, Arthur had mentioned the idea of travelling to the Lake District for their honeymoon, and Evangeline wondered if it would be possible to take in the Wye Valley, as it was said to be a place of spectacular beauty. Indeed, the great poet Wordsworth had written most eloquently about it, saying, All which we behold is full of blessings. And this, Evangeline thought, is very true though blessings are not always so easy to perceive. For a brief and fleeting moment, Catherine wished she were dead. Oh, would this wretched dinner never end? She had just embarrassed herself in the most ghastly way in front of Gabriel Penhallow, a hideous bookend to how she had started the evening by embarrassing herself in front of Henrietta Penhallow, who had sailed her way in a soft silvery grey gown of such understated elegance that Catherine felt painfully dowdy, loathing her own dress with its lace and net and beads and bows, wishing she had removed all of them at some point along the way here, and just as quickly reminding herself that she hated sewing with a passion which had earned her more than one interval in the reflection room. The old lady had said, in what seemed like a conspicuously neutral tone, Good evening. We meet again, I see. Catherine had thought two things at once. First, Mrs. Penhallow sounded exactly like a character in a gothic novel, making a remark which, on its face, was harmless, but which was practically vibrating with sinister implications that didn't bode well for the heroine. Second, she had pictured herself answering in an equally dramatic fashion, and possibly in some kind of exotic accent, so that she'd sound like a character in a gothic novel. Yes, we certainly do meet again, madam, much to your dismay. And she'd added in a sudden loud clap of thunder afterwards for theatrical effect, and also brought in a butler in the background, very suave, but in actuality a scoundrel who was scheming to... And suddenly she had realised that she hadn't said anything in reply. The old lady was looking hard at her from beneath silvery eyebrows, and she had blushed an awful beet red, which she was doing again right now. Damn! 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 Chapter 9 As if taking cruel pleasure in Catherine's misery, time meandered its way along, loitering with almost unbearable slowness. But dinner did eventually end. Livia rose, and Catherine followed her, old Mrs. Penhallow and Miss Cott, to a large drawing-room furnished and decorated in the ornate, lively Rococo style of the previous century. There she paused just past the threshold, not quite knowing where she should sit. As if sensing her uncertainty, Livia paused too, turned, gave her a warm smile. Won't you join me, Catherine? Thankfully, Catherine began to follow Livia into the room, but then old Mrs. Penhallow said, I should enjoy a little tete-a-tete with Catherine, that is, if you do not object, Catherine. By no means, ma'am. Smile, smile. Trying to appear confident, she went to sit in a gilded carved walnut chair, upholstered in heavy embroidered silk, that had her at a perpendicular angle to Mrs. Penhallow, who looked at her with silvery brows slightly knitted. You travelled here today from Bruton, I understand. Yes, ma'am. Did you pass the night in the Pomfret Arms? Yes, ma'am. I applaud your choice, by far the best inn in Bruton. I trust the sheets were properly aired. 
Yes, ma'am, I believe so. Mrs. Penhallow nodded, then began to turn upon the fourth finger of her left hand a singularly beautiful sapphire ring of a simple yet exquisite design. It has come to my attention, she said, that you and Hugo are travelling with three carriages which are very nearly empty, and that you brought with you no maid or dresser. Naturally, my curiosity is piqued. May I inquire as to the reason why? A little wildly, Catherine thought about making up a story of some kind. We were waylaid by highwaymen, a rogue band of raccoons made off with everything during the night. I did bring a maid, but she ran off to Mexico to join the fight for independence. But it seemed impossible while being scrutinised by those sharp blue eyes. So she said, We left my house in Cumbria with those three carriages holding my trousseau, ma'am, but it didn't suit me. I gave it away on the way here. Those silvery brows now arched high in evident surprise. You gave it away because it didn't suit you? Yes, ma'am. To whom did you give it? A poor parish in Kendal. I see. A charitable gesture. Mrs. Penhallow nodded slowly. Why did your trousseau not suit you? The clothing had itching powder in it. The shoes all squeaked when you walked in them. Nothing in it was to my taste, ma'am. Indeed. Ruminatively, Mrs. Penhallow added, I recall a certain hat strewn with artificial cherries. Catherine grimaced. Yes, it looked like I had a fruit bowl on my head. There was a tap on the door, and then it was swung open by a footman, who solemnly announced, Here is Muffin, ma'am. In shot a little white dog with absurdly short legs and great pointy ears who ran joyously to the old lady, then dashed over to Livia and Miss Cot, its curly tail thumping, and then to Catherine, as if wanting to make sure she was included in its exuberant greeting, after which it bounded back to Mrs. Penhallow and leaped up next to her on her elegant rococo chair. Her handsome face softening ever so slightly, the old lady gathered the little dog onto her lap. A further surprise for today. Catherine would have expected a graceful, well-bred whippet or a fashionable pug, not this charming but rather motley-looking creature. The hat, pursued Mrs. Penhallow, with the air of one determined to get to the bottom of things. Why? Because plums were out of season? I had a dreadful spot on my forehead I wished to conceal. They were actually real cherries, so I could eat them if I got hungry. Catherine blurted out, Oh, ma'am, how can I explain it to you? It was easier to wear it than to fight about it. I gave up years ago. You don't know my mother, but a domineering sort. Already regretting her impulsive frankness, Catherine only nodded and saw, to her surprise, an expression of... Why, it looked like sorrow flitting across Mrs. Penhallow's face. Somehow it galvanised her to go on. My mother, my parents, believe that one's wealth should be clearly signified by what one wears, and so they allowed themselves to be guided by what I believe were unscrupulous modistes, who indulged in all the worst and most expensive excesses of fashion. They wanted to make sure that everyone in the beau monde knew that I was very wealthy. A miscalculation. Such displays are garish and vulgar, and deceive no one. If anything, they make things worse. You had a season last year, then. Hardly deserving of the term, ma'am. A failure? Yes. And you hope for a better one this year? More than hope, ma'am. It must be better. It has to be. You want this very much, I perceive. Yes. The old lady was silent for a few moments. You remind me of someone, she said, in her eyes now a faraway look. A strong-willed young woman bent on taking the ton by storm. Who was that, ma'am? And was she successful? The tiniest of smiles played about the old lady's lips. It was me. And yes, I was successful. 
though not in the way I originally planned. To Catherine came a sudden vision of Mrs. Penhallow as she might have been when young, slim, upright, graceful, dazzlingly lovely. She would have worn those elaborate gowns with the very wide full skirts and ruffled sleeves and the high-dressed powdered hair. Oh, a diamond of the first water without doubt. It was easy to believe the young Henrietta Penhallow would have conquered society in a heartbeat. It came to her, too, that here was, perhaps, a commonality between herself and Mrs. Penhallow, as different as they were. Catherine leaned forward. Ma'am, might you be willing to offer me your guidance? I'll need to replace my trousseau, and you're renowned throughout London for your sens de la mode. Only throughout London? Dear me, how the mighty have fallen. Mrs. Penhallow's voice was serious, but in her eyes there was a faint little twinkle, encouraging Catherine to say, Perhaps everywhere, ma'am. Will you help me? Is there a seamstress nearby whom you patronise? I do, but she's engaged in work for Miss Cott for her wedding gown. However, I may be able to persuade a certain modiste I know in town to travel here, along with her assistance. But she's very expensive. That wouldn't be a concern for me, ma'am. I didn't think so. You'll require everything? Gowns, shoes, hats, gloves, shawls, and so on? Yes. I'll let Madame Hébert know, and that she's to bring along some colleagues, whose names I shall also suggest. Mrs. Penhallow looked at Catherine with an exacting kind of deliberation, and Catherine felt, not with rancour, but with hope, as if she were a lump of clay being assessed by an artist. I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. The great Michelangelo had once said that, though, of course, she herself was no angel. Jewel tones, said Mrs. Penhallow decisively. White cannot be avoided, of course, for day wear, but you will do better in a softer white, tending toward cream or ivory. No pastels ever. As for your hair, I know it's a horrid mess, Mum. At school they called me Medusa. Oh, God, she hadn't meant to reveal this hurtful memory ever, but somehow it had just slipped out. Catherine felt herself blushing hotly. The old lady, however, only said, Girls can be so cruel, can't they? I dare say they may have been envious, for it's quite arduous to transform straight hair into curls. Envious? Of her? Catherine's mouth dropped open. She stared at Mrs. Penhallow, who, for her part, continued gazing back in that same pensive manner. Finally, she said, As someone with curly hair myself, I may be biased, but I must say, I think curls very attractive. My suggestion to you is that you stop fighting them, it doesn't suit you to pull your hair so tightly onto the crown of your head, or to pin it behind your ears. Better, perhaps, to have a loose arrangement across your forehead and framing your face, and a simple unadorned coil in the back, with tendrils allowed to trail at the nape of your neck, and a few brought forward as if an ornament to the collarbone. Yes, that would be a great deal more flattering. What you need is a competent friseur who understands curly hair. I like your suggestion very much, ma'am, said Catherine, in a voice in which sincerity and a kind of awe were blended. Do you have a particular friseur in mind? I do. I'll send for him as well. Would you like me also to engage the services of a dresser? Yes, but... Catherine trailed off, embarrassed all over again. But what? Oh, ma'am, I'd like to have someone pleasant. Those silvery brows went up a little. There is an employment agency I patronise while in London, and I'll write to the proprietress tomorrow. Your request is not unreasonable. Thank you, Mrs. Penhallow. For a crazy few seconds, she felt like leaping to her feet and hugging the old lady. Henrietta Penhallow didn't immediately reply. She had that faraway air again, as if she hadn't heard, as if her thoughts had drifted elsewhere. 
We know what we are, she murmured, but know not what we may be. Hamlet, said Catherine, and the old lady's look sharpened again. You know your Shakespeare? Well, I like reading it, ma'am, she answered, and then to her surprise, she and Mrs. Penhallow plunged into an amiable debate about the plays, the old lady plumping for the Tempest as the bard's best, and she herself arguing for Macbeth. It proved to be a pleasant distraction, but fell away when the gentlemen joined them again, because soon it would be bedtime. Hugo looked around the capacious room that was his and Catherine's bedchamber. There was a reasonably big bench, padded with dark blue fabric, over by one of the windows. That would do, although he'd have to prop his feet up on the armrest or wedge himself between the two armrests and hope he didn't roll off in the middle of the night, or worse, get stuck there. Hugo? Yes, Catherine? Thank you for not saying anything to Livia, or anybody, about our arrangement, about the bedrooms. He looked down into her face. She was pale and tense, strained, visibly exhausted. He exerted himself to say pleasantly, It's all right. I'll just take a blanket and a pillow then. What? Why? Her glance flashed around the room to the bench, then to the bed, and lingered there. It was quite a bed, very high and old-fashioned, and draped with crimson bed covers. It was set on an equally old-fashioned platform, formed from carved oak, and above it was a canopy with long silken hangings in the same vivid red. Oh, I see. Her face worked. She brought one of her hands to her mouth, worried at her fingernail. Finally. There's no need for that. We can share the bed. It's big enough for two people. Will you keep to your word? Yes. I'll undress behind that screen, if, if you could undo my gown for me. Oh, damn. Damn, damn, damn. Help her undress. It was not unlike asking a starving man to hold a delicious loaf of bread and refrain from eating it while you just stepped outside for a while. He said, Certainly. Catherine turned, and he began, with an efficiency that was under the circumstances remarkable, to unfasten the long column of buttoned loops at the back of her gown. He wondered if she had any idea how hard this was for him, standing so close, performing such an intimate task. He caught a subtle scent from her, sweet and faint, delectable. It took him a few moments to identify it as chocolate. Then her gown slid apart, revealing the delicate white linen of her shift. It was all that stood between him and warm, soft flesh, between him and Catherine. Speaking of hard, he was hard now, and breathing rather audibly. Damn it to hell! Last night she had accused him. You're happy all the time. He definitely wasn't happy right now. No, he was in agony. Because he wanted quite a lot to topple her and take her right there on the wide, ancient oak floorboards upon which Henry the Seventh may or may not have trod. Oh, unmanned in the war. He'd show her unmanned until she screamed with pleasure. Sweating, he gritted his teeth. Will you keep to your word? Yes. Then, with effort, he relaxed his jaw. Well, he said, that's done. Thank you, she answered, and quickly went behind a tall three-panelled screen set in a corner of the room. Her voice, a little steadier now, came floating to him from behind the screen. Will you let me know when you're in bed, and could you blow out the candles? Certainly, Hugo repeated, rather heavily, aware that before him loomed again the dark, dangerous, fatal slough of regret. Christ, what had he done? He turned away and rapidly began to undress. They lay in the dim, flickering light of the waning fire. Catherine was on her back, safe under the bedclothes, 
hands folded over her middle. It was strange, but she wasn't tired any more. She was, in fact, wide awake, her mind looping over and over again to those moments during which Hugo had unbuttoned her gown. She had felt his warmth, his solidity, his bewitching maleness from behind her, and an electrifying thrill had shimmied everywhere within her. These were circumstances, had they been related in a naughty novel, which would have had her eagerly turning the pages to see what would happen next. But this was not a novel. This was real life, with all its uncertainties, its mystifying twists and turns. The unknowable future. Looming large. Frighteningly large. When she'd taken off her shift and put on her nightgown, she had very nearly kissed the screen for being there, because she could hide behind it, at least for a little while. Oh, God, how awkward this all was, sharing a bedchamber. Sharing a bed. But anything was better than having people know the truth. Luckily, she was in control. Completely and fully in control. That was the saving grace of this difficult situation, her self-control. And into her mind, with immediate irony, popped an image of that hapless, silly heroine in Mrs. Brunton's self-control, tumbling along a raging river, lashed to her canoe. It came to Catherine that she felt a little like that heroine right now, tumbling, hapless, helpless. Go to sleep, go to sleep, she told herself sternly. She made herself picture sheep, identical white fluffy sheep, jumping over a stile. That would work for sure. Count them, damn you. One, two, three, four. Was Hugo sleeping, she wondered. The sheep vanished, and she noticed out of the tail of her eye his big body next to hers. She could just make out that he had one long muscled arm, bare above the covers. His shoulder was bare, too. Was he... Was it possible he was naked? Her fingers flattened out on the cambric material of her nightgown. She was properly attired. But Hugo... An image came to her. Hugo, so tall, big, broad-shouldered, lean-hipped, long-legged, utterly naked, completely male. Her mind projected it in two dimensions as if it were a lifeless portrait on a wall, something from which you could stand apart and objectively view, an image you could coolly walk away from. But, as incendiary as it was, it was just in her imagination. Hugo himself, three-dimensional, living and breathing and solid and real, was right next to her, just a few feet away. Her nostrils flared, like a deer scenting danger, and, oh God, oh dear God, her body was reacting to his presence. Between her legs, in that secret place, a slow, delicious swirl of energy, of subtle pleasure. In her breasts, a warm, lovely, tingly sort of feeling, as if that same illicit energy was flowing throughout her, unquenchable, unstoppable, a river broken free from a dam treacherous, but undeniably delightful. That is to say, full of delight. Her arms and legs felt heavy, languid, in the most wonderful way. She was melting, spreading across the bed, hot like wax from a burning candle. Oh yes, she was awake as wide awake, Catherine was certain, as she had ever been in her whole entire life. Then came a torrent, urgent from deep within her brain, repeating old, scathing, familiar words from the past. No, 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 you mustn't, you sordid, sneaking criminal girl. This is shameful. This is wrong. This is bad. And continued with increasing panic as desire nonetheless built, grew, overtook her. No, no, don't! But still her hand drifted up to slide around the cambric-covered curve of a breast 
to feel a hard and sensitive tip beneath the fabric. Her fingers slid up, up, to wonderingly stroke lips that felt swollen, hungry, needful, that is to say, full of need. A wave of lust lifted her, rising high above her brain's chatter, and recklessly she rode it. No, no, stay the course. Don't, don't, be careful, be safe, be good. But it was as if every cell in her body combined to shout out a loud and defiant response. No! Out loud, Catherine said. Hugo? Perhaps he had been awake also, because right away he answered in his deep, calm voice. Yes, Catherine? How to begin, she wondered. How to frame it? Hunger, impatience rose up, roaring. And before she could stop herself, she said it. Again. You can have me. There was dead silence. Finally. I beg your pardon? Recklessly, she rode the wave. You can have me, if you want to. Do you want to? Silence again. Then, yes. Do you want to? Yes. Catherine watched, a little breathless, as Hugo lifted himself up on one elbow, facing her. She could see that the bedclothes had slipped down quite a lot and that his chest was bare. Oh, delicious. Saliva began to pool in her mouth and she swallowed convulsively. Are you sure, Catherine? Yes. What do you want to happen? She blurted it out. Surprise me. And in the dimness she saw a slow, slow smile come to Hugo's perfect mouth. I'll do my best. He slid close to her then, brought his long self against her. Oh my goodness, he was naked, and his... What was the right word for that? His, well, manhood was pressing against her thighs, hard, hard, utterly foreign, incredibly exciting. But her nightgown was in the way, the damned thing. But she had a feeling that somehow they would fix that annoying little problem. She felt herself arching up, as if involuntarily, and her mind seemed to be fizzling away like a spent firework. Oh, joy. She said in a soft, silky voice she hardly recognised as her own. There's just one thing. He paused. His face was so close to her own, and she fancied she could see fire kindling again in the sapphire of his eyes. Yes, Catherine? Reckless. Are you going to kiss me like you did in the ruins of Babylon? Do you want me to? No. He laughed. Good. Hurry up, then. As you wish, he said, and brought his mouth to hers. In a heartbeat she could tell that it wasn't at all like that brief salute from before. No. It was delightful. Full of delight. Brimming with delight. Hugo's mouth was hard, sure, persuasive, entrancing. All of this, and all at once. She felt her own lips parting, eagerly yielding, welcoming with a low guttural sound in her throat the warmth, the wetness of his tongue. In her mouth. In her. My, she thought in a dim, dreamy sort of way. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's very sure. This is good. He's good. Very, very good. One of her hands lifted, groping, found Hugo's muscled shoulder and slid up to the sturdy column of his neck and then around to his nape and up into his thick, short hair, gripping it, gripping him, to bring him yet closer as she kissed him back, her own tongue meeting his in wet, warm, intimate collusion. Had she really believed that she and Germaine de Lamotte had reached the height of passion with their furtive kisses? She would have laughed, but there was no time for that. Do come here, she muttered against his mouth, her hands sliding down urgently to his shoulder again, tugging at him, 
and obligingly he brought himself full upon her, chest to chest, his body heavy upon hers, his, well, manhood hard against her thigh. Sublime. Am I crushing you? Hugo's voice was muffled as he was speaking into the fat, untidy, half-loosened plait of her hair. No. Good. He licked at her neck, from the base of her throat up toward her jaw in a long, slow stroke, wet and sensuous, making her shiver. You're cold? he asked her. My God, no. Good, he repeated, and found her mouth again with his own, kissed her hard and deeply, kissed her until she was a hot puddle of wax, melting, spreading, languorous, but still so hungry, greedy. She could have gone on like this for much longer, perhaps an hour, perhaps all night, maybe forever. But then Hugo, without hurry, shifted again, so that he lay on his side, his body close to hers. So, Catherine? Dazedly she replied, So what? Better than before. No, she did laugh. Much better. Excellent. And now? Yes, she said, breathless. Could you sit up for a moment? Yes. She did, and Hugo did too, and took hold of the rumpled hem of her nightgown. Politely he asked, May I? By all means, she answered, just as politely. She helped him by tugging the fabric from underneath her, and helped him when it got tangled up in her hair, and laughed again when finally she was rid of it, and he tossed it aside without a second glance. Now she was naked too, and felt with a galvanic, exciting shock, cool air everywhere upon her bare skin. Now she was free. Her hair, she realized, had come unbound and tumbled about her face and over her shoulders in a mad nimbus of curls. She shoved them back and lay down again, turning her head to look up at Hugo with eager expectancy. She said, Well? He was silent, and in the dark intimacy of the crimson bed, she watched him looking at her, saw his eyes travel from her face to her breasts, to her hips and legs, and in between them. Lovely, Hugo said at last, his voice a little ragged. Catherine, you're so lovely. I can see you now. See me now, she echoed. What do you mean? I couldn't before. All those things on you, was all he said. Then he lay down too. He sent himself lower, trailed his tongue around the soft yielding flesh of her breast, circled the hard tip of it, and she jerked as a kind of willing thrill shot through her, voluptuous, here, there, everywhere, and then his mouth was fully upon her breast, suckling hard, even as his hand found the other, cupped and caressed it with such assurance, such cunning, that a wild flutter of pleasure sparked in the very core of her, and she groaned out loud in a way Hugo seemed to like a great deal, for he gave a little laugh and brought his hand away from her breast, let it slide in a slow, deliberate movement down to her belly, playing along its gentle, rounded rise, sweeping along the flaring curve of her hip, and slowly, slowly, with a tantalizing lack of speed, into the soft hair, the tender, sensitive flesh between her legs, where he stroked her, suckling her still with his mouth as his fingers continued to stroke, to find the places that lit her up with fiery sensation. Here, he said, his deep voice sounding softly against her ear, almost like a caress itself. Yes, she gasped, a little later. And here. Yes, but, oh, higher, a bit higher, can you? Yes, like this. Y yes. More, he said softly. Oh, Hugo, yes. Yes, he said. Yes. And then, a little later. What about this? She jerked and gasped again. Yes! Oh, Hugo, yes! Her breath came faster. She panted, muttered. Oh, Hugo, please! And he seemed to know now precisely what she meant, 
and went on stroking her and touching her without pause, as if effortlessly, as if there was nothing else in the world he would rather be doing. And so Catherine gave herself up to the light, the joy in her body illuminating her in every part of her, deepening, intensifying, until, just when it seemed she couldn't contain this wild, overflowing goodness for a single second more, an ecstatic convulsion took hold of her. Her limbs went taut, she flung back her head, and she cried out. Chapter 10 Catherine's eyes were closed, her lips parted, her face framed by dark curls in what seemed to Hugo the most glorious disarray. She looked so... He stared. She looked so happy. Seeing it made him happy also, he said, still softly. Well? She opened her eyes, deep, dark, shining, and looked up into his own. She smiled. He caught a glimpse of white teeth, pearl-like. Well, what? Did I surprise you? Oh, yes, but... But? Catherine ran the tip of her tongue over her lower lip, pink against red, and Hugo remembered how he had once hungered hopelessly to taste her cherry-red mouth. And now he had, and would, he thought, again. He felt in himself a slow roll of pleasure and lust. She said, But we're not done, are we, Hugo? And then he smiled too. I hope not. So now what? This, if you like. Hugo lifted himself up and over her. He was hard and achingly ready, and gave a groan of his own when Catherine murmured, Yes, I do like slid silky, fleshy thighs up and along his own legs, opening herself to him. He had just enough presence of mind to say, There may be some pain for you. I'm sorry. A lot? I don't know. I've never been with a virgin before. I'm your first. She seemed pleased to hear it, and gripped him more firmly with her legs. He groaned again. Christ, but he was so close— he was nearly there, inside her. Yes, he managed to reply between clenched teeth, managing somehow to keep himself in check. Catherine was looking up at him, rather wonderingly, he thought. A first time for us both, each in our own way, she said, and he saw how onto her face came again that same look of wanting, of wildness, rapture. Her eyes were shining like stars on a dark night, she said. I'm ready. Thank God, he said, with genuine reverence, and brought himself into her, within her, at last. There was, at first, a resistance within her, unpleasant, sharp, a last and literal remnant of a girlhood she was glad to leave behind. Hugo was inside her now, taking her with him to a new place, filling her, moving with gentleness, carefulness, until finally the barrier was gone. Catherine shuddered, and he paused. She sensed how difficult it was for him to do that, the extraordinary self-control it required. Are you all right, Catherine? Yes. Shall I go on? Oh, God, yes. And he began to move again. A ribbon of thought danced across her mind. This... This was better than any daydream, infinitely better than a fantasy, far better than orchestrating, commandeering the scene in her head, for here she yielded up that absolute control, here she gave herself over to Hugo, and together they were creating this, oh, it had to be called magic. And then the thought was gone, just as the pain too went away, and there was only sensation all newness. Hugo. She was moving in concert with Hugo, her arms around him, her breasts pressed roughly against the warm skin, the hard, muscled expanse of his chest, the difference between their bodies profound, shocking, wonderful. With a little laugh, she lifted herself up to receive him yet more fully. 
Fiercely, she gripped him with her arms, with her legs. Wonderful. Hugo was moving more quickly now. Yes, he said, in his deep voice, a kind of beautiful harshness, the side of his face pressed hard against her, as intimate as a kiss. Oh, Christ, yes. A thrust, a final thrust, another groan seemed wrenched from his throat, and then he was done. He slowly withdrew from her, but only a little ways. He slid his arm underneath her shoulders and pulled her close. Willingly did she lie against him, her head just below his collarbone, both of them damp with sweat. Christ, Hugo said again, still breathing rather hard, his expression she saw quite beatific. She smiled, thought, said, nothing for a little while, simply lay there, simply being listening mindlessly to the steady beat of his heart. Then, Hugo? Yes, Catherine? May I ask you a question? Of course. Did you like it? Need you ask? I was just wondering. He drew aside a clump of long, tangled curls and kissed her forehead. Yes, I liked it, quite a lot. But did you? Couldn't you tell? she asked in surprise. Well, I thought so, hoped so, but I don't believe you came. Came? What does that mean? You know, when I was touching you, before, you came. Came, Catherine repeated dreamily. Such a plain little word for such a, such a large event. Explosion might be better, but it hardly seems poetic enough. She trailed her fingers across his shoulder and down along the hard, masculine line of his sternum. Oh, the feel of him. She went on. On the other hand, perhaps came, to come, does work, because it's a verb, which signifies action, and also in the sense that one is transported to another plane. One comes somewhere else, attains another state of being, which reminds me. She slid her hand further down, along his flat stomach, taut with muscle, then below, and heard with pleasure his indrawn breath. Different now, she remarked, stroking him, felt it stir. Even though the term vital parts is a euphemism, I must say it's a good one. Thank you, I think. Oh yes, it's a compliment. So vital. What do you call it? Call it? He sounded a little startled. I mean, what is it called, this part of you? Well, the technical term is penis, but we men tend to use more colourful language, and by colourful, I mean vulgar. Like what? Hugo laughed. Never in his experience with women had he lain with them afterwards and talked about the vocabulary of sexual experience. Another box, a little more of Catherine, so sweetly, charmingly revealed. Oh, cock, prick, roger, flute, sugar stick, to name just a few. She laughed too, very colourful indeed. And then her hand slid lower. And these? A distraction, a fine one, but he was able to answer. Testicles, if you're feeling technical. Otherwise, bollocks, tallywags, baubles. Also colourful. Shakespeare, Catherine said, moving her hand back up to slide along his penis, cock, flute, whatever, made a lot of jokes about such things. Oh, said Hugo politely, though his thoughts were, in fact, drifting elsewhere. Like what? Oh, dying for coming, my tongue in your tail. Arise, arise, which, incidentally, is what you're doing right now. Can you do it again so soon? By God, yes, he answered, turning to her. But can you? Do you want to? Yes. Catherine slid a warm, plump thigh over his hip and brought them groin to groin. And, 
She gave a little pleased-sounding hiss as he, in turn, ran his hand down her back and around the curves of a gloriously full bottom. And what are some of your colourful terms for it? For the act? Screw, he promptly said. Tup, knock, dock, hump, grind, shag, whop. She laughed again. That actually sounds a little poetic. If you say so, Hugo replied, and brought his mouth to hers, lightly, very lightly, nipping with his teeth at that full, tempting lower lip that made him think of sweet juice, succulent flesh, and everything that was delicious and good in this world. She made a noise, a hum, a sigh, tightening her leg over his hip to snug him closer, said then in a throaty little voice, Knock, dock, tup, hump. He grinned. Now I hear the poetry. The words just need a little rearranging, that's all. Hugo, Catherine went on, whispering, her hand going down between them to take hold of his Roger, flute, sugar stick, that was now so very hard again. What you said before? A woman can come when a man's inside her. Yes. Let's do that. Yes, he said. Let's. And then there were no more words, just movement, a primal rhythm, a deep understanding between their bodies, a dance. And later, rather later, Catherine beneath him, her hair around her in that wonderful wanton froth of curls, said on a gasp, Oh, Hugo, you were right. I'm glad, Kate, he said, and kissed her hard, and then he too came, came with such an intense rush of pleasure that after, when he was able to think again, it occurred to him that Shakespeare might have been correct, that maybe it was a little like dying, to feel oneself all shattered to bits, albeit in a very good way, and that maybe Catherine was on to something too by calling it an explosion. Interesting thing, words. He laughed, wrapped his arms around her, and fell asleep. She dreamed. Who was that beautifully dressed, gorgeously coiffed woman ascending with stunning grace the white marble steps to the Penhallow townhouse? She looked familiar with her dark eyes and curly dark hair. But why did she look so worried? Why did she look so sad? I've forgotten something. I've lost something I need. She was flanked on both sides by admiring crowds of people, bowing and curtsying as she went past. Some even prostrated themselves before her. But she didn't care about that. It wasn't real. She knocked on the townhouse door, which was made, apparently, of solid gold. The sunlight glittering on it hurt her eyes. The door swung open, and old Mrs. Penhallow stood on the threshold. I've forgotten something, but I don't remember what it is. It's something very important. You've got to find it yourself, the old lady said. You won't find it here. Then shut the door in the young woman's face. Morning. A new day filled with possibility. Hugo looked at Catherine, who slept still, curled up on her side, long dark lashes shielding her eyes, the bedclothes drawn up to her chin. He wanted to wake her, wanted to... How had she so charmingly said it? Yes, he wanted to have her again. He thought also that she might want to have him again. Knock, dock, tup, hump. By God, but last night had been... A good word for it would be amazing. He saw, however, looking at her, the dark shadows beneath her eyes, recalled how strained, how tired she had appeared all yesterday. Let her sleep, he thought. It was very early. Quietly, Hugo got out of bed, dressed, and left their bedchamber. He was hungry. Whistling a little under his breath, he went lightly downstairs and toward the breakfast parlour, confident that there he would find a nice hearty meal awaiting him. He passed a servant in a hallway, said, Good morning, and reflected cheerfully that it really was. 
maybe even a great one. A gentle tapping on the door woke her, and at first Catherine had no idea where she was. Oh, God, had Celeste come to wake her already? Make her go downstairs and be bored to death? But it couldn't be. Celeste always hung over her, saying in that sour way of hers, Wake up, mademoiselle, wake up! So who was at the door? What bad thing had she done now? Tap, tap, tap. Catherine's eyes flew open. Crimson bed hangings. The high, old-fashioned bed. Not Brook House, but Sermont Hall. Alarmed, still groggy, she called out, What is it? The door opened. A maidservant came in, bobbed a curtsy. Please, ma'am, I'm to tell you that breakfast is ready. Breakfast? Quickly, Catherine looked over at Hugo's side of the bed. He wasn't there. He'd probably been gone for hours. And he'd let her sleep. A warm feeling came over her then, like a wave advancing on the shore. Last night. Oh, last night. It had been heavenly. And Hugo had told her she was lovely. And here she was, with no idea where her dowdy nightgown had gone. How wonderful. Ma'am, came the voice of the maidservant, who was still standing by the door, and Catherine realised she hadn't answered. How late was it? Was she already making herself conspicuous among the Penhallows by being a bad guest and making them all wait for her at table? Quickly, she sat up, clutching the bedclothes to her chest, and said to the maidservant, Breakfast, yes. Can you help me get dressed, please? I'll be glad to, ma'am, but I'm no lady's maid. That's all right. We must hurry, though. I'll do my best, ma'am. Half an hour later, Catherine was following the maidservant along a mystifying warren of corridors and galleries, and found herself worrying at a fingernail. She dropped her hand, resisted the urge to firmly smooth a few wayward curls behind her ears, to press them flat. A memory surfaced. Her first breakfast at the Basingstoke Academy. How nervous she'd been. How badly she had hoped to make friends. She'd been a little late, having had a difficult time scrambling into her clothes, and so entered the gloomy, crowded dining room only to see everyone already seated, only to see the look of glee on the other girls' faces when she earned a black mark on her very first morning at school. Tardiness, Miss Brooke, said Miss Wolfe, staring at Catherine through her pince-nez, is evidence of an inferior character. There had been sniggers, quiet but unmistakable, and Catherine could still remember the red flush of shame which heated up her face. And so, when finally she was ushered into a sunny, spacious room, wallpapered in cheerful yellow, Catherine had to admit to a certain relief when she saw that Livia was its only occupant. Smiling, Livia looked up at once and put aside her fork and knife. Good morning, Catherine. Did you sleep well? Good morning, she replied, nervousness making her sound rather stiff. I'm afraid I'm very late. I'm so sorry. Oh, don't be, please. Breakfast is very informal. Gabriel and Hugo have had theirs and gone out riding, and Granny and Miss Cott have too. They've gone to the hothouse to look at flowers. Catherine took this in, then said, still awkwardly, But am I keeping you from other things? Not at all. I was hoping to have a nice talk together. A little shyly, Livia added, I've never had a cousin, you see, and now I have you and Hugo, which makes me so glad. I expect you have several. Most people seem to have a lot of them. I suppose I do, but I don't know them. Both my parents are estranged from their families. A shadow crossed Livia's pretty face. Families can be so complicated, can't they? Oh, but please forgive me. I'm being a dreadful hostess again. Please help yourself to anything you like from the sideboard. And won't you come sit next to me? A few minutes later, Catherine was settled in her place near Livia. She said, still a little stiff and uncertain, what a charming room this is. Isn't it? It's one of the few rooms in the hall that doesn't need much fixing or renovation. The hall needs a lot of repairs. Livia nodded. It was neglected, you know, for a long time. 
I didn't know. Why? Neither Gabriel nor Granny lived here for many years, and, well, we're here now and determined to make things right. Not just in the hall, of course, but all across the estate and for its people as well. It sounds like a great deal of work. It is. Catherine looked more closely at Livia. You don't seem as if you mind it. Livia laughed. I don't. I enjoy it. For one thing, we're all working together as a family. And I love having a home. A real home, at last. A real home? What do you mean? I grew up in an old ramshackle house that was also neglected. But why was it neglected? The shadow had returned a little to Livia's face. Indifference and money frittered away on other things. I was virtually penniless. How did you receive your education, then, and make your debut in town? Did you have relations to help you? No, and I didn't have a proper debut, either, or any real education until recently. But... Catherine trailed off, embarrassed, having suddenly recalled her mother asking Hugo about Livia in an awful, prying way. Yes, but who is she? No one's ever heard of her. Livia brightened and then laughed. I dare say you're wondering how a little nobody like myself ended up married to one of the ton's most eligible men. Guiltily flushing, Catherine said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have plagued you with so many questions. It was very wrong of me. Oh, I don't mind. It is an improbable story, with a very strange beginning. But what about you and Hugo? How did the two of you meet? We've known each other since childhood. How romantic! And now you've found each other again. Romantic? The truth flew at Catherine with merciless force. It wasn't romantic at all. Hugo had married her for her money, and she had married him for his surname. It was a transaction, and just about as unromantic as you could get. How had she let herself forget it? How could she have drifted so far from the cold, hard facts? She and Hugo were using each other, that's all. The warmth of the morning dissipated, and a painful flood of emotions swamped her, drowning her with sadness. The horror of seeing Hugo's regret, and anger, at herself, at Hugo. What a mess of things, what a mockery they had made, had willingly created and last night had only muddied the already murky waters. Well, he could have the money, but that was all. Nothing else was included in the deal. The deal. Oh, God. Here, in the bright, sharp light of day, she needed to be an island again, a locked box, a closed book. The images flashed through her mind in quick succession, and despite herself she felt a cold, unsettling shiver run down her spine. Think, think, say something, before the silence becomes horribly obvious. Yes, Catherine managed to say to Livia. We found each other again. And quickly she reached for the coffee pot, and ate a roll, and remarked on the freshness of the butter, and admired the pretty floral wallpaper, and talked about the weather, and altogether created such a flow of inane small talk that she could see Livia looking a little puzzled. Oh no, thank you. She wasn't really up for a walk outside, or a tour through the hall. She really was rather tired, actually, and would Livia mind if she went back upstairs to her room and rested a little? After all, even a big pile of money gets tired and wants to go lie down, she thought, but of course didn't say out loud, because it was important to pretend that she was all right, that everything was all right. Of course I don't mind, said Livia. Is there anything I can do for you? No, thank you. And Catherine stood up and went away. It took all she had not to run. It was late afternoon when Hugo opened the door to their bedchamber and went inside. To his surprise, Catherine was there, in bed and propped up on pillows, in the cool sliver of wintry light coming in through only partially opened curtains. He saw her start and press something against her chest a book. He smiled, thinking of last night, and said, Hello. 
Hello, she said, but without returning his smile, and his own began to fade. Are you unwell, Catherine? No. Been reading? Yes. What's the name of your book? Oh, well, it's Pamela. I don't know that one. Enjoying it? I suppose so, she muttered, and he noticed her quick, darting look to the tray set next to her on the bed. A teapot and cup, a large plate half filled with confectionaries, a crumpled napkin. That faint scent of chocolate, sweet, pleasing, came to him. Had tea sent up, then? Yes, she said coldly, lifting her chin, reminding him oddly of a cornered animal. Reminding him, too, of their stilted conversation in the drawing room at Brook House that rainy day last fall, when she gave the distinct impression of heartily wishing him elsewhere. Had they come full circle? Gone back to the beginning where all was obscure and unpromising? Catherine? he said. What's the matter? Nothing. Boxes revealed, boxes concealed. You sure? Very sure. She opened her book, bent her head, and simply went away. That night, alone again in their bedchamber, together in the bed and in the darkness, Hugo tried again. He said, Catherine? Yes? Are you all right? Yes. Would you... Can we... He felt the pull of his desire for her, raw and powerful. He wanted to find her mouth with his own, to hungrily splay his fingers against the small of her back, urging her against him so she could feel how much he wanted her, so she could know how much he wished to please her. Knock, dock, tup, hump. But those playful words from last night seemed wrong, painfully wrong right now. Last night seemed like years ago. May I? Could we? Damn it, he sounded like an idiot. Maybe he was an idiot. No. What's wrong? he said to her. What have I done? There's nothing wrong. Her voice was cool, firm. You've gotten what you wanted, and so have I. Let's just leave it at that. Hugo lifted himself, leaned on an elbow, peering at her. She was only a foot or two away from him, but he didn't know what to do next, or what to say. She was as opaque to him as a sheet of iron. No light could get through. Nothing, 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 she had said. He ground his teeth and wished, not for the first time, that he was one of those men who could easily serve up an elegant phrase, a man from whose lips tumbled paragraphs, pages, speeches, fine orations that could cleave through the knots of this impasse. But he wasn't. He was himself. Silence lay upon them, heavy, dark. In the end, finally, he did nothing. Sleep finally claimed him. And when he woke the next day, once again very early, he saw that at some point in the night, Catherine had crept from the high bed and gone over to the blue bench by the window, where she lay, eyes closed, very still beneath one of her shawls. Nothing. He left the room, favouring ever so slightly his left leg. Catherine heard him go. Once the door was safely closed behind him, the tears began to fall. Oh, God, what had she done? What kind of person would marry for a surname? She wrapped herself more tightly in her shawl, her mind restless, maybe even desperate, searching, hunting for relief, like a bird hoping for a friendly branch on which to alight. Then, London. Yes, that was it. She could look forward to London. Everything would be better there. She'd make a new start. She'd be a different person. And everything would be wonderful. 24th of January, 1812. Dearest Hugo, thank you so much for your note letting us know of your safe arrival at Sermont Hall. 
Forgive my brevity, but your Aunt Claudia is just now getting over an ague, and I've promised to spend the day with her. Bertram comes with me for his lessons with Papa, and Gwendolen has begged for a morning's reprieve as she wants to go next door to Diana's, where, she says, they are going to pretend they are sailors, and has vowed to keep on all day long that splendid hat you gave her. Please send my warmest regards to everyone at the hall. I'm sure you and Catherine are having the most marvellous time there. With much love, Mamma. P.S. Cook says the butcher's wife told her that Brook House has emptied out very nearly overnight, and that her husband regrets the loss of orders, but not the erratic manner of payment. Also, Cook wants me to thank you again for fixing the handle on her favourite pot. It was strange how even though you were completely estranged from your husband, you still got up, still walked and talked and acted as if everything was normal. Catherine sat at her dressing table while Mary, the maidservant who had been helping her, carefully brushed her hair. In the mirror, Catherine could see that from time to time Mary looked rather wistfully at a bottle of scent which was set out on the dressing table, a gift from someone at the wedding, one of father's cronies, which she had never used. The little porcelain bottle was rounded at its base, with a long, narrowing neck, and painted all over with flowers in a fashionable chinoiserie style. Mary, she said, may I give you that scent bottle? Would you like to have it? Mary's face lit up. Oh, ma'am, really? Yes, let me find the box it came in, too. It's very pretty. Catherine pulled open a drawer of the dressing table, then another, and found it in the next drawer she opened. Here it is. She held it in her hand, paused for a moment. It was a tin box, decorated on its lid with more chinoiserie flowers. You could put more in it than just a scent bottle, couldn't you? She remembered suddenly. Her dream from two nights ago. I've forgotten something, but I don't remember what it is. It's something very important. You've got to find it yourself, old Mrs. Penhallow had said in her dream. You won't find it here. Then shut the door to the London townhouse. Puzzled, Catherine stared at the tin box. Then she gave herself a shake, took one of her largest handkerchiefs, wrapped the scent bottle in it, and carefully put it into the tin which she placed on her dressing table. She turned to look up at Mary. For you, she said, and Mary's obvious pleasure in the little gift made tears once again threaten to fall. Chapter 11 Sooner than Catherine could have possibly expected was old Mrs. Penhallow a sorceress with supernatural powers. To Sermont Hall came Madame Hébert and her cadre of helpers, as well as a milliner, a shoemaker, a friseur, and her new dresser, a soft-spoken, agreeable woman named Ellery, as different from Celeste as night from day. The new gowns began in rapid succession to appear. Without hesitation, Catherine said yes to them all. They were as elegant, as ravishing as those worn by the other Penhallow ladies, and in the deep, strong colours that seemed to make her complexion glow. She said yes. Yes to the shoes, the hats, the pelisses, the reticules. Yes, everything. She would be a new, different, better person in them. The days passed. Her trunks filled up again. She spent a great deal of time reading, as if her life depended upon it. How lucky that the magnificent library here was filled with books, actual books, as opposed to the ones at Brook House. Candide, Les Liaisons Dangereuses, The History of Sir Charles Grandison, The Seasons, Sense and Sensibility, written by a lady, and Catherine wondered exactly who that was. Philosophie Zoologique, The Vision of Don Roderick, and all around her, the busy life of Sermont Hall went on. Henrietta Penhallow was absorbed in the preparations for Miss Cott's wedding, and with the recently formed village school for which she was serving as benefactress. If she was considering the idea of a new companion, she made no mention of it. 
Livia oversaw the renovations within the hall, went daily to visit the tenant farmer's families, flitted back and forth from the library and the kitchen to the garden and her poultry yard, and continued her lessons with the head groom, who was teaching her how to drive a pony trap. Though, as she was the first one to admit, her progress was slow, for she was still rather nervous around horses. Hugo spent his days riding out with Gabriel, making himself useful and getting spectacularly dirty in waterlogged fields, ditches and drainage trenches, inspiring Gabriel to admiringly remark upon Hugo's uncanny ability to perceive and solve mechanical problems. Hugo merely shrugged and said, It's just a way of seeing things, cos, that's all. Miss Cott, as always, made herself useful, helped anyone who needed it, watched and listened, and, as ever, kept her observations to herself. It was well into the fourth week of the bridal visit when, on a cold February evening, with the entire party gathered in the Rococo drawing-room, Mrs. Penhallow announced without preamble, looking between Catherine and Hugo, "'Regarding the family townhouse, I am willing to offer it to you as of April 1st, that would be an appropriate time for Penhallows to arrive for the season. You'll wish to engage servants, of course, so I recommend you contact the Dauntry Agency as soon as possible. Also, you will benefit immeasurably from the sponsorship of a, shall we say, a seasoned campaigner. Oh, ma'am, are you coming with us? exclaimed Catherine. She was surprised to find that she welcomed the idea. Wished for it very badly, in fact. But the old lady was shaking her silvery head. I've far too much to do here, and I must, of course, attend Miss Cott's wedding. However, I've written to a relation of mine, the Duchess of Egremont, on your behalf. It's quite convenient, as she and the Duke will soon be arriving in Grosvenor Square. Great Aunt Judith is going to London, said Gabriel. Didn't I hear you once say that both she and the Duke heartily dislike town life? That is so, but Thane is causing such difficulties that, according to Judith, they feel obliged to personally attempt to rein him in. Thane's there, said Hugo. Damn! I mean, blast it! Who is Thane? Livia asked, glancing up from her needlework. Oh, he's a cousin, Liv, and a nuisance. We were at school together. Not, put in Mrs. Penhallow, a true cousin, strictly speaking. Judith is my sister-in-law, she explained to Livia and Catherine, the sister of my late husband, Richard. She married the Duke of Egremont not long after Richard and I were wed. They had only one son who, in due course, married, despite their objections, a widowed lady, Almira Thane, who had a young son of her own. This is the Thane to whom I refer. Philip Thane, who for half a dozen years now has made for himself an unfortunate name with his rackety, dissolute habits, scandalising anyone with even a modicum of decency. I saw him at one of Mrs. Drummond Burrell's parties last year in town, Gabriel said, accepting from Miss Cott a cup of tea. He thanked her and went on. She's a notoriously high stickler, as you know, so I was more than a little surprised that he was there. Mrs. Penhallow sniffed. Thane is notorious for his ability to exert a peculiar fascination upon women, the susceptible ones, that is, who will invite him everywhere. Cannot his stepfather provide a, well, a calming influence, Granny, Livia said, or his mother? His stepfather is dead, I'm sorry to say, and Almira Thane is a pretty, empty-headed woman without a particle of common sense. It's Judith and the Duke who have undertaken to help raise the two children Almira bore after she married their son, as well as, naturally, Thane. They did their best with him, but he proved himself unmanageable from an early age. Well do I know it, remarked Hugo, an unholy terror, loathed by the entire school. What happened to Almira's other children? Livia said. She had set aside her sewing and was holding, thanks to the quiet efficiency of Miss Cott, a plate which held a thick slice of seed cake dotted with caraway seeds and fragrant with cinnamon. 
The boy, I believe, is presently at Eton, replied Mrs. Penhallow, and the girl is being educated at home. This boy, Catherine thought, was the heir to the dukedom, not Philip Thane. She found herself thinking, imagining, young Philip, having lost his father, is swept by his mother's remarriage into a great aristocratic family. One of them, and yet not one of them. Outsiderness. Was that even a word? Maybe if you used it often enough, they'd put it in the dictionary. It was a word she herself knew very well. Oh, all too well. Judith, Mrs. Penhallow said, abruptly recalling Catherine to the conversation, has agreed to act as your guide, as it were, to take you about, ensure that you're introduced to the right people, and so on. Given that Aunt Judith dislikes town life, said Gabriel shrewdly, it's rather interesting she agreed to your request. Everyone watched in fascination as a slow, secretive smile curved the old lady's lips. I once did Judith a great favour. Now she is returning it. What favour, Granny? asked Livia. But Mrs. Penhallow only shook her head and would say no more on the subject. Hugo, watching her, thought how that faintly mischievous expression made her appear years younger. There was no doubt in his mind that Gabriel's marriage to Livia had benefited not just them as a couple, but Aunt Henrietta also. She had softened somehow, had become, well, more human. It was as if some good fairy had waved a wand over the three of them. Which reminded him. He looked now to Gabriel. When you wrote to me last November, cuz, you mentioned an odd little story concerning Livia and yourself. Gabriel, on his face a small, subtle smile, exchanged glances with Livia. He said, In October, when Livia had gone, and I didn't know where she was, I ended up relying on the advice of a local woman, who evidently believes she has mystical abilities. She'd seen something in her tea leaves, she told me, which indicated that I should go toward the ocean. I was desperate, and so off I went. It seems that she was right. I found Livia in Bristol. And you believe this was more than just coincidence? asked Catherine, glancing as if unknowingly into her own half-full teacup. Gabriel didn't immediately answer. He was looking again at Livia, and for a moment Hugo felt as if he was seeing something so powerful, so private, that he ought to turn away his own gaze. Finally, Gabriel said to Catherine, I don't know. I'm not one to ordinarily place credence in such things. I only know that I found Livia, and that it seemed like a miracle. Slowly, Catherine answered, Forgive me, but we live in rational times now, modern times. Those things, those beliefs, well, our scientists say they're the product of a disordered mind. Gabriel laughed. That may be so. I was definitely disordered at the time. Oh, I was too, exclaimed Livia. I had run off, determined to take my fate into my own hands, then ended up in a stupidly anticlimactic way, falling ill with the most horrible fever. Thank God you did, Gabriel told her. Not that I'm glad you were ill, of course, but what you did, well, it woke me up. There was a brief silence. Abruptly, Catherine said, Why did you run off, Livia? It seems so silly now, but at the time it was dreadful, Livia answered. Gabriel and I had had the most ferocious quarrel, and we broke off our engagement. Or, I should say, rather, that he broke it off, in a very high-handed way. I was never so shocked in my life as when I found out, said Aunt Henrietta. Pretty behaviour for a pen hallow, indeed. You weren't wrong to criticise me, Grandmama. In my defence, I was half-crazed. Gabriel gave Catherine a little quizzical smile. You're looking at me as if I have three heads. She blinked and looked rather flustered. I'm very sorry. There's no need to apologise, he replied pleasantly, and turned his attention to the efficient Miss Cott, 
who was passing around further slices of seed cake. Hugo accepted a second serving. Catherine refused with a quick shake of her head and a word of thanks, and then rather dreamily Livia said, That local woman, Mrs. Roger, told me... She paused, her eyes going to Gabriel, in their green depths a sweet glow, then added to the room at large, What I mean is, well, it may be that there's more to life than what we believe we know, or perhaps there's more inside us than we can know. Hugo found himself watching Catherine, upon whose face came again a look of deep abstraction. Very different she'd become in these past weeks, in her new gowns and so forth, with her hair done in a simple, elegant way that revealed the extraordinary beauty of her dark, gleaming curls, which in turn highlighted the dark brilliance of her eyes, the beguiling curves of her cherry lips, all of which he might look upon but not touch. He was staring, Hugo suddenly realised, like a lovesick boy. Speaking of pretty behaviour, said Aunt Henrietta, our relation, Alastair Penhallow, up in the wilds of Scotland, has apparently been conducting a shocking courtship ritual. I am told that he summoned to his castle the eligible high-born maidens of the eight clans of Killally in order that they might engage in a competition for his favour. Like the one for Gabriel last year, said Livia, with a saucy glance at her husband. One hardly cares to imagine replied Aunt Henrietta. The astonishing reports of Alistair's disgraceful mode of life being what they are. Dear me, I do pity the poor woman who becomes his wife. 2nd of March, 1812. Dear Hugo, thanks very much for your letter and the five-pound notes for Frank and me. I spent mine on some maps and a new cricket bat as I cracked my old one, swinging it round in the dormitory. I may have hit the foot of my bed rather hard. And Frank bought a great fat book, Spinoza's Ethics. We're getting on splendidly here, although Greek is dashed annoying. For me, not so much for Frank. Last week, I kicked two goals in wall game, and so we won. About the Lent half holiday, Owen Fitzclarence has invited us to go home with him to Northamptonshire. He's a cousin of sorts, which makes it all right, doesn't it? Capital fellow, I assure you, and wants me to tell you he's not at all like his half-brother Philip Thane, who he says is a rotter. Also, Owen's grandparents have quite a lot of horses, and he says he'll teach me how to jump. He is the heir to a dukedom, which seems rather funny as he is only thirteen, like Frank and me, and exceedingly short. Owen also wants me to let you know his old tutor, Mr Dawkins, is coming to get him and will be with us the whole time. Do say yes. Faithfully yours, Percy. P.S. One of the older boys told us a ripping story he'd heard about you stuffing a drain with a handkerchief and causing a tremendous flood in the maths classroom. Is it true? 13th March, 1812. Dear Hugo, thank you for your letter. Yes, Owen did write to the Duke and myself, and I think it's a lovely idea for your brothers to accompany him home for the holiday. Owen will enjoy it so much. Mr Dawkins is a thoroughly conscientious young man and will take good care of the boys. We look forward to seeing you and Catherine in town very soon. Cordially, Cousin Judith. 22nd of March, 1812. Dear Hugo, Percy and I were very pleased to receive your letter. Yes, of course we'll behave ourselves at Owen's or I suppose I should say, more realistically, that we'll try hard to. Thank you for those ten-pound notes. One feels very grown up having money for travelling expenses. By the way, Percy wants me to add that you never answered about that flood in the maths classroom. I asked one of the prefects about it, and he only grinned and didn't answer. Qui tacit consentir vide tour, as the Latin proverb goes. He who is silent, when he ought to have spoken and was able to, is taken to agree. Would a single handkerchief have been sufficient to entirely stop a drain? One wonders. Yours most faithfully, Francis.
On a bright, frosty day, in which the barest hint of spring was in the air, Catherine stood on the porch to Sir Mont Hall with old Mrs. Penhallow, Livia, and Miss Cott. The last of her trunks had been loaded into the carriages. Her dresser, Ellery, had already taken her seat in the carriage they were to share. Catherine had said goodbye to Livia and Miss Cott, and now she turned to Mrs. Penhallow. Thank you again for your hospitality, ma'am, and all your guidance. I'm very grateful to you. I hope you enjoyed your time here. I did indeed, ma'am. The old lady looked keenly at her, but only said, Give Judith and the Duke my warmest regards. I will, ma'am. Well, goodbye. Catherine started to turn away, but Mrs. Penhallow said, Wait, ma'am. A few words of advice, said the old lady. Not that I've always followed them myself, I'm sorry to say, but for whatever it's worth, to thine own self be true. Hamlet, said Catherine, trying to summon a smile. Yes, goodbye, and good luck. Catherine nodded, suppressing once again a mad, possibly desperate impulse to hug Mrs. Penhallow, then went down the steps to the gravelled carriage sweep. Gabriel had gone with Hugo to where his horse stood ready, and they were saying their farewells. A footman helped her up into her carriage. Hugo swung up on his horse, and so began the long-awaited journey to London. They sat at dinner at a luxurious inn in Newbury, without speaking, wordless. Hugo looked at Catherine in her elegant gown of vivid blue, seeming very cool and composed to him, like a sculpture you might see in a museum or, for that matter, in Sermont Hall, all gorgeously composed and still, remote and untouchable. There came to him a memory. The two of them were on the beach. It was early morning. The sky was filled with great hurrying clouds, and the wind had whipped around them, ruffling her blue dress with insistent force. It was the day he was to leave for Eton, and on her face had been such grief, even he, a lanky, gawky boy of twelve, could see it, that in a way it was worse than if she had openly wept. Well, goodbye then, Kate, he had said, hating his own inarticulateness. Goodbye, Hugo, she managed to say in a small voice, though he could barely hear it over the whipping wind. He had hesitated. He went a step closer and clumsily put his arms around her. She'd reached her own arms just as clumsy around his neck, and awkwardly they had embraced just for a moment and then stepped apart. Well, father's waiting for me, he'd said. Goodbye again. Goodbye. He ran back toward his house, stopping once to look back and lift a hand in farewell. How small she looked on the shore, how tiny against the vast backdrop of the ocean and sky. Her blue dress looked just like a piece of the sky. She lifted her hand, he turned away, and was gone. How strange, he now thought, to have remembered that moment from so long ago. How long had she stood there before trudging back to her house next door? The waiter came with the roast pheasant, and he accepted some and began to eat it. But the image of Kate on the beach, very small, stayed fixed in his mind. Four days later, as Catherine walked up the steps to the Penhallow townhouse, she found herself strangely relieved to see that the front door wasn't made of solid gold. Her dream had been wrong, though she continued to be dogged by that faint ghost-like sense of something missing, no matter that Ellery assured her that nothing had been lost along the way. The door opened, a butler greeted them, and they went inside. Here were other members of the hired staff, all very pleasant and competent-seeming. Next, the housekeeper took her around. It was no surprise to see that it was a magnificent dwelling, furnished and decorated in a spare, elegant, neoclassical style, with the first floor featuring a morning room, a dining room, a library, 
and various other saloons. Upstairs were the bedrooms, and in the bustle of arrival, with Hugo seeing to the horses and the carriages over at the mews, and the many trunks being ferried up the stairs, and maidservants coming and going, it was easy to discreetly communicate to the housekeeper about the need for two separate bedchambers. Shortly she was ushered into a spacious, high-ceilinged room, very handsome and comfortable, with a door that, she learned a little later, when she was alone, connected it to Hugo's bedchamber. She knew, because she tried the knob, as stealthy as any spy bent on dark deeds, and peeked into it. And she searched her own room until she found the key, slung on a green silk ribbon, in a drawer of the table next to her bed, after which she quietly locked the door. Still later, she told herself, Well, everything is going splendidly. She had looked over the heap of correspondence already awaiting her, including a note from the Duchess of Egremont, who indicated her desire to call tomorrow, and together they would craft a plan for the week. Would Catherine and Hugo care to attend an evening party at Lady Jersey's house? And what about a ball on Saturday at the Headleys? Also, Catherine put down the note and looked around the sumptuous bedchamber. Yes, everything was going splendidly. She had dreamed of this moment for quite some time. Everything was working out just as she had hoped. She wondered a little why she didn't feel happier. Maybe she was just tired from the journey. Tomorrow, tomorrow would be better. The Duchess was coming for one thing, and also she was going to Rundle and Bridge to purchase new jewellery for herself. But oddly, as it turned out, it didn't seem better, even though she had had a pleasant time with the Duchess, a tall, thin, elderly lady, vigorous, blunt-spoken, weather-beaten and horse-obsessed, an undemanding conversationalist with a slightly distracted air, which Catherine attributed to her concern over her quasi-grandson, the notorious Thane. His mother, Almira Thane, had accompanied the Duchess. She was, as old Mrs. Penhallow rightly said, a pretty middle-aged woman, tremulous, chattery, easily moved to tears and just as easily cheered. And now here Catherine stood before a counter at London's premier jewellers, waited upon by not only two attentive clerks, but also by Mr. Bridge himself. When the Brooks last year sallied into the store, occasionally a second clerk joined the first in order to help with the Brooks's many purchases. But never did Mr. Bridge join them. For Mrs. Hugo Penhallow, however... Why, that was a very different thing, Catherine knew. She looked at the glittering necklaces, the pretty aigrettes, the sparkling rings, bracelets, brooches and ear bobs. She could choose anything she wanted. Nobody to tell her she must have this or that. Now was her chance. She thought about all those new gowns at the townhouse, carefully unpacked and stowed away by Ellery. One wore jewellery with such gowns. It was expected. Everyone did it. Father had provided her with a great deal of money. She could afford to buy half the store if she wished. Catherine lowered shoulders which she realised had been held rather high. Yes, she said, pointing to this and that. Yes, and again, and again. Lady Jersey's crowded, brightly lit drawing room. Noisy, cheerful even a little raucous. The scents of perfumes, sweat, tobacco, intermingling, servants everywhere, bearing trays of champagne and lemonade, nimbly making their way among the guests, who gathered together in clusters large and small. Hugo watched as Catherine, striking in her crimson gown and rubies, stood in the centre of a group of people, talking, laughing, he watched until his own attention was claimed, and he turned away. She was pretending to be a former schoolmate of hers, Lydia St. John. All sleek, well-dressed confidence she had been at the Basingstoke Academy. A great many girls, hoping to please her, 
went to her with secrets, gossip, the latest on D, all of which she would receive with a hard gleam in her eye, judging, evaluating, and, if sufficiently interesting or damaging, she would laugh, then ruthlessly pass them along. Oh, my dear Mrs. Penhallow, someone said, have you heard about Colonel McKinnon? At Covent Garden last week, he circled the entire theatre by running along the boxes and knocking off as many of the ladies' hats as he could. A most diverting feat. Quite acrobatic. Yes, and don't forget that banquet at the Lord Mayor's, somebody else put in, in a voice unstable with laughter. Colonel McKinnon stuck his head in a bowl of punch and kicked his feet into the air. He insisted on having the punch served after, too. How very droll, Catherine answered, adding a lilting note into her own voice, pretending to be amused, and suppressing the thought, What an ass! The Headley's Ball Herself in a gown of fine, soft violet silk, with more partners for the dances than she could possibly accept. Here she was, moving through the intricate steps of the quadrille with Mr. Headley himself, one of the ton's leading lights, a close friend of the king, and, as he himself had earlier confessed, an ardent devotee of paleontology. He said, as the dance brought them together again, You have heard, perhaps, that a complete skull of some lizard-like creature was found last year in Lyme Regis by a twelve-year-old girl thought to be thousands of years old, most impressive, William Bullock's displaying it on Piccadilly Street and refuses to sell it. Under other circumstances, Catherine would have been interested. An ancient lizard skull, the remarkable little girl who had discovered it. But tonight, she was pretending to be Countess Leven, that incredibly haughty patroness of Almax, and so she only gave a single nod of her head and looked away and saw that Hugo was dancing with the beautiful Mrs. Waring, who wore a daringly low-cut dress of diaphanous yellow silk. It was not, somehow, a particularly agreeable sight. A strange, twisty feeling stirred within her. It took her a few moments to realise that it was jealousy. "'How superbly you dance, Captain Penhallow,' said Mrs. Waring, particularly for such a, such a large man. In her voice was insinuation, an invitation too, perhaps, confirmed when she added, We must get to know each other better. I'm sure my husband would love nothing more himself, but unfortunately he's in Sussex for the season. There's some problem with his cattle, the blackleg disease or some other nasty thing. Cattle breeding is positively a mania with my dear Samuel. He's very passionate about it. Mrs. Waring smiled up into his face. I'm at home on Thursday afternoon. All alone, I dare say. Hugo felt himself, felt his body, respond. What man wouldn't? Mrs. Waring was an attractive woman. Willing. Eager. He glanced across the gleaming hardwood floor. There was Catherine, chin lifted proudly, dancing with Lawrence Headley as though she hadn't a care in the world. It seemed difficult, impossible, to remember the Catherine who lay in her bed at that inn, exhausted and ill, stretching out a hand to be clasped, or the Catherine who had, at Sermont Hall, given herself to him with such sweet abandon. The black, sorrowful sow threatened once more. A siren song now tempted. Quite a few men of the Beaumont, in his position, would have accepted Mrs. Waring's invitation without a second thought. Here again, if he were a different sort of person, if he were to change himself into another kind of man, with a more loosely held set of morals, he would say yes, and go to her house on Thursday, and, very probably, as often as he liked. No one need ever know. Hugo looked down again at Mrs. Waring. Thank you, he said, but I've another engagement that afternoon. And luckily, it was true. Cousin Judith was considering the purchase of a pair of carriage horses, matched bays, a 
and wanted to consult with him about it. So, at least, some sort of small consolation. He didn't have to lie. Chapter 12 28th of May, 1812 Ma chère Catherine, according to the newspapers, the court announcements, and the reports of our wide and illustrious acquaintance here in Bath, so extraordinarily well informed they are, you and le plus cher Hugo have been in London nearly two months, and in the Penhallow townhouse, no less. Felicitations à vous! Naturally, I should have liked to hear from you directly, but I dare say you are très occupé with countless engagements. We are told that you are seen everywhere under the aegis of the Duke and Duchess of Egremont, at Almax, at Carlton House, at the most exclusive dinner parties, assemblies, breakfasts, and balls. Bien joué! Your father and I are, naturellement, extremely busy ourselves, as we receive more invitations than we could possibly accept. We, too, are seen everywhere, at the assemblies, concerts, lectures, fashionable excursions, et comme ça. I declare I am all a whirl, and next year, pour être sûr, London. I remain, etc., mother. P.S. Your father wishes me to inform you that last week he received a cheque for £4,300 from the Batavia Jakarta Joint Stock Company, its annual dividend for a £500 investment. He thinks you and Cher Hugo ought to invest also, before the initial sum requirement is raised. Slowly, Catherine put down Mother's letter, on top of an untidy sheaf of other correspondence, circulars, and a great many invitations. She pulled open a drawer of the dressing table at which she sat, taking from it a box from Fessler's Confectionaries that Ellery had just brought earlier this afternoon. She opened it. It was filled with rich, thick chocolate conserves. She ate one. It was delicious. Then she ate another one, her gaze sweeping around her bedchamber as to her came again that vague, nickling sensation of having lost something, forgotten something. She ate another conserve. Her gaze fell on a stack of books on a small table next to her bed. They were new. She'd purchased dozens and dozens of them, and there were similar stacks all around the room. Novels, poetry, travelogues, plays, and more, each and every one lovingly added to its own growing tower. How enticing they looked! But, ironically, she'd had no time to read. Virtually all her waking hours were devoted to the demands of her new life, her new self. Being dressed, her hair being done, the frisure coming and going, changing this gown for that one, and changing that for the next one. You couldn't wear the dress you wore on morning calls when you went out for a carriage ride, and of course you had to wear something else for a dinner party or a ball, and everything required different shoes, different stockings, different wraps, different hats. A sigh escaped her, and she took up from her correspondence pile a large gold-edged card of invitation. Tonight she and Hugo were to dine with a select party of guests at Lord and Lady de Witt's, and attend the ball there that was to follow. Everyone said it was going to be the biggest, most important event of the season. Lady de Witt herself had come to call, bringing the invitation and expressing her hope that the Penhallows would deign to come. Catherine ate two more conserves and put the box back in the drawer. Who, she wondered, was she going to pretend to be tonight? At those parties and balls, breakfasts and picnics, about which Mother had written so approvingly, she had already tried being Queen Charlotte, calm, civil, a little distant, Esther from the Bible, supremely tactful and courageous, Lady Caroline Lamb, high-spirited and vivacious, Portia in The Merchant of Venice, brilliant and high-minded, she had even tried to be the Prince Regent, good-natured, courteous, full of expansive bonhomie. Occasionally, dangerously, 
she had let the mask slip, in a bookshop, wandering through an art gallery, a quiet moment of conversation here and there. But tonight, she told herself, she was going to hold firm. Who would she be? The DeWitt's dinner party. A massive table, crowded with intricate centerpieces of spun sugar, tall, dripping candles, flowers in Venetian blown glass vases, dozens of glasses, silver flatware, rich and heavy in the hand. Another lavish meal. Elaborate courses almost beyond counting. You could eat until your stomach swelled, drink wine until you quite literally sloshed. Hugo looked at his gold-rimmed plate and found himself wishing, with a startling intensity, for something to do. Something real. A sluice to fix, a jammed musket to repair, a ship's rigging to climb. He'd almost be willing to jump off a roof into a rain barrel. <laughs> Captain Penelo, said the lady to his left, smiling and dimpling, the feathers in her headdress fluttering wildly. When I realised I was to sit next to you, a Penhello, I nearly went into palpitations. Such a privilege. I had no idea you'd be so tall, so regal. Has anyone ever told you that you look just like a Greek god? Yes, Hugo said baldly, then instantly regretted it. Luckily, the lady to his left didn't even seem to notice. Her eyes were roving over him with a kind of greedy awe that made him want to either laugh or fling over the entire table with a roar. A damned good clatter it would make, too. Catherine was standing in the DeWitt's magnificent ballroom, conscious that she was looking her best in an exquisite gown of deep forest green. Around her neck and wrists, tasteful, elegant chains of sparkling emeralds. She stood as part of a large and jovial crowd, talking and laughing, laughing and talking. How happy she was, she told herself. How very, very happy. Extremely happy. No one in the entire history of the world had ever been happier than she. She was jostled then by someone passing by, and reflexively, she turned to see a young woman all in white who said, I do beg your pardon, it's such a squeeze. And then, why? Catherine, Catherine Brooke. The voice was familiar, and with a shock that seemed to rattle her bones, Catherine recognised at once the Honourable Lydia St. John, in whose bed at the Basingstoke Select Academy for Young Ladies, she had, on that fatal day, placed a large handful of wiggling, dirt-encrusted worms, instigating a scene and a punishment of epic proportions. Lydia St. John, so popular and self-assured, who, in a soft, sweet voice, continually teased her about her grandfather, the miner, who, one day, took her handkerchief and rubbed it on Catherine's cheek and said so that everyone in the room could hear, Oh, dear, Miss Brooke, you've got coal dust on your cheek, but I'm afraid, dear Miss Brooke, it will never come clean. And that was when, in a scarlet haze of fury, Catherine had stalked into the garden and begun digging her fingers into damp earth in a single-minded quest for revenge. Well, well, well. Putting worms in someone's bed was one thing, but this, this was a gift laid at her feet. A singular moment in which it all came together, a moment when she, at last, need no longer feel inferior to the girl who had tormented her year after year, whose sweet voice had made her sometimes sit in her room with her hands pressed over her ears in a futile attempt to drown out what Lydia had that day said. Catherine felt a smile curl her lips. She answered, You are mistaken, Miss St. John. I am Mrs. Penhallow now. Mrs. Penhallow? Lydia St. John stared, her eyes gone as round as buttons. I... I didn't know. I've been in the West Indies, you see, with my brother and his family. We've only just returned. The West Indies, Catherine said casually. It's very sunny there, I believe. Sunny? Yes. Very. 
Catherine nodded. Within her was such giddy anticipation that she almost felt as if she were vibrating with it, as if, from above, mapping out the scene, she could see herself reaching with perfect nonchalance into her deep green satin reticule, pulling from it a fine linen handkerchief which, in front of everybody, she gently, oh, so gently, brushed against the smooth cheek of Lydia St. John, not quite the alabaster shade it had been three years ago, and Lydia blanching, and then she would turn her back on Lydia in a cut direct, and Lydia would melt away in shame and humiliation, as if she never was and never had been. It was, in fact, just the sort of thing a villainous character in a novel would do, hurtful and unkind. Was that really who she was? She, herself, not Elena de Rosalba, or Lady Caroline Lamb, or Queen Charlotte, not Hatshepsut, or Esther, or Thomas Cromwell, or Richard III, or Wu Zixian. Who was she? Her hand, Catherine noticed as if from afar, was sliding into her reticule. Even with gloves on, she could feel how cool and smooth was the satin. There, there was her handkerchief, soft, delicate, on it, she knew, embroidered in silken thread, the letters K.P. She pulled it out. Looked at it as if never, ever in her life had she seen a handkerchief. Who was she? Was she really like a nasty character in a novel? A character about whom you'd be glad when bad things happened to her? And if so, what sort of sorry heroine would that be? not a heroine at all. Catherine looked up and over at the Honourable Lydia St. John, abruptly aware of the lights and the music, the chatter and the laughter all around them. Too bright, too loud. She felt shaky, weak, desperate to get away, to go sit down somewhere quiet, where she could think, reflect, breathe. But there was something she had to do first. So she put her handkerchief back into her reticule, and she said to Lydia St. John, Sonny, yes, how delightful. I do hope you had a nice stay there. There. She had done it. She had been civil, polite, not villainous. That was not who she was. She could go now. But a tall, beefy man with a big, ruddy face had borne down upon them and taken Lydia's upper arm in a firm grip and was saying to her with a heartiness that somehow grated in Catherine's ears, Been holding out on me, hey? Didn't know you were friendly with Mrs. Penhallow, the Mrs. Penhallow. Yes, said Lydia, looking rather smaller all at once. We were at school together. Mrs. Penhallow... May I introduce to you my brother, Dennis St. John? An honour, ma'am, said Dennis St. John, looking very much as if he wanted to seize Catherine's hand and press it hard, or, worse, kiss it. Catherine clenched her fingers on the silken strings of her reticule, which perhaps deterred him, but still he went on, undaunted. Yes, indeed, quite the honour to meet you. Well, isn't this cosy? you knowing little Lydia here. Speaking of honour, you know I'm an honourable, of course. My father's a baron. Not that that's anything to a pen hallow, naturally, but still, it's not nothing. Been in Jamaica, you know, overseeing the family plantation. Brought Lydia along. A planter friend of mine had expected, well, that's neither here nor there. Dare say the two of you will be wanting to renew your friendship, hey? go for drives in Hyde Park, strolls through Richmond, that sort of thing. Let the world know and all that. He gave Lydia's arm a squeeze, and she opened her mouth to reply, but was interrupted yet again when the Earl of Westonbury came to Catherine's side, reminded her that she was promised to him for the country dance, which had begun to form, and she was swept away, leaving the St. John's behind. She and the Earl had nearly joined the set, and Catherine saw Hugo escorting his partner, Lady de Courcy, onto the floor. Her ladyship looked up at him, smiling, her arm intimately through his. Catherine's heart gave a hard thump, and she put her hand to her chest, 
as if to subdue a painful, twisty ache. For a wild, rash moment, she wanted to dart over there, shove pretty Lady de Courcy aside, and take her place in the dance with Hugo. But even if she really intended to do such a deranged thing, she didn't know if she had the strength for it, as her legs still had that odd, trembly feeling. The noise of the ballroom seemed almost to be hurting her ears. She paused and said, not as Shakespeare's Portia or Elena de Rizalba or Cardinal Wolsey, but as someone who ached for a moment of quiet. She said to the earl, My lord, would you excuse me? I'm afraid I'm a little tired and must sit down. Of course, Mrs. Penhallow, said the earl at once. May I bring you some rat of fear or lemonade? No, she answered, trying to smile. Thank you, my lord. I'm just going to... If you'll excuse me. And she slipped away to the open French doors, out onto the terrace. Oh, it was cooler here, blessedly quieter. But there were still other people about, so she went down the shallow, broad steps onto a graveled path, went past the ornamental garden with its beautifully tended shrubs and large plashing fountain, then alongside the lengthy, narrow kitchen garden, and finally, her steps slowing, she came to the DeWitt stables. It was quiet, calm, deserted. A horse nickered, another horse answered, and then there was blessed silence. Toward the end of the building was a wooden bench, and gratefully Catherine sank down upon it, propped elbows in her lap, let her forehead sink onto open palms. Her mind was whirling with images, coming at her faster than she could process them. Hugo dancing with Lady de Courcy, dancing with Mrs. Waring, and so many others in other dances at other balls, so many of them these past weeks in London, attractive, charming women looking up into Hugo's face with an eager willingness. She, Catherine, had observed it time and time again, as if watching a play from the very top tier, very far from the stage as if it didn't matter to her. She had looked, but she had not seen. Catherine repressed a groan, her forehead drooping heavily onto her palms. Our very eyes, said Shakespeare, are sometimes, like our judgments, blind. Yes, she had been blind, willfully, stubbornly blind. Oh, Philip, came a woman's voice from around the corner of the stable, followed by a low, breathy laugh, and Catherine, startled, lifted her head. She had been sure she was alone. The woman went on, Do hurry up, my husband will notice I'm gone. It's just this cursed slip of yours getting in the way, Letitia. I'm Lucretia. Whatever you say, my dear. Ah, here we go. You're tearing it. Must you cat all, Letitia? You spoil my concentration. It's Lucretia. The woman's voice rose to a muffled shriek, then subsided into a gratified moan, and Catherine belatedly realized what was happening just around the corner. Rapidly, she stood up, and the bench gave a rather loud and piercing creak. She froze. Philip, stop, came the woman's voice, urgent now. Did you hear that? There's someone near. So what? I don't mind an audience. I do. Stop it. Very well. What a bore you are, Letitia. I wish I could remember why I took up with you in the first place. You, you cad. And it's Lucretia. A few moments later, the woman, skirts more or less in place, flounced around the stable's corner, checked for a moment when she saw Catherine, then hurried past her, head down, toward the DeWitt mansion, even as her partner sauntered into view, calling, Sorry about the slip, before stopping, and, rather than scurrying away in embarrassment, looking Catherine up and down, with a lazy, brazen lack of hurry. He was a tall, loose-limbed man, dark-haired and dark-eyed, seeming to be in his late twenties, not conventionally handsome, but there was something about his sublime confidence that caught the eye, as if he was so pleased with himself, he was sure you would be too. Ah, oh, hello, he said, 
Like to eavesdrop on other people's naughty activities, do you? Catherine was so taken aback by his entire attitude, so suddenly annoyed, that instead of prudently retreating, she instead answered rather snappishly, As a matter of fact, I don't. Really? Still, it wasn't very nice of you to hang about like that. It wasn't very nice of you to pursue a married woman. He came closer. You're straight-laced, eh? I'm none of your business, that's what I am. I think you ought to be. He was closer now, closer than he should be, and Catherine could almost feel his rakish charm, smooth, oleaginous, rolling over her as he again swept his dark gaze over her in a highly improper manner. You're like a ripe little pear, he remarked, juicy and delicious. Of course, the green of your gown doesn't quite work with the metaphor. It's a simile. Whatever you say, my dear. I'm glad you're not wearing yellow. You'd look more pear-like, but also, I fear, jaundiced. Really, the only solution is to take your gown off. Take my gown off? She didn't know whether to laugh or to spit in his eye. Do you need some help? Chivalry is not dead, you know. Allow me. He was actually crouching down, reaching for the hem of her dress, and Catherine was so surprised by his casual audacity that even though her brain was saying, kick him, and hard, her body was still a few beats behind. She felt his hand on her ankle, and in a rather muddled way managed to say, stop it. Surely you don't mean that, he said with the same smooth confidence, and just as his hand began to slide up her leg, he was whisked up and away from her and set on his feet as easily as an adult might remove a small, troublesome child from a place where he ought not to be. Hugo had done it. Hugo. He was here. He had found her and she was safe. With Hugo, she always felt safe. Always. He said to the other man, She told you to stop. And his deep voice was very calm, but within it was a distinctive timbre that made Catherine's eyes go wide. The other man resettled his coat and nodded in the most amicable way at Hugo. Oh, hello. I haven't seen you in ages. Didn't you go off to our benighted former colonies? Meet any interesting women there? I hear those American ladies are quite an armful. What, said Hugo, is going on here? What's going on, replied the other man with unimpaired sang-froid, is that I was in the midst of an intimate encounter, and you're getting in my way. An intimate encounter? Why, you, you nasty, despicable marmot, Catherine exclaimed, gathering her scattered wits. He's lying, Hugo, I assure you. Oh, you know each other. Is this an assignation? Hugo, I extend to you my felicitations. She's charming, a little too fierce for my tastes, to own the truth, but still a prime article. Hugo's jaw was now visibly clenched. I don't care to hear my wife described like that, Thane. Your wife, echoed the other man, even as Catherine gaped and said, Your Thane? He executed a low bow with an extravagant sweep of his arm, as would a gallant of the old French court. Philip Thane at your service, my dear Mrs. Penhallow. Ha, huh, she said rudely, adding in a severe tone, your grandparents have been looking for you, you know. I do know, and that's why I've been laying low for the past several weeks. I don't care to be scolded or, in the case of my mamma, wept over. But when the wealthy and willing Letitia summoned me here, how could I resist her wiles? It's Lucretia. Whatever you say, my dear. It's coming to me, by the way, that you look a little familiar. Weren't you at a party last year, hosted by the rather common Mrs. Spindlow? If I recall correctly, you wore diamonds, rubies, and pearls. Frankly, it was too much. I was going to talk to you, thinking you might benefit from a little kindly advice about your ensemble, but then I heard who you were. Roland Brooks' daughter, aren't you? She scowled. Yes. I took nearly a hundred pounds off him that night at Piquet. 
He fancies himself quite the Captain Sharp. If I were you, I'd tell him to leave off the cards. When I desire your counsel, Mr. Thane, Catherine said coldly, I'll be sure to inform you. Oh, do call me Philip. We're more or less cousins after all. He swung around to Hugo. So, you caught yourself an heiress, eh? That's very well done of you. Speaking of heiresses, I've got my eye on a promising one myself. Only her cursed parents have carried her off to Tunbridge Wells, and I'm a trifle low on travel funds at the moment. Any chance you could lend me a small sum now you're rolling in the stuff? A few hundred pounds would set me up nicely. Hugo gave him a level look. As it's well known that you never pay back a loan, Thane, I'm more likely to give you a good drubbing. Philip Thane raised his hands as if appeasing an armed opponent. Never mind, my dear Hugo, never mind. It was merely a request. Well, I'll leave you two lovebirds alone to enjoy the moonlight. Do try to avoid creating a scandal. That's my purview, after all. He smiled breezily. It was a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Penhallow, and may I compliment you on your greatly improved appearance. Good night. And with that, he loped past Hugo and away toward the house, the sound of his shoes crunching on gravel, rapidly fading away. Catherine said quickly, Oh, Hugo, you know he was lying, don't you, with his ridiculous story of an assignation? Hugo didn't answer for a moment. He was hearing again Thane's insouciant congratulations. So you caught yourself an heiress, eh? That's very well done of you. The words were a stiletto, worming their way inside him, sharp and wounding. Now he wished he had given Thane a drubbing, if only for the sake of relieving his own feelings, if only to forget for a moment that he was on a lonely dark road going nowhere. He said to Catherine, Yes, I believe you. Shall we go in? She remained very still, her brilliant eyes huge in her face as she looked up at him. Would you, would you like to stay here for a little while, and we could talk? More talking, more words. What good could words possibly do? I think not, said Hugo. Westenbury told me you were tired. Are you feeling more refreshed? Allow me to take you in. He spoke to her with kind courtesy, the sort of politeness he would extend to, well, anyone really. And so. They went in. Chapter 13 Catherine was in her room, Hugo was in his. In the hallway, a little earlier, having returned from the DeWitt's ball, they had parted as they always did. He had said good night to her with that same civil, distant tone that seemed to turn her blood to ice. Why had he begun talking to her in that way? She hated it. Still in her beautiful green gown, Catherine was sitting on the floor, next to one of her tall stacks of books, from which she had carefully extracted a certain volume, very large and heavy. Set it on her thighs, opened it. Shakespeare. The complete plays. That line about blindness. Where it had appeared. Was it Titus Andronicus? Julius Caesar? Cymbeline? She began scanning the pages by the flickering light of a single candle. Searching, searching. Our very eyes are sometimes, like our judgments, blind. When she reached page 28, Catherine realized just how absurd a task she had set before herself, given how small the type was, and that there were some six hundred pages to go. She pressed on. When she got to page 43, she realised that she was tired. Oh, so tired. When she got to page 47, she realised that for the last thirty pages or so, she hadn't really even read anything. Because the truth was that she didn't want to be sitting here on the cold floor, flipping pointlessly, hopelessly, through a book of Shakespeare's plays. The truth was that there was some other place she wanted to be wanted it more badly than she had ever wanted anything in her life. 
So she set the book aside and stood up and went to the table next to her bed, where she found the key on its green ribbon, noticing without surprise, as if it were meant to be, how precisely it matched the green of her gown. And then, quietly, she went to the door that separated her room from Hugo's, and quietly, carefully, she unlocked it. She pushed the door open a little and peeked inside. It was dark in Hugo's room. She could just barely see him in his bed. He was there, thank God. He was there. Catherine blew out her candle and softly, padding on stockinged feet, went into his room, went to the unoccupied side of the bed, and very quietly crawled underneath the covers. Her heart was beating hard, hard within her so loud in her own ears that she was surprised the noise of it didn't wake Hugo. Now that her eyes had adjusted to the darkness, she could see that he slept on his side, facing her, one bare arm flung over the bedclothes. She looked, as if for the very first time at him, at the strong lines of his face, that perfect straight nose, the firm jaw, his hair, slightly rumpled, which in the light would shine like gold. Catherine looked, and this time she hoped, she saw. She didn't know what the morning would bring, if Hugo even wanted her there, if there would be an uncomfortable, painful, possibly devastating scene. But for now, at this moment, in this time and in this place, she was exactly where she needed to be. He was dreaming of chocolate, the sweet, tantalising scent of it in his nostrils, teasing him, filling him with desire. Hugo stirred, brushed aside a great handful of curly hair from his face, snugged his arm over a plump silken hip. Vaguely was he aware of a feeling of contentment, rightness, of being alone no longer. He smiled a little and let himself drift back into a deep, untroubled sleep. It was only a tapping, knuckles on a wood door that brought him awake, that made him realise that he lay body to body with Catherine, who, sleeping on her side with her back pressed against him, still wore her green dress from last night. Surprise came first, and then desire flamed again, the quick rush of lust, but there was nothing to be done as, standing on the threshold to their connecting rooms, was a maidservant with a tray which she balanced on her forearm, using her other arm to tap again on the open door, her eyes very wide with the surprise, Hugo supposed, of finding her mistress in bed with her husband. Who could blame her? It was an unprecedented event. I brought the chocolate, sir, the maidservant said, like I do every morning. Where shall I put it, sir? On the table next to me, please, he answered and she complied, then bobbed a curtsy and went back to the connecting door, closing it so slowly and with her eyes fixed upon them with such fascination that he wanted to laugh. He sat up and poured chocolate from its little silver pitcher into the delicate china cup. Catherine, he said, and he watched as she stirred, sighed, and then turned onto her back and looked up at him. Her hair, still with its green silk ribbons and jewelled ornaments, was in a wild, tangled tumble, and he could see that she had on her emerald necklace from last night, lying twisted on her collarbone. Her mouth curved in a dreamy smile, and she said, as if it was the most natural thing in all the world, Hello. Hello, he answered, just as easily, as if this was something they said to each other every morning in bed and added, here's your chocolate. She looked at the cup, then back at him. You first. Are you sure? Yes. Thanks, then. He took a sip. Warm, sweet, wonderful. It reminds me of you. What does? Chocolate. The scent of it. Here. He held out the cup, and Catherine sat up to accept it. Her green ball gown was rumpled, the neckline was askew, 
and one puffed sleeve had slid haphazardly down to reveal the soft white skin of her shoulder. She looked, he thought, wonderful. She sipped at the chocolate, then held the cup out to him. Your turn. But it's yours. Let's share it. She was sitting very straight, and he saw that her expression was no longer sleepy, dreamy, but alert, determined. He took the cup. Thanks. You're welcome. Hugo, I have something I want to tell you. She reminded him suddenly of how she'd been that night at the inn, words wanting to spill out about that ghastly school of hers, the music instructor, the so-called reflection room. Boxes concealed, boxes revealed, he said. What is it, Catherine? She had flushed a vivid red. Hugo, sometimes I have a scent of chocolate about me because, well, I like to eat it. Oh, is that why? Yes. Her face was even redder, her lips compressed, and so, in the spirit of helpfulness, it seemed only decent of him to add, I like chocolate also. Yes, but I like it very much. I too. No, I mean, I like it a lot. So might a shamed penitent in the confessional admit to criminal acts. He said, Is there anything wrong with that? I've been known to eat spring lamb till I was ready to burst. Yes, but I love chocolate. And so? He handed her back the cup. She stared into it, then up at him, and hurriedly said, as if afraid her nerve would fail her. My mother told me I couldn't have it. I've been sneaking it for years. It seemed, on the face of it, rather a small thing. But then again, you couldn't know unless you walked in another person's shoes. If you expected I'd be shocked, I'm not. She was silent. Then, have you ever done anything like that? He smiled, just a little. Surely you've not forgotten the time I tried to sneak a pair of impures into my dormitory. Oh, she knit her brows. Yes, I remember. You told me about it the night before we arrived at Sermont Hall. I was a trifle drunk, as I recall. You were well on the way. Hope you won't feel bad about that, either. There's so much to feel bad about. Catherine gave another sigh, on her face now an expression of such sadness that he seemed to feel it within himself, heavy and dark. She went on, Do you want to hear about my books? Your books? You feel bad about them also? I've been sneaking them for years, too. You remember my maid, Celeste? Yes, of course. We had our own little smuggling scheme, books and chocolates. I paid her, and somehow she got them for me. Whatever I wanted, from all over the country, even from abroad. Hugo couldn't help it. He laughed. Catherine, I'm impressed. She was staring at him. Impressed? Very. How delightfully clever of you. Wish I'd been as practical instead of smuggling in cows and ladies of the night. Should have been sneaking in portable things like spirits and cheroots just to try them. Now drink your chocolate before it gets cold. Looking a little dazed, Catherine obeyed. He took the cup and put it back on the tray, then tucked up a pillow so that she could lean back against it and did the same for himself. Comfortable? Yes. Good. Is there anything else you want to tell me? Last night, she said, then stopped. What about last night? Still worrying about our awful cousin Thane? No. He is awful, isn't he? But last night, you didn't want to talk. Last night, he said, was a long time ago. She took this in and slowly nodded her head. Hugo, I want to thank you for coming when you did. You were very heroic, lifting Thane up like that. Heroic? He laughed. Hardly. A bit of brute strength, that's all. It seemed heroic to me, so thank you. You're welcome. And you don't mind my being here? No, I'm glad you came. Hugo was smiling at her, 
and Catherine felt her spirits lifting in a giddy, rushing swoop upwards. Physiologically impossible, of course, but the sensation seemed very real. Wonderfully real. Yesterday evening, she had been afraid that Hugo would never smile at her again. It would be like living in a world in which the sun had been blotted out, desolate, hopeless. Last night was a long time ago, and today was a new day, filled with possibility. Catherine pushed back the bedclothes and scrambled out of bed, went with eager steps to the windows and flung back one of the curtains. Bright sunlight flooded the room. She turned back around. Yes, Hugo's hair illuminated to gold, the blue of his eyes like a Grecian sea. He was naked to the waist and probably everywhere. I'm glad you came. The word came, Catherine thought, feeling warm all over, had multiple meanings, some of them more immediate than others. Hugo said, You're getting up then? No, I'm coming back to bed, which is what she did. She knelt next to Hugo, her gown splayed about her. Coming, to come. Is that all right with you? He looked at her for a long moment. Yes. What do you want to do? The answer, the idea, bloomed inside Catherine, as beautiful as a flower in spring. This. She brought herself closer, put a hand on his shoulder, lowered her face to his. Lightly, lightly she touched her lips to his mouth, connected the two of them in this powerful, intimate way, and without hesitation she tilted her head to allow the kiss to deepen into something that was urgent and needful and hot and wet and tongues and teeth and Hugo making a delicious growling sound in his throat, redolent of both satisfaction and hunger, and his hands coming up to slide around her, and everything that was simple, honest, real, good. When at last they broke the kiss, she was breathless and smiling, and oh, how happy Hugo looked. That beautiful flower bloomed and opened wide within her. She said, Second, I want to do this. She sat up. With unhurried deliberation, she touched him. In a long caress, slid her hands from his shoulders down the warm, muscled length of his arms, up again, then down along the broad, hard planes of his chest, the sculpted lines of his torso, his flat stomach. It was as if her palms and fingers, sensitive, alive, weren't just feeling him. They were seeing, knowing him, and knowing he liked what she was doing. Maybe as much as she liked it, too. Her hands came to the bedclothes, where they lay against his waist. He was hard, hard beneath them, and a new idea came to her. Third, she said to Hugo, I want to do this. She drew the bedclothes down and away. Such magnificent maleness. What a piece of work is man, Shakespeare had written, although not perhaps as she was interpreting it now, with earthy awe and appreciation for this very particular aspect of a man, of Hugo. She thought of Sonnet 128, Me Thy Lips to Kiss. She revised it in her mind, You My Lips to Kiss. She leaned down and, shyly at first, then, with more boldness, she tasted him, explored him with her lips and tongue and fingers and mouth, heard with her own deep delight his ragged groan. She received even as she gave, and rapidly did she lose herself in the hot, mindless joy of it. It was only when Hugo gently pushed her away that Catherine came to a little and straightened. What is it? He raked his fingers through his hair. You'll have me toppling off the bed in a moment. In a good way. In a very good way. What do you want to do now? She thought. Then, this. Fourth thing. She pulled from over her head the emerald necklace, let it spill like water on the far side of the bed. Then her bracelets, too. My gown. 
Will you unlace it? Yes. Hugo sat up, and she twisted around, marvelling in some distant part of her at the miracle of how easily she did it, how the pain had entirely gone. She could feel her gown loosening, and when he said, It's done, she turned back around, hitched up the hem, and tugged her gown up and over her head, and then her shift, too. She was rewarded by his smile, the fire in his eyes, by every taut line in his body. He said, What's the fifth thing? This. She lay back with cat-like indolence upon the rumpled bed covers. Lying sideways on the bed, now you are shocking me. Somehow I doubt that. He laughed. And now what? Sixth thing. She opened her legs wide for him and smiled when his body told her exactly how he felt about that. He came to her then, brought himself sliding above her and against her, kissed her long and deeply, all the while. And how was it even possible to feel so much? With seemingly every atom, every particle of her, everywhere, all the while she was aware of, delighting in, the contrast between his hard chest flecked with golden hair and her own chest, her breast so smooth and soft, the contrast between his iron hard legs and her soft fleshy ones, the contrast between him, all hard and erect and utterly male, and herself, all soft and yielding, and so very ready. Male and female, he and she. Hugo and Catherine. Us, together, she thought, and said out loud, Seventh thing, sliding her hand down between them, reaching for him, eagerly guiding him closer, closer, and into her at last. Later, much later, when they had done, and their bodies were slick with sweat, and the room was quiet again, Hugo rolled onto his back. He unhooked a long spiral of Catherine's hair from around his ear and took a moment to orient himself. Somehow they had ended up with their heads at the foot of the bed. His feet were on Catherine's pillows. I say, he said, in a tone of deep appreciation. That was something like. Catherine turned onto her side and brought herself closer, sliding a warm, soft arm over his chest. Yes, it was. She gave a happy-sounding sigh. Thank you. He laid his hand over her forearm, where it rested atop the scar from the sharpshooter's bullet, all nicely healed. If it comes to that, I should be thanking you. I'm glad you don't find me unappealing any more. You? Unappealing? She lifted her head to stare at him. What do you mean? I've had that impression quite a lot these past months. Oh, no, it's not true, at all. I'm sorry you've thought so. Catherine raised herself up so that she could reach his mouth with her own and kissed him with such ardour that he had no doubt that she meant it. This, Hugo thought, returning her kiss, was a new and promising box revealed. He brought his hands down along the length of her back and to the fulsome, exquisitely feminine curves of her waist and hips and thighs. Suddenly she pulled away. Hugo, this can't be bad. Bad, he echoed in surprise. What can't be bad? This. Her glance encompassed him, herself, the rumpled bed. What was explained to me as the conjugal obligation? It was about duty, Hugo, not pleasure or fun. And after my little, ah... Uh, contretemps with the music instructor, and I was told how low and bad I was to want such a thing. Well, I believed it for a long time, but now... Catherine took a deep, deep breath and let it out on a slow exhalation. But now I think they were wrong. I think this is good. I know it is. I agree, Hugo said, smiling, and lazily he stretched. Speaking of good, he hadn't felt this good in a long time. Maybe he'd never felt this good before, in fact. He laced his fingers together and put them behind his head. Well, Catherine? 
Well, what? What do you want to do now? She looked thoughtful, and then she smiled. I'll be right back. She got off the bed, and he watched as she went to the door between their rooms, and, opening it, went inside. God in heaven, that bottom of hers. Sweet, sweet lust was running rampant through him again. And she could tell, too, when, returning with a green and yellow striped pasteboard box, she looked down the length of him and smiled again. She got back onto the bed, drew close to sit near him, and said, Seventeenth thing. We're up to seventeen already. Yes. Quite the morning, Catherine. Yes, and it's not over yet. She put the box on the bed next to her. Opening the lid, she took from it a dark square. Is that a conserve? he said. I haven't had one in ages. And then it hit him. Catherine wasn't secretly indulging in her affection for chocolate. Here she was, quite literally revealing to him a box. Yes. Would you like one, Hugo? I would, thanks. He reached for it, but instead she brought the chocolate square to his lips while with her other hand she lightly caressed his cock. He groaned, but with pleasure. Sweet chocolate in his mouth, fire everywhere else. After a while it occurred to him that two could play at that game. He sat up. To her he said, Lie down. Why? Her eyes were sparkling. You'll see. If you insist. She lay back with such languorous slowness that he almost shoved the green and yellow box off the bed and had her then and there. But he reminded himself that patience is a virtue. He took a conserve from the box and offered it to her. She looked at it and up at him, and then she bit into it, smiling with such devastating sensuousness that again he had to restrain himself. Patience. It's good, isn't it? she said. Very good, he answered. He took a small bite of the conserve, allowed his saliva to moisten the rest of it, and with the same languid slowness she displayed in lying down, he rubbed the conserve around the pretty pink areole of her breasts. She quivered. Oh, Hugo. He didn't stop. Yes, Catherine. Oh, Hugo. Yes. But apparently, that was all she had to say at the moment, and he saw with gladness how her arms and legs went taut and her face very flushed. He continued for a little while longer, then, slowly, he ate the conserve, and with the taste of it still lingering on his tongue, he stretched himself out next to her on his side, leaned close, and licked wet, leisurely circles around her areole. Oh, Hugo. Yes. Eighteenth thing. He laughed softly, then took a sweet, luscious nipple into his mouth and suckled it, enjoying a great deal the breathy little noises she was making, and even as he sucked harder, he slid a hand down between her legs. She gasped, Nineteenth thing, and arched herself up to meet his fingers. It's remarkable how you haven't lost track of your numbers, Hugo said admiringly, then brought his mouth to her other nipple and sucked hard at it, too. And then he moved down, down until his head was between her warm, fragrant thighs, and another taste, musky and feminine, was there for him to savour. My God, you delicious armful, you beauty, said Hugo, his voice a little rough. You're better than chocolate, and slid his palms beneath her to bring her yet closer to him. Am I really? she answered, rather jerkily. Infinitely better. Oh, good. Oh, Hugo, that's good. Twentieth thing? Yes. Oh, my God, yes. After, they had breakfast in bed, and after that, Catherine entertained them by reading out loud from her new copy of the Canterbury Tales, which made them both laugh quite a bit, and then they made love again, and then they took a nap. It was early afternoon when Catherine, lying close to Hugo, drifted slowly up into consciousness. Fragments played in her mind's eye, something between dreams and memories. Last night, the DeWitt's ballroom, 
crowds of people, being jostled. Lydia St. John, her tawny good looks seeming surprisingly faded for one so young. A big hand around her slim upper arm, a loud hearty voice in a big red face. Who? Oh yes, her brother Dennis. Dare say the two of you will be wanting to renew your friendship, hey? Let the world know and all that. The big hand, squeezing hard. Revulsion rippled through Catherine, and she remembered now the look of helplessness in Lydia's light brown eyes. She sat up suddenly, pushing her hair off her face, and Hugo woke up. What is it, Catherine? Hugo, I want to call on someone, and I'd like it if you came with me. Would you? Of course. When? Now. Chapter 14 the St. John's were staying in Upper Wimpole Street. What a wonder a good butler was, thought Catherine. What an astonishing font of knowledge. And by four o'clock, she and Hugo, having quickly bathed and dressed, arrived in their carriage. It was a genteel neighbourhood, but was by no means considered one of the better addresses among the ton. So when the butler obsequiously ushered them into the empty drawing-room, Catherine was surprised to see how elegantly furnished it was. She and Hugo had been seated for only a little while before Dennis St. John hurried in. In his wake, both an angular, fashionably dressed woman and his sister, Lydia, who looked at Catherine with a kind of cringing expression so very, very different from the one she had habitually worn at school. Catherine recognised the expression at once. It was one she knew all too well. It was shame. Well, well, if this isn't an honour, exclaimed Dennis St. John, bringing the angular woman forward and introducing her as his wife. He glanced around the empty room and said, with the heartiness that Catherine disliked more and more, Can't think where everyone is. Usually we're mobbed with visitors, aren't we, Mrs. St. John? His wife simpered. Oh, yes, mobbed, and constantly, all sorts of important people, the best people. Dennis St. John directed a glowering look of reproof at his wife before breaking again into a wide smile and saying to Catherine and Hugo, No one as important as you, of course. Penhallows are better than dukes, everyone says so. Well, well, and so you've called on us. Quite the honour. You there, Lydia. Don't just stand there like a ninny. Ring for some refreshments, hey? Listlessly, Lydia did as she was told, and Catherine had seen enough. She rose to her feet and said, Miss St. John, it's been so long since we've seen each other, and I should enjoy a little tete-a-tete -tete with you. Perhaps we might go to your bedchamber. That look of shame intensified, but before Lydia could answer, Dennis St. John hastily put in, Oh, there's no need to do that, Mrs. Penhallow. You and Lydia can enjoy a comfortable cose right here. Reminiscences from the good old days, plans to make, bosom companions. Isn't that right, Lydia? There's a window seat over there which would be just the thing. No, said Catherine, as imperious as Henrietta Penhallow in her haughtiest mood. I would prefer to go upstairs with Miss St. John. She went to Lydia, put her arm through hers, at the same time flashing a quick glance at Hugo, which she hoped communicated, hold the fort here, please, and was glad to see the look of instant comprehension in his eyes and the slight martial nod of his head. Plainly flummoxed, Dennis St. John shot an angry look at his hapless wife, then went to the bell pull and yanked hard upon it, muttering under his breath, Where's that butler? Damn his mangy hide! Catherine, satisfied, swept Lydia out of the drawing room, then followed her lagging steps up a flight of stairs onto a landing, sunless and not very clean. About halfway down the corridor, Lydia opened a door and stepped aside to let Catherine in. It was a mean little room, cheaply furnished with a narrow iron bedstead, a small armoire, a rickety-looking dressing table, and a single chair. The contrast between the drawing room below and this dismal bedchamber caught Catherine off guard, and she frankly stared. At school, Lydia St. John was known to be the daughter of a very wealthy baron, 
long established on the vast family estate in Kent, a fact which Lydia herself had frequently mentioned. Well, have you seen enough, Mrs. Penhallow, or would you like to stay and gloat some more? Lydia's voice was bitter. Gloat? No. Quickly Catherine turned to her. It's just that... There was no tactful way to say it, but Lydia stepped in. Yes, there's quite a difference between the public rooms and the private ones. Lydia smiled without humour. The St. John's have fallen on hard times, Mrs. Penhallow, but my brother Dennis is doing everything he can to conceal it. She pulled out the chair and gestured to it. Would you like to sit down? I promise you it won't break. I know, because Dennis has sat on it many times when he comes to lecture me, and he's quite a substantial man, isn't he? Catherine sat down and waited until Lydia had sat on her bed opposite her. I'm sorry to hear about your... your financial reversals. I had thought your father's fortune to be secure. It might have been, had he not passed into his dotage a hateful drunkard and allowed Dennis to take over its management. Dennis has lost everything, most of the estate, my dowry, the family's plantation in the West Indies. Lydia added with a terrible casualness, he tried to marry me off to one of his rich so-called friends in Jamaica. The only way I managed to avoid it was by spreading rumours that I was mad. His friend became worried that any children we'd have would inherit the taint and withdrew. Dennis was furious. Oh, Lydia, I'm so sorry, exclaimed Catherine. Thin shoulders went up in a hopeless shrug. That's why we're here for the season, you know. A last chance to salvage the family fortunes. Dennis intends for me to wed, and as soon as possible, which explains why he was thrilled that you and I knew each other. He's hoping you'll help me. Take me under your wing. Bitterly, Lydia went on. He doesn't know that we're not friends at all, and I'm afraid to tell him. I was dreadful toward you, wasn't I? All those years. I was so jealous of you. So beautiful, so brilliant. Jealous? Of me? Catherine could hardly believe what she was hearing. Yes, very. And I took it out on you in any way I could think of. My God, but I was awful. You'll be pleased to know, Mrs. Penhallow, that life has humbled me. I'm not pleased at all and I do want to help you. Lydia was silent. Then, finally, suspiciously, she said, Why? Because I know what it's like to be a pawn in someone else's game. Silence again. Then, now that you're a Penhallow, once it's known I'm your protégé, it will make all the difference in the world. I'll do my best. Is there someone you want to marry? Catherine asked, then saw how a shudder rippled through Lydia's slender frame. God, no, and put myself under the control of someone else. Not all men are like that, said Catherine, thinking of Hugo, thinking with a rush of gratitude of him downstairs, steady, calm, strong. I don't want to be married, Lydia said with suppressed violence, hands clenched tight in her lap and I hate living with Dennis and my nasty sister-in-law. Then being here is pointless, said Catherine, being made to attend the season. Is there some place else you'd rather be? Yes, I want to go to Bath. I have an elderly aunt. She's rather lame. She lives there for her health. She's got a small income and has rooms by the baths, and she's written to say I could live with her. Before Dennis started reading all my mail, that is. She's very kind. I could be happy there, living very quietly. Lydia was leaning forward now, looking at Catherine with a kind of desperate intensity. But I haven't any money to get away. Nothing. I'm trapped here, Mrs. Penhallow. Does Dennis have any legal hold over you? Are you of age? I'm twenty-two. And no, he is not my guardian. His hold over me derives from... Well, you know the Scottish saying, don't you? Possession is eleven points in the law, and they say there are but twelve. Catherine nodded. 
Then let's get you to Bath. We can send you there in one of our carriages. Nothing could be easier. She watched as slowly into Lydia's tired face came a heartbreaking look of relief. But then it faded and she said, Oh, but how, Mrs. Penhallow? Dennis will do everything in his power to stop me, and you've seen how forceful he is. Catherine glanced around the shabby room. There was so little here. Pack your trunk now, Lydia. Hugo will carry it down. We'll take you with us to the Penhallow townhouse, and you can sleep there tonight. Tomorrow, we'll send you off to Bath. Lydia's tawny brown eyes were wide. You would do that for me, after all the hateful things I did to you. Hugo had said, last night was a long time ago. And so now Catherine said to Lydia St. John, that was a long time ago. Briskly, she stood up. Come on, I'll help you pack. The scene that followed was, as Catherine had expected, unpleasant. Upon hearing the news of his sister's immediate departure, Dennis St. John was flabbergasted, then hostile, blustery, vituperative toward his sister, and began to issue some very ugly threats. But Hugo, with a few blunt, well-chosen words, rapidly reduced St. John to a cowering silence. He then shouldered Lydia's trunk and escorted Catherine and Lydia downstairs and into the street, where they cheerfully crammed themselves and the trunk into the carriage and bowled away. Later, when Lydia, exhausted, had gone to bed in one of the guest bedchambers, and Catherine and Hugo were alone in his room, she reached out to squeeze his hand and said, Oh, Hugo, you were marvellous. I know it's very wrong to feel this way, but there was something so satisfying about seeing the dreadful Dennis vanquished like that. Yes, very heroic of me, said Hugo complacently. Catherine laughed. Well, it was. He raised her hand to his lips and kissed it. You are rather heroic yourself, you know. Or should I say heroinish? Heroinic. Is there a word for it? If there's not, there should be, Catherine answered. She leaned back in her chair, looking thoughtfully at Hugo. Their seats drawn close together, they were sitting near the fireplace, where a small fire danced and leaped, and they each were holding a crystal glass of deep red burgundy wine. Hugo, are you sorry we didn't go to Almack's tonight as we had planned? Not particularly. Are you? Well, Mr. Brummel had sent me a note hoping I'd be there, and that nice lady Mannering said the same thing at Countess Leven's dinner party, but am I sorry? Yes. No, I'm not sure. I just know I'm not sorry to be here with you. Likewise, said Hugo, and smiled. And Catherine thought that although their bedchamber was all lovely and dim, it was, at the same time, very bright. They walked with Lydia to the mews early the next morning, accompanied by a footman and a maidservant, who were to travel with Lydia to Bath. Her battered trunk had already been strapped atop the carriage, and the maidservant got inside. Hugo went to talk to the coachman. Catherine turned to Lydia, reaching into the side pocket of her police, and pulled out a small purse, which she pressed into Lydia's gloved hand. Something for your journey, she said, for your expenses. Oh, Mrs. Penhallow, I couldn't accept it. Lydia's eyes were shimmering with tears. You've done so much already. You can, and you must. And please, please call me Catherine. Catherine, then, said Lydia, and slipped the little purse into her reticule. Thank you. For everything. She looped her reticule over her wrist, held out her hands, and Catherine took them in her own. She said, Safe travels, Lydia, and won't you write to me sometime and let me know how you're doing? I will, promised Lydia, and then Hugo had said his farewells and helped her into the carriage, and the carriage rolled away. When it had gone from their sight, Hugo said, Well, Catherine, what would you like to do now? Catherine raised up the hem of her gown, just enough to show Hugo her jean half-boots. I thought perhaps we could go for a walk. A walk, really, said Hugo in surprise. 
Then, recovering, gallantly he held out his arm. Catherine laughed and took it, and so they went for a long stroll, uncaring that the sky was a sullen, lowering grey, all too typical for an early summer day in London. When they returned to the townhouse, the butler inquired as to whether they cared for refreshments, to which Hugo said, "'By Jove, yes!' and also made mention of some newly arrived correspondence which awaited them at their convenience. Half an hour later, they were sitting in a spacious saloon which overlooked a charming walled garden, sharing a sofa. Catherine was perched at one end, sorting through her invitations, letters, circulars, calling cards, and so on. Hugo sat on the other end of the sofa, a plate of savoury quiche tarts set next to him. He ate one of the tarts, thinking how sometimes there was nothing nicer than a companionable silence. He picked up one of his letters. 29th of May, 1812. Dear Hugo, thanks awfully for your letter. Percy and I are coming along nicely. He's been elected captain of the cricket team, and I won a prize for my essay on Seneca the Younger. All six volumes of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which I am enjoying immensely. Owen has invited us back to Northamptonshire for the summer holiday, and we'd love to go. Would you mind very much if we did? The only bad thing is that Owen's sister Helen will probably be hanging about bothering us, as she did the last time we were there. Owen says he'd like to kick her in the seat of her gown, but as she outweighs him by three stone, he doesn't dare. Percy says she's a good fellow and a bruising rider, but I must say I find her rather obnoxious. Still, difficulties strengthen the mind, as Seneca the Younger says, so I dare say association with Helen will at least confer some kind of moral benefit. Yours most faithfully, Francis. Hugo smiled and opened the next letter. 26th of May, 1812. Dearest Hugo, thank you so much for the beautiful fan you sent me. It is just right for pretending that I am a captivating lady of society. I've been practising fan gestures for days. So far, my favourites are when you cover your left ear with the fan opened up, which means do not betray our secret, and when you slide the fan across your forehead, which means you have changed. Diana says her favourite is when you twirl the fan in your left hand, which means we are being watched. Bertram came upon us while we were practising, took my fan and opened it, and beat it violently over the top of his head to create a great breeze, which he said means, I am thinking hard. I tried not to laugh, but of course I did. He also says, by the way, that he very much appreciates those long-handled tongs you sent, which have proved very useful in his sintering experiments. He wrote to thank you, but it was only this morning that he realised he forgot to mail it. Are you dreadfully sad the season is coming to a close? How romantic it must be. When are you coming home? We all miss you so much. You will be pleased to see how nice things are looking. Mamma has had several rooms painted, for example, and Cook adores her new stove. Also, the roof has been fixed. Love always, Gwendolyn. P.S. I do believe Senor Rodrigo misses you also. He has lost some more feathers, the poor darling. P.P.S. But I will never give up hope, and so I tell him at least twice a day now. P.P.P.S. I almost forgot. Please give Catherine my regards. Hugo smiled again as he reread the postscripts, rendered in Gwendolen's looping, still childish hand. He reached for another tart. Gwenny sends her regards. There was no reply from Catherine, so after Hugo had taken a bite of his tart and swallowed it, he looked over at her. Gwenny sends her... He broke off. Catherine was sitting bolt upright and clutching in one hand an opened letter at which she was staring as if turned to stone. Catherine? What's the matter? What is it? Still, she said nothing. Quickly, he set aside the tart moved to sit next to her on the sofa. Catherine, what's wrong? Her mouth opened and then closed, as if she wouldn't, couldn't speak. She only thrust the letter at him. 28th of May, 1812. Catherine, your father is ruined. I do not fully understand it, 
but it has something to do with various bubble companies in which he has for the past several years vested as partner. The lawyers came yesterday, and he was closeted with them till well after midnight. All is lost. His debts are extreme, and he must sell or relinquish every asset we own in order to avoid being sent to debtor's prison, or worse. That includes Brook House and all its contents, including furnishings, artwork, carriages, and so on, as well as the jewellery you foolishly left behind. Your father has agreed to all that the lawyers demanded, but vows he'll not stay in a country where one cannot pursue enterprising business practices without being harassed. Therefore, tomorrow, we travel for Bristol— where, in a fortnight, we shall set sail for Porto de Galanesh, your father being confident that in Brazil he'll be able to avoid the embarrassment of further legal prosecution, as well as enjoy a more congenial environment in which to rebuild our fortunes. Speaking of which, it was quite lucky that at the very last moment we were able to have your next and, obviously, last quarterly allowance diverted to us as, while we wait to commence our journey, at the Royal Arms Inn, Bristol's best accommodations, of course, we must hurry to purchase clothing more suitable for a sea voyage, as well as for the climate in Porto de Galanache. They say it is quite agreeable, nearly always warm and mild. However, I shall have to guard my complexion most carefully. No more now, as I must oversee the packing of my trunks. Really? All things considered, it may well prove to be a delightful new adventure for us. Your father and I are bound to be greeted among the expatriate community there with acclaim, he being the son of a baronet, and I, of course, an accomplished society hostess. It is, after all, an ill wind that blows no good. I remain, etc., mother. Good God, said Hugo and Catherine, her face gone very white, said in an even voice, "'Did you notice anything peculiar about the letter?' "'I should say I do. Not a word of concern for you.' "'Oh, not that. I wouldn't have expected anything different.' Catherine's eyes were glittering, bright and fierce. "'You didn't notice a distinct lack of French terminology. I did. It's quite amusing, don't you think?' Mother stripped of her continental pretensions for once. She laughed, but there was no humour in it. And there's something else, Hugo, which is very funny. Do you remember the Greek myth of King Midas? Of course, the chap whose daughter was turned to gold. Yes, that's right. The god Dionysus granted him a wish, and he asked for the ability to turn anything he touched into gold. He was warned to be careful in his wish, but he ignored it. And so? And so, when you had the good sense to refuse my father's offer to handle your financial affairs, I was too busy enjoying the idea that I finally had a wedge to keep my parents at bay, to insist they not come to London with us, when I should have paid more attention to my father's nonsense. And after I agreed to allow him to manage my money, when they made mention of joining us for next year's season, all I could think was how it would never, ever happen. She gave that same humorless laugh. My income is gone. We'll never be able to come back. So now, like King Midas, I've gotten what I wished for. Catherine, none of this is your fault. And yet here I am. She jumped to her feet and began pacing around the room, her fingers clenched into fists, eyebrows drawn tight together, and rather irrelevantly, Hugo found himself recalling Gwendolen's remark about Bertram waving her fan above his head to indicate, I am thinking hard. But of course he didn't say anything about that. He simply sat and watched as Catherine stalked back and forth. He waited. Waited until he had a better understanding of how he might help her. Catherine went on pacing, silent, fierce, abstracted, until abruptly she came to a halt. She remained like that, motionless, for what seemed like hours to Hugo, but could only in reality have been a few minutes. Then she came back to the sofa, snatched up the letter and crumpled it into a tiny ball. Hugo, 
she said in a hard, flat voice. I want to do something. What is it, Catherine? he answered calmly. I want to sell all the jewellery I bought, back to Rundle and Bridge. I want to sell the extra carriages. I want you to sell the horses we won't need any more. Can you find good owners for them? Between Cousin Judith and myself, I'm sure we can. Good. Lady Mannering, how funny that I was mentioning her only last night, has started a charity for war widows, and I want to donate most of my clothing and shoes, and all those other things, the hats and shawls and so forth, to it. As you like, Catherine. This was leading to an obvious conclusion about their time here in London, but it would be cruel for him to thrust it upon her. So he would wait for her to voice it, for her to own it when she was able. I want to release all the servants back to the Dauntry Agency as soon as possible. Yes. Then I'm going to sell back all the books I've bought in London. He knew how much that sacrifice in particular had to hurt her, but he only nodded. And then, when all of it is done, I want to take whatever money I have, Hugo, and I want to send it all to my parents. I hate their money. I want to get rid of it forever. It's like a sickness, and it's been killing me for years. And now I want them to have it all back. Fine. Oh, Hugo, it's not fine. It's not fine at all. An image came to her. A blank page, and then a hand, a pot of ink, a quill moving across the white expanse. What is a story without unexpected occurrences? Our heroine really ought to have anticipated them. Things had been going so well for her, it was, perhaps, inevitable. So now, in a sudden twist, she's been stripped of, is letting go of, her wealth the money which for many years has defined her. The Brook heiress no more. Who is she then? Who is she now? She recalls yet another grim tale from Greek mythology, Icarus, who in wings of wax and feathers had recklessly flown too close to the sun, then inevitably plunged to his death. Our heroine is not dead, far from it but her circumstances have most certainly been altered. What will she do in this new chapter of hers? Calmly, Hugo said, breaking into her thoughts. Why isn't it fine, Catherine? Oh my God, don't you see? She answered, hearing in her own ears how harsh her voice was. I'll be poor. Even as she said the words, a deep and blinding grief barreled at her like a storm. Catherine looked down into his handsome face and made herself say, in a torrent of brutally honest words, Oh, Hugo, I'm sorry. I know you only married me for my money, and soon it will all be gone. I should never have asked you to marry me. You should have come to London and found someone else, someone better. I'm sure your Aunt Henrietta would have helped you, or Cousin Judith. I'm so sorry. I know you wish you hadn't married me. I don't wish that at all. What? I'm glad I married you. Hugo reached up, took her hands in a warm clasp, and drew her down to sit next to him on the sofa. But she was staring at him. The grief seemed to whistle through her like a cold wind filling up an empty ravine. But the money. Once it's gone, there will be no more. I understand that. Catherine gave her head a little baffled shake. What will I do with myself, then? The Brooks are all about money, Hugo. That's what we do. Make it, spend it, think about it, want more of it. But you're not a Brook any more, are you? Not a Brook. A Brook no more. What will our heroine do in this new chapter of hers? Catherine looked down at Hugo's hands holding hers, then back up into his eyes. It seemed impossible to believe that he wasn't sorry, that he was glad. It was like saying, up is down, white is black, fish can walk and pigs can fly. But there was no time to think about it. She had to set her plan in motion, and right away. 
She couldn't rest until the damned money was gone. Fiercely, she gripped his wrists. No matter what happens, you're not to touch your mother's funds or the children's. Promise me that. I promise, he said, and that at least she could believe. She nodded and at last said the other words that had to be spoken. We must leave London. Yes. Where will we go? But even as she said it, the answer came to her. It was pragmatic. It was inevitable. Once she had said to Hugo, I loathe Whitehaven. Here again was a case in which her words had come back to haunt her. But there was no time to think about that either. Is there room for us in your house? Yes, plenty. You're sure? Yes. Then that's where we'll go. To Whitehaven. There's nothing for me there. Nothing. She pulled her hands free to cover her face with them, to hide her expression, to conceal her grief, her agony. Catherine. She didn't lift her head. Yes. We'll get through this. Will we? She felt her mouth curving in a smile that wasn't a smile. Will we indeed? Chapter 15 Mrs. Serena Daughtry of the prestigious Daughtry Employment Agency on Harley Street looked across her desk at Mrs. Catherine Penhallow. She had previously only corresponded with Mrs. Penhallow, the newest relation of the redoubtable Mrs. Henrietta Penhallow, whose townhouse in Berkeley Square she'd had the honour of staffing the previous season. Of course, Serena knew all about Mrs. Catherine Penhallow's remarkable second season, and also she was aware that there had been some kind of mysterious alteration in Mrs. Penhallow's financial affairs. She made it her business to keep abreast of the happenings in the haute ton. Not that she would mention it, of course, Discretion in her line of work was paramount. She said, How may I be of service to you, Mrs. Penhallow? I must release by the end of the week all the servants I engaged in April. They've been given three months' severance pay as well as letters of recommendation. I've written out copies of the letters, which you may wish to keep for your files. Mrs. Penhallow extended a soft leather document folder which Serena accepted with a surprise she hoped didn't show. Not every employer was as generous under such circumstances. She looked a little more closely at Mrs. Penhallow, observing the pallor of her complexion, the dark circles beneath her eyes, which perhaps suggested the strain under which she laboured. Yet Mrs. Penhallow was dignified and civil. She was wearing a simple pelisse of deep plum, and over her dark curls, an equally unfussy hat of the same rich colour which complemented her vivid looks. The report Serena had heard described her, quite accurately it turned out, as a very striking young lady, something not in the common way at all. Serena put the document folder onto the tidy surface of the desk at which she sat. Thank you, Mrs. Penhallow. It's very kind of you. Is there anything else I might do for you? A reassurance that you'll be able to find congenial new positions for the staff would be most welcome. I have no doubt of it, ma'am. It's something upon which I pride myself. Excellent. Mrs. Penhallow rose to her feet. Thank you, Mrs. Daughtry. Thank you, ma'am, Serena said, standing also, and added, with an impulsiveness which was unusual for her, I do hope to work with you again. A shadow seemed to come over Mrs. Penhallow's face, but she only said, with the same civility, Thank you. Good day to you. And then she was gone. Within a matter of days, their life in London was taken apart, disassembled with the speed and efficiency of a child's puzzle. Naturally, Catherine was not the first person whose financial issues were resolved by a rapid sell-off of assets, and it all turned out to be very easy. Harder, perhaps, had been receiving the influx of visitors to the townhouse. A few had come, she knew, to gawk and to carry away gossip, but quite a few others had come to say goodbye and to wish them well. She had, K 
Catherine learned to her surprise. More friends in London than she had realized. Cousin Judith, the Duchess of Egremont, had even hugged her, said in her kind, abrupt way, You're a good girl, adding, Don't worry about the horses, they'll be grand, and had gone off with her customary long strides, quite possibly in search of her maddening and erratic grandson, Philip Thane, whose whereabouts, following his brief, scandalous appearance at the DeWitt's ball, were at present unknown. 13th of June, 1812. Mother, I enclose herewith a cheque. It's all that I have. There's nothing left. Adieu. Catherine. The night before they were to leave London, they lay in the bed where they had shared so much pleasure, so much joy. Hugo turned to Catherine in the darkness. Her face was a pale, ghostly oval. She said, Hugo, are you there? A question he knew that meant far more than was he simply in the bed next to her. Yes. Is there anything I can do for you? No. Hugo, that time back in Canada when you were shot, what did it feel like? There was a pain, very sharp, in my chest. Did you feel as if you were coming apart? No, not then. Later, though, when the fever took me, I remember feeling as if I'd somehow been detached from the universe, separated from myself. Yes. Is that how you feel now, Catherine? Yes, Hugo. I'm sorry, but I'm here. I know that. Thank you. And he heard the little wobble in her voice, but did not comment upon it. And so the long night wound its slow, slow way along. It took them a week, travelling to the north and to the west, past Oxford, past Stratford-on-Avon, through Coventry and Birmingham, past the Peak District, through Manchester, then through the Forest of Boland and the Lake District. Catherine made no complaint, submitted to the long hours in the carriage, did not remark upon the modest nature of the inns at which they stayed, quietly ate her meals, and promptly made herself ready each day. She did not read, Hugo observed, only sat straight as an arrow in the carriage, looking out the window, day by day growing more and more silent, more remote. Her lovely face, Hugo thought, like a graven mask. He knew she was hurting. He ached for her in his soul. But sometimes, he knew, words could do nothing. Sometimes you simply had to wait and watch and hope. The carriage wheels turned as if without end. Idly, Catherine pictured them going round and round and imagined that in their monotonous rumble she could hear them mocking her, saying, echoing what Gabriel Penhallow had said that evening at Sermont Hall, to the ocean, to the ocean, toward nothing. Inside her was nothing, too, a kind of vast white expanse, a blank page. On the sixth day they came into Cumbria, and Hugo fancied he could already catch the familiar tang of salt air. He found himself listening for the sounds of the waves. He wanted to hurry their horses along. But he didn't, because patience, he knew, is a virtue. It was on the seventh day that they came at last into Whitehaven and to the big old house on the beach. Its windows now clean and sparkling, Hugo noticed with pleasure. The crumbling reddish clay bricks replaced with new ones, and the roof, as Gwendolen had mentioned, now solid and sturdy. Altogether, he thought, the dear old place looked wonderfully well kept. It had always been loved, but now it looked it. As he and Catherine walked toward the portico, the front door opened and out tumbled Gwendolen, joyfully calling his name and wearing, he could see at a glance, a pretty new gown. She was followed at a slightly more decorous pace by Mamma and Bertram. Here, he thought, smiling at them, glancing at Catherine, thinking of Francis and Percy, Grandpapa and the aunts. Here was everything he needed. Here was everything everything. Nothing, nothing, nothing. 
Thank you for your hospitality, ma'am, said Catherine to Hugo's mother, doing her best to keep her voice from sounding wooden. It's kind of you to have us. It's not kind at all, said Hugo's mamma, smiling. It's an entirely selfish happiness. I'm so glad you're both here. Oh, welcome home, both of you. And she turned to Hugo and enveloped him, as best as she could, given his great height, in a comprehensive hug. He hugged her back, and then Gwendolyn said, Oh, Hugo, and threw herself into his arms. We missed you terribly. Standing a little aside, Catherine watched, feeling perhaps as lonely as she ever had in her life. Maybe even lonelier. Outsiderness. The same old story. They lay in their bed. The long bank of windows facing the shore had been left open to admit a pleasant evening breeze, and Hugo could just see the white curtains fluttering a little. To his ears came the old, familiar, primeval rumble of the ocean. His blood seemed almost to sing with it. Home. He was home again. Then the mattress shifted. Bedclothes rustled. Are you there, Hugo? Yes. Is there something you need? No, thank you. And then Catherine fell silent again. Seventeenth of June, eighteen twelve. Dear Hugo, thank you for your letter regarding your departure from the townhouse. You didn't elaborate on the circumstances surrounding the removal, but rumours have reached me from London regarding the resale of jewels, carriages sold, and so on. Have you and Catherine suffered some kind of catastrophic financial setback? And if that is the case, what can I do to help? If you require assistance, pecuniary or otherwise, please do not hesitate to ask. Affectionately yours, Aunt Henrietta. P.S. A report has also reached me as to Catherine's magnanimous gift to Lady Mannering's war widow charity. Here I must observe that Catherine seems to be developing a habit of discarding entire wardrobes at a stroke. Nonetheless, as by so doing she is assisting a great many of those in need, such gestures, however eccentric, can only be lauded. Indeed, Catherine may not know it, but apparently she has launched a trend in London, almost an avalanche, one might say. So many women of the Autonne have donated to Lady Mannering such vast quantities of clothing and the various accoutrements that she has had to scramble mightily to find extra storage space to accommodate it all. 17th of June, 1812. Dear Catherine, Granny mentioned that you and Hugo encountered some unforeseen circumstances in London and are now re-established in Whitehaven. She didn't go into detail, but I must confess to feeling concerned. Are you both all right? Is there anything I can do? I hope that my other letters, sent to you while you were in London, arrived safely. Please do write back if you have the time. It would be lovely to hear from you. Yours most sincerely, Livia. 5th of July, 1812. Dear Aunt Henrietta, thanks very much for your letter. It's awfully kind of you to offer to help. Please be assured that we're all right in the way of money. Not just Catherine and myself, but also my mother and my sister and brothers. 
As you might guess, the whole thing's been wretchedly difficult for Catherine, but she soldiers on, plucked to the backbone. Trust all's well at the hall, with affection and gratitude, Hugo. 19th of July, 1812. Dearest Percy and darling Francis, we all enjoyed your latest letters. We miss you dreadfully, but are also glad you're having a splendid time in Northamptonshire. Owen sounds so nice. I'm sorry you find his sister Helen such a nuisance, Francis. I wonder why she trails after you and pesters you so. It is lovely to have Hugo home again. I'm not quite sure what to say about Catherine. I had been looking forward to having a sister, but now, please, please don't tell anyone else, but now I'm not so sure. Hugo belongs to her now, doesn't he? I hadn't thought of this before. It makes me feel, well, rather like an outsider. It must be dreadful to be rich and then suddenly not, don't you think? Hugo doesn't seem to mind it, but of course he was only like that for six months or so. He has been over at Grandpapa's church quite a bit lately, helping the labourers fit in the new stained glass windows, which Mr Beck has so kindly donated. And Grandpapa says if it weren't for Hugo, he's sure several of them would already have been broken. Also, Hugo goes over to the wharves as he used to do when he was a boy. Just a look, he says. But Mamma has made him solemnly promise not to sign on as a sailor. He agreed, although Mamma said afterwards that there was something in his eyes that made her so nervous she actually brought out our Bible and had him swear upon it, which made Hugo laugh. Speaking of the wharves, Hugo told me I'm not to wander alone there any more, which is annoying as they are terribly fascinating. They simply reek of adventure. Love always, Gwendolyn. P.S. Bertram blew up one of the attics again, but most luckily he didn't lose any more fingers. His hair was completely black for an entire week, and Mamma had to wash it eleven times until it was back to normal. P.P.S. Diana has just come over, and I shared this letter with her. She says that Helen probably likes you, Francis. I find that difficult to believe. If she likes you, why is she always trying to pinch you? Hugo looked around the table. Grandpapa... Aunt Verena and Aunt Claudia had come for dinner, as they did at least once a week, and his enjoyment would have been complete had it not been for the still, set expression on Catherine's face. Not that it was new. She'd had it for weeks now. Quiet, polite, detached, she moved restlessly around the house, on the beach, as if she were here and yet not here. It was painful to see. Kiss me, you saucy wench! suddenly uttered Senor Rodrigo from his perch near the fireplace, and Aunt Claudia put down her knife and fork to turn and look at him. I'd love to sketch him, she said in her dreamy way. Good gracious, why? retorted Aunt Verena. It would hardly be decent, given his scandalous lack of plumage. Oh, but he has such personality, Verena, dear. Aunt Claudia was undeterred. Only see what a lively look he has. No doubt he's still enjoying the fact that he almost took my finger off an hour ago, answered Aunt Verena sourly. Senor Rodrigo giggled, and Gwendolen put in from across the table, Oh, Aunt, it's quite possible you offended poor Rodrigo when you called him a great ugly thing. He's very sensitive, you know. Sensitive? Aunt Verena gave a sardonic laugh. If that animal is sensitive, then I'm the Empress of France. Speaking of animals, said Bertram, seated to her right, I read a very interesting article last year in the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions, which argued that humans' place in the great chain of being should be on par with both wild and domesticated animals, rather than claiming a more elevated status. Aunt Verena frowned. It sounds highly irreligious. Grandpapa, a vicar for nearly all of his adult life, gently cleared his throat. I lent Bertram my copy of the journal. Francis read the article also, Bertram said, and so did Mamma. Aunt Verena's frown deepened, and from his perch, Senor Rodrigo remarked, Oh, belched on her anchor! 
and reached up a sharp prehensile claw to scratch at his head. I'd love to sketch Catherine, too, pursued Aunt Claudia, turning her dreamy gaze to the foot of the table where Catherine sat looking at her plate, on which reposed a generous slice of Cook's excellent roasted chicken, small boiled potatoes and a tangy mustard sauce, and a wedge of spinach pie. She was looking, though Hugo was fairly certain she wasn't seeing it. She gave the impression, rather, that she was listening intently to something, but not necessarily the conversation at the table. A sketch first, Aunt Claudia went on, and then I should like to paint Catherine in oils, not watercolours. Only oils could do justice to her personality. As you are interested in personality, said Aunt Verena, perhaps you could paint both Catherine and the bird. The suggestion was obviously a sarcastic one, but Aunt Claudia slowly nodded without taking her eyes from Catherine. The brilliant green of Rodrigo's feathers contrasted with Catherine's dark, dark hair. How beautifully it gleams! What a marvellous idea! Would Rodrigo sit for me, I wonder? How clever of you to propose it, Verena, dear! If he had any feathers! You must envision what could be, said Aunt Claudia to her sister, still thoughtfully studying Catherine. The possibility of things. Perhaps, after dinner, you might permit me to begin a sketch, Catherine. There will still be plenty of light. It came to Catherine at last. That image of the blank page, empty, frightening, had gradually given way to something else. She imagined that inside her was a swarm of bees, stinging bees, buzzing, swirling, colliding, as if creating a low, dreadful hum to which one would have to listen all day long. Would you let me do that, Catherine, dear? She jumped at the sound of her name, and quickly she looked down the table at Hugo's aunt who was smiling at her. Which one was it, Verena or Claudia? Why did they have to be identical twins? How curious, just like Percy and Francis. These two here, the aunts, older sisters to Hugo's mamma, both of them unwed and living with their father, Mr. Mantell, in the parsonage, seemed to be strikingly different in nature. One very soft and vague, the other alert and rather crisp. Catherine answered, Would I let you do what, ma'am? Sketch you, dear. After dinner, I'd like that ever so much. So one of the aunts, it had to be Claudia, wanted to sketch her. Why? Was she good at drawing bees? Catherine knew that her mouth was curving in a small, bitter smile, but before she could answer, there was a sudden hush in the dining parlour, one of those odd, awkward conversational lulls that occur seemingly at random. And then Bertram said, as if unaware of it, or that he was coming to Catherine's rescue. There was also a very good article in that issue of Philosophical Transactions which discussed Molyneux's problem. Did you read it, Grandpapa, or you, Mamma? Mr. Mantell replied that he had, and enjoyed it, and Hugo's Mamma said she had too, although there was a reference to John Locke which she had thought not quite correct, and Gwendolen turned to Hugo to ask if they could go riding tomorrow and Aunt Claudia was now gazing at that poor, scrawny parrot who was chuckling under his breath, and the maid Eliza came into the room to clear away the plates, and Bertram said, having agreed with his mother about the John Locke reference, The text should have read, No innate principles, but perhaps it was a typographer's error. Hugo, shall we go for a swim once we've had our dessert? A dreadful idea, said Aunt Verena, who wore an old-fashioned lawn fichu, and over her greying blonde hair, a lace cap of severe design, which only accentuated the stern handsomeness of her face. Don't you remember that custom officer's child who nearly drowned last fall? Yes, aunt, but the waves were rough, and Tom had been warned to stay away, only he didn't listen. They're not like that today. It's dreadfully unfair that girls aren't supposed to swim in the ocean. This from Gwendolen her pretty face gone sulky. There are bathing machines, 
remarked Aunt Claudia, whose slender hands showed faint splotches of colour as she gestured in the air, as if outlining the shape of those famously bulky conveyances. In places like Brighton and Margate. Oh, I'd love to try that, said Mrs. Penhallow. Cook says the butcher's wife told her they're hoping to bring some to Seascale. That's fifteen miles away, objected Gwendolen, and it doesn't help me today. Hugo, mayn't I come with you and Bertram? Oh, but dearest, you promised to go with Aunt Farina to visit Mrs. Quent, Mrs. Penhallow said. Poor old soul, laid up like that with a summer's ague. She's had a terrible time of it. Aunt Farina won't mind if I go to the beach with Hugo and Bertram. Gwendolen looked appealingly across the table. Will you, aunt? Yes, I will. A promise is a promise. Oh, but I want so much to try swimming. Gwendolen clasped her fingers together at her breast and somehow managed to make her blue eyes twice as big. Please, aunt, I'll go with you another day. You needn't try your wiles on me, missy. Verena was unmoved. I told Mrs. Quent yesterday you were coming with me next time, and she said how much she was looking forward to it. Gwendolen looked between her mother and Hugo, but getting no response from either of them, dropped her clasped fingers and replied rather sullenly, Very well, then, I'll go, but I still say it isn't fair. Just then, Senor Rodrigo squawked and said, Ah, she blows, as if to herald Eliza's return with dessert. Big bowls of strawberries and raspberries, a pitcher of cream, walnuts and raisins, and a platter of light, delicate rolled wafers. Mr. Mantel exclaimed over the bounty, and Claudia said, bringing together her delicate, paint-splotched hands to make a little temple of them on which she rested her chin. Summer agues are dreadful, aren't they? I had one last August, and I do believe that's why the influenza laid me so low in November. That may be, but if you'll recall... I told you not to go wandering about when the wind changed in October, responded her sister with a frown. Yet you insisted on taking your easel to the shore. The light on the water was so beautiful. The waves were shimmering. Absently, Claudia accepted from Verena a bowl of fruit and cream. The colours, my dear, the greens and greys. I had to try and capture them. Eat your dessert, Verena said. Every drop of the cream, mind you. Obediently, Claudia picked up her spoon, and the talk drifted on, shifting into a discussion of modern medicine, and thence to some of the really interesting diseases Hugo had seen while abroad, as well as Mr. Mantell mentioning his theories about bodily manifestations of what he termed soul sickness, a complicated metaphysical topic which evoked a veritable storm of questions from Gwendolen and Bertram, and it occurred to Catherine that she might well have had some of her own, if only it weren't for the bees inside her, which roiled and stormed, swarmed and raged, and she clenched her fingers on the napkin in her lap, half wondering if emanating from her very paws was a low, revealing buzzing sound. It seemed to take a long time until dinner was over. Well, Gwendolen, said Verena, briskly, standing up, get your bonnet and let's be on our way. And Aunt Claudia meandered over to talk to Senor Rodrigo, and Mr. Mantell was telling Hugo about a subscription to a relief fund he was organising, and Hugo's mamma was looking anxiously at the dessert Catherine had been unable to eat, so full as she was already with bees. And then an idea flashed into Catherine's head. Abruptly, she pushed back her chair, put her napkin on the table, said, Excuse me, please, and left the room. In the passageway, the dogs were patiently ranged, and they all got to their feet as she came in. But she didn't stop. She went on to the stairs and up them, to the wide landing, and down the long private corridor that led to the room she shared with Hugo. She went inside, shut the door, and went to a trunk that she had yet to unpack. She crouched down and flung open the lid. Chapter 16 Hugo had watched Catherine leave the dining parlour, looking so determined, so fierce, that he stood up and took a long step after her, 
pausing but briefly when Bertram said, Hugo, shall we go to the beach? He replied, Perhaps a bit later, Bertie, clapped him on the shoulder and continued on his way. At the closed door to their bedchamber, he paused again and knocked upon it. Who is it? It's me. What do you want? May I come in? A silence. Are you sure you want to? Yes. Another silence. Then, very well. Hugo opened the door and went in. Catherine was sitting on the floor, in her hands her old steel-framed corset and a small pair of scissors. Here and there, between the metal ribs, the fabric had been cut apart. She looked up at him defiantly. He said curiously, What are you doing? I'm destroying this ghastly thing. I didn't know you still had it. I forgot all about it till just now. Ah, oh. may I sit down with you? Do you want to? Yes. Catherine pushed aside a little box to make room for him, and he sat next to her on the wood floor. What's in that box? It's a sewing kit my mother must have packed before I left Brook House, even though I hate sewing almost more than I hate this corset. She jabbed at the fabric and cut another jagged wedge between the ribs. Oh, Hugo, I'm so angry. About what? About everything it feels like. Well, you have plenty to be angry about. She cut another wedge, then looked up at him. Do you think so? Really? My God, yes. She studied him intently. Her dark eyes were brilliant, alive in her white face. The funny thing is, she said, very slowly and deliberately, it's not about the money being gone. It's a relief. It really and truly is. I was at the beach the other day. It was sunny out, and I could see the fool's gold glittering in the water, and I thought, that's all it was, the brook money. Fool's gold. Goodbye and good riddance. She drew a deep, deep breath. But it's just that, oh, God, Hugo, that letter from my mother. I still feel that what I did was right, to get rid of all the money, but I'm also still angry. So angry. I feel like, oh, as if a rug's been jerked out from under my feet. Have you ever felt that way? Of course. After father died, I was grieving, but I was angry too. Furious at the world. A common reaction, I dare say, when things happen beyond our control. How did you get through it? For a while, I simply shut down. Wouldn't even look at a book or write papers or whatever. Once, I stole a horse and tried to run away. It got bad enough that eventually the headmaster wrote home about it. Then Grandpapa wrote me a letter that helped. What did he say? For one thing, he and Mama both agreed I could leave school if I wanted to. It gave me a choice, you see. For another thing, he said that it's his firm belief that we're never given more than we can handle, and that he had faith in me. That's all. He's never one to force his views, but it was enough to help shift me, help me climb out of the hole bit by bit. Catherine was silent for a while. She looked down at the corset and then back up at him. In a low, small voice, she said, Do you have faith in me, Hugo? Yes. Why? Because you're one of the strongest people I've ever known. Really? Yes. You think I'm strong? Yes, I do. Life's been hard to you in a lot of ways, but it hasn't broken you, and it's made you who you are today. Catherine had been looking at him with that same intentness, and now she lowered her gaze again to the corset. Do you think it's stupid of me to destroy this? No. She cut another wedge of fabric, but with less violence now. Then she paused. Hugo? Yes, Catherine. On a more practical note, I can see how these steel bands are going to be a problem. Yes. Do you have any suggestions? Hugo thought for a few moments. He said, 
Do you remember my tin soldiers? He watched as her dark brows drew together, and then cleared as she answered, and with just the tiniest lilt of humor in her voice. Oh, Hugo, I do remember. We pretended they were Vikings and gave them a burial at sea. That's right. I made a little raft for them. You made a fire out of yellow and red paper, and we let them sail away. Let's do that. Can we? Right now. By all means. Catherine scrambled to her feet. Let's go. Ten minutes later, they stood side by side on the broad sandy shore. The sun, a great orange ball in the sky, was slowly making its way down toward the horizon, and a little breeze played around them, rippling the hem of Catherine's gown and sending her curls softly aflutter. Never had she looked so lovely as she did now, Hugo thought, in her simple, cream-coloured dress and her big, dark eyes sparkling. In one hand she held the old steel corset. Are you ready, Hugo? I am. She lifted it up. Goodbye, you dreadful thing, she said, and with a tremendous heave she sent the corset flying into the ocean. It splashed, then bobbed gently in a receding wave. With satisfaction, Catherine said, The tide's going out. Yes. Shall we sit? He had brought with them an old blanket, which he'd spread on the sand, and together they went to it and sat down, Catherine keeping her eyes fixed on the corset as it drifted away. The sun sank a little lower, and, 